You fool! Warren is dead. The Horror That Lurks Beneath Nine Tales of the Underground Written by H.P. Lovecraft The Statement of Randolph Carter I repeat to you, gentlemen, that your inquisition is fruitless. Detain me here forever, if you will. Confine or execute me, if you must have a victim to propitiate the illusion you call justice. But I can say no more than I have said already. Everything that I can remember I have told with perfect candour. Nothing has been distorted or concealed, and if anything remains vague, it is only because of the dark cloud which has come over my mind, that cloud and the nebulous nature of the horrors which brought it upon me. Again, I say, I do not know what has become of Harley Warren, though I think, almost hope, that he is in peaceful oblivion, if there be anywhere so blessed a thing. It is true that I have for five years been his closest friend, and a partial sharer of his terrible researches into the unknown. I will not deny, though my memory is uncertain and indistinct, that this witness of yours may have seen us together, as he says, on the Gainesville Pike, walking toward Big Cypress Swamp at half-past eleven on that awful night, that we bore electric lanterns, spades, and a curious coil of wire with attached instruments, I will even affirm, for these things all played a part in the single hideous scene which remains burned into my shaken recollection. But of what followed, and of the reason I was found alone and dazed on the edge of the swamp next morning, I must insist that I know nothing save what I have told you over and over again. You say to me that there is nothing in the swamp or near it which could form the setting of that frightful episode. I reply that I know nothing beyond what I saw. Vision or nightmare it may have been. Vision or nightmare I fervently hope it was. Yet it is all that my mind retains of what took place in those shocking hours after we left the sight of men, and why Harley Warren did not return, he or his shade, or some nameless thing I cannot describe, alone can tell. As I have said before, the weird studies of Harley Warren were well known to me, and to some extent shared by me. Of his vast collection of strange, rare books on forbidden subjects, I have read all that are written in the languages of which I am master, but these are few as compared with those in languages I cannot understand. Most, I believe, are in Arabic, and the fiend-inspired book which brought on the end, the book which he carried in his pocket out of the world, was written in characters whose like I never saw elsewhere. Warren would never tell me just what was in that book. As to the nature of our studies, must I say again that I no longer retain full comprehension? It seems to me rather merciful that I do not, for they were terrible studies, which I pursued more through reluctant fascination than through actual inclination. Warren always dominated me, and sometimes I feared him. I remember how I shuddered at his facial expression on the night before the awful happening, when he talked so incessantly of his theory— why certain corpses never decay, but rest firm and fat in their tombs for a thousand years. But I do not fear him now, for I suspect that he has known horrors beyond my ken. Now I fear for him. Once more I say that I have no clear idea of our object on that night. Certainly it had much to do with something in the book which Warren carried with him, that ancient book in undecipherable characters which had come to him from India a month before. But I swear I do not know what it was that we expected to find. Your witness says he saw us at half-past eleven on the Gainesville Pike, headed for Big Cypress Swamp. This is probably true, but I have no distinct memory of it. The picture seared into my soul is of one scene only, and the hour must have been long after midnight— for a waning crescent moon was high in the vaporous heavens. The place was an ancient cemetery, so ancient that I trembled at the manifold signs of 
immemorial years. It was in a deep, damp hollow, overgrown with rank grass, moss, and curious creeping weeds, and filled with a vague stench which my idle fancy associated absurdly with rotting stone. On every hand were the signs of neglect and decrepitude, and I seemed haunted by the notion that Warren and I were the first living creatures to invade a lethal silence of centuries. Over the valley's rim a wan, waning crescent moon peered through the noisome vapours that seemed to emanate from unheard-of catacombs, and by its feeble, wavering beams I could distinguish a repellent array of antique slabs, urns, cenotaphs, and mausoleum facades, all crumbling, moss-grown, and moisture-stained and partly concealed by the gross luxuriance of the unhealthy vegetation. My first vivid impression of my own presence in this terrible necropolis concerns the act of pausing with Warren before a certain half-obliterated sepulchre, and of throwing down some burdens which we seem to have been carrying. I now observed that I had with me an electric lantern and two spades, whilst my companion was supplied with a similar lantern and a portable telephone outfit. No word was uttered, for the spot and the task seemed known to us, and without delay we seized our spades and commenced to clear away the grass, weeds, and drifted earth from the flat, archaic mortuary. After uncovering the entire surface, which consisted of three immense granite slabs, we stepped back some distance to survey the charnel scene, and Warren appeared to make some mental calculations. Then he returned to the sepulchre, and using his spade as a lever, sought to pry up the slab lying nearest to a stony ruin, which may have been a monument in its day. He did not succeed, and motioned to me to come to his assistance. Finally, our combined strength loosened the stone, which we raised and tipped to one side. The removal of the slab revealed a black aperture, from which rushed an effluence of miasmal gases so nauseous that we started back in horror. After an interval, however, we approached the pit again, and found the exhalations less unbearable. Our lanterns disclosed the top of a flight of stone steps, dripping with some detestable ichor of the inner earth, and bordered by moist walls encrusted with nitre. And now, for the first time, my memory records verbal discourse, Warren addressing me at length in his mellow tenor voice— a voice singularly unperturbed by our awesome surroundings. "'I'm sorry to have to ask you to stay on the surface,' he said, "'but it would be a crime to let anyone with your frail nerves go down there. You can't imagine, even from what you have read and from what I've told you, the things I shall have to see and do. It's fiendish work, Carter, and I doubt if any man without ironclad sensibilities could ever see it through and come up alive and sane. I don't wish to offend you, and heaven knows I'd be glad enough to have you with me, but the responsibility is in a certain sense mine, and I couldn't drag a bundle of nerves like you down to probable death or madness. I tell you, you can't imagine what the thing is really like, but I promise to keep you informed over the telephone of every move. You see, I've enough wire here to reach to the centre of the earth and back. I can still hear in memory those coolly spoken words— and I can still remember my remonstrances. I seemed desperately anxious to accompany my friend into those sepulchral depths, yet he proved inflexibly obdurate. At one time he threatened to abandon the expedition if I remained insistent, a threat which proved effective, since he alone held the key to the—thing. All this I can still remember, though I no longer know what manner of thing we sought— After he had secured my reluctant acquiescence in his design, Warren picked up the reel of wire, and adjusted the instruments. At his nod, I took one of the latter, and seated myself upon an aged, discoloured gravestone close by the newly uncovered aperture. Then he shook my hand, shouldered the coil of wire, and disappeared within that indescribable ossuary. For a moment I kept sight of the glow of his lantern— and heard the rustle of the wire as he laid it down after him, but the glow soon disappeared abruptly, as if a turn in the stone staircase had been encountered, and the sound died away almost as quickly. I was alone, 
yet bound to the unknown depths by those magic strands whose insulated surface lay green beneath the struggling beams of that waning crescent moon. In the lone silence of that hoary and deserted city of the dead, my mind conceived the most ghastly fantasies and delusions, and the grotesque shrines and monoliths seemed to assume a hideous personality, a half-sentience. Amorphous shadows seemed to lurk in the darker recesses of the weed-choked hollow, and to flit as in some blasphemous ceremonial procession past the portals of the mouldering tombs in the hillside, shadows which could not have been cast by that pallid, peering crescent moon. I constantly consulted my watch by the light of my electric lantern, and listened with feverish anxiety at the receiver of the telephone, but for more than a quarter of an hour heard nothing. Then a faint clicking came from the instrument, and I called down to my friend in a tense voice. Apprehensive as I was, I was nevertheless unprepared for the words which came up from that uncanny vault in accents more alarmed and quivering than any I had heard before from Harley Warren. He who had so calmly left me a little while previously, now called from below in a shaky whisper more portentous than the loudest shriek. "'God! If you could see what I am seeing!' I could not answer. Speechless I could only wait. Then came the frenzied tones again. "'Carter! It's terrible! Monstrous! Unbelievable!' This time my voice did not fail me, and I poured into the transmitter a flood of excited questions. Terrified, I continued to repeat, "'Warren, what is it? What is it?' Once more came the voice of my friend, still hoarse with fear, and now apparently tinged with despair. "'I can't tell you, Carter. It's too utterly beyond thought. I dare not tell you. No man could know it and live. Great God, I never dreamed of this!' Stillness again, save for my now incoherent torrent of shuddering inquiry. Then the voice of Warren in a pitch of wilder consternation. "'Carter, for the love of God, put back the slab and get out of this if you can. Quick, leave everything else and make for the outside. It's your only chance. Do as I say, and don't ask me to explain.' I heard, yet was able only to repeat my frantic questions. Around me were the tombs and the darkness and the shadows. Below me, some peril beyond the radius of the human imagination. But my friend was in greater danger than I and through my fear I felt a vague resentment that he should deem me capable of deserting him under such circumstances. More clicking, and after a pause a piteous cry from Warren. "'Beat it! For God's sake, put back the slab and beat it, Carter!' Something in the boyish slang of my evidently stricken companion unleashed my faculties. I formed and shouted a resolution. "'Warren, brace up! I'm coming down!' But at this offer, the tone of my order to change to a scream of utter despair. "'Don't! You can't understand! It's too late, and my own fault! Put back the slab and run! There's nothing else you or anyone can do now!' The tone changed again, this time acquiring a softer quality, as of hopeless resignation, yet it remained tense through anxiety for me. "'Quick! Before it's too late!' I tried not to heed him, tried to break through the paralysis which held me, and to fulfil my vow to rush down to his aid. But his next whisper found me still held inert in the chains of stark horror. "'Carter, hurry! It's no use! You must go! Better one than two! The slab!' A pause, more clicking, then the faint voice of Warren. "'Nearly over now.' Don't make it harder. Cover up those damned steps and run for your life. You're losing time. So long, Carter. Won't see you again. Here Warren's whisper swelled into a cry, a cry that gradually rose to a shriek fraught with all the horror of the ages. Curse these hellish things! Legions! My God! Beat it! Beat it! Beat it! After that was silence. 
I know not how many interminable eons I sat stupefied, whispering, muttering, calling, screaming into that telephone. Over and over again through those eons I whispered and muttered, called, shouted, and screamed, Warren, Warren, answer me! Are you there? And then there came to me the crowning horror of all, the unbelievable, unthinkable, almost unmentionable thing. I have said that Eon seemed to elapse after Warren shrieked forth his last despairing warning, and that only my own cries now broke the hideous silence. But after a while there was a further clicking in the receiver, and I strained my ears to listen. Again I called down, Warren, are you there? And in answer heard the thing which has brought this cloud over my mind. I do not try, gentlemen, to account for that thing, that voice, nor can I venture to describe it in detail, since the first words took away my consciousness, and created a mental blank which reaches to the time of my awakening in the hospital. Shall I say that the voice was deep, hollow, gelatinous, remote, unearthly, inhuman, disembodied? What shall I say? It was the end of my experience and is the end of my story. I heard it, and knew no more. Heard it as I sat petrified in that unknown cemetery in the hollow, amidst the crumbling stones and the falling tombs, the rank vegetation and the miasmal vapours. Heard it well up from the innermost depths of that damnable open sepulchre, as I watched amorphous, necrophagous shadows dance beneath an accursed waning moon. And this— is what it said. You fool! Warren is dead. Pickman's Model Ah, Elliot, come in. Come in out of that damnable rain. Yes, yes, take a seat. There, by the mantelpiece. Warm yourself. Cup of tea? No, no, I know. You want to hear my story first. I understand. Well, if you must hear it, uh, I don't know why you shouldn't. Maybe you ought to know, anyhow. You kept writing me like a grieved parent when you heard I'd begun to cut the art club and keep away from Pickman. Now that he's disappeared, I go around to the club once in a while, but my nerves aren't what they were. I don't know what's become of Pickman, and uh, I don't like to guess. You might have surmised I had some inside information when I dropped him, and that's why I don't want to think where he's gone. Let the police find what they can. It won't be much judging from the fact that they don't know yet of the old North End place he hired under the name of Peters. I'm not sure that I could find it again myself. Not that I'd ever try, even in broad daylight. I do know, or am afraid I know, why he maintained it. I'm coming to that, and I think you'll understand before I'm through why I don't tell the police. They would ask me to guide them, but I couldn't go back there even if I knew the way. There was something there, and now I can't use the subway, or— And you may as well have your laugh at this, too. Go down into cellars any more. Ah, don't mind, Carter. The spinning of a good yarn always draws his attention. Anyway, where was I? Ah, yes. I should think you'd have known I didn't drop Pickman for the same silly reasons that fussy old women like Dr. Reed or Joe Minot or Bosworth did. Morbid art doesn't shock me, and when a man has the genius Pickman had, I feel it an honour to know him, 
no matter what direction his work takes. Boston never had a greater painter than Richard Upton Pickman. I said it at first, and I say it still, and I never swerved an inch either when he showed that ghoul-feeding piece. That, you remember, was when Minot cut him. You know, it takes profound art and profound insight into nature to turn out stuff like Pickman's. Any magazine cover hack can splash paint around wildly and call it a nightmare or a witch's sabbath or a portrait of the devil, but only a great painter can make such a thing really scare or ring true. That's because only a real artist knows the actual anatomy of the terrible or the physiology of fear, the exact sort of lines and proportions that connect up with latent instincts or hereditary memories of fright and the proper colour contrasts and lighting effects to stir the dormant sense of strangeness. I don't have to tell you why a fusilier really brings a shiver, while a cheap ghost story frontispiece merely makes us laugh. There's something those fellows catch, beyond life, that they're able to make us catch for a second. Dore had it, Syme has it, and Pickman had it, as no man ever had it before, or I hope to heaven ever will again. Don't ask me what it is they see. You know, in ordinary art, there's all the difference in the world between the vital, breathing things drawn from nature or models and the artificial truck that commercial small fry reel off in a bare studio by rule. Well, I should say that the really weird artist has a kind of vision which makes models or summons up what amounts to actual scenes from the spectral world he lives in. Anyhow, he manages to turn out results that differ from the pretender's mince-pie dreams in just about the same way that the life-painter's results differ from the concoctions of a correspondent school cartoonist. If I had ever seen what Pickman saw. But, no, God, I wouldn't be alive if I'd ever seen what that man, if he was a man, saw. Quite the storm, isn't it? I fear my telling of this queer tale will be my undoing. Are you sure I can't offer you a cup of tea? No, no, don't say it. I'll get to the heart of the story first. You recall that uh, Pickman's forte was faces. I don't believe anybody since Goya could put so much of sheer hell into a set of features or a twist of expression. And before Goya, you have to go back to the medieval chaps who did the gargoyles and chimeras on Notre Dame and Monson Michel. They believed all sorts of things, and maybe they saw all sorts of things, too, for the Middle Ages had some curious phases. I remember your asking, Pickman, yourself once, the year before you went away, wherever in thunder he got such ideas and visions. Wasn't that a nasty laugh he gave you? It was partly because of that laugh that Reed dropped him. Reed, you know, had just taken up comparative pathology— and was full of pompous inside stuff about the biological or evolutionary significance of this or that mental or physical symptom. He said Pickman repelled him more and more every day, and almost frightened him toward the last, that the fellow's features and expression were slowly developing in a way he didn't like, in a way that wasn't human. He had a lot of talk about diet— and said Pickman must be abnormal and eccentric to the last degree. I suppose you told Reed, if you and he had any correspondence over it, that he'd let Pickman's paintings get on his nerves or harrow up his imagination. I know I told him that myself, then. But keep in mind that I didn't drop Pickman for anything like this. On the contrary, my admiration for him kept growing, for that ghoul-feeding piece was a tremendous achievement. As you know, the club wouldn't exhibit it, and the Museum of Fine Arts wouldn't accept it as a gift, and I can add that nobody would buy it. So Pickman had it right in his house till he went. Now his father has it in Salem. You know Pickman comes of old Salem stock, and had a witch ancestor hanged in 1692. I got into the habit of calling on Pickman quite often, especially after I began making notes for a monograph on weird art. Probably it was his work which put the idea into my head. And anyhow, I found him a mine of data and suggestions when I came to develop it. He showed me all the paintings and drawings he had about, 
including some pen and ink sketches that would, I verily believe, have got him kicked out of the club if many of the members had seen them. Before long I was pretty nearly a devotee, and would listen for hours like a schoolboy to art theories and philosophic speculations wild enough to qualify him for the Danvers Asylum. My hero-worship, coupled with the fact that people generally were commencing to have less and less to do with him, made him get very confidential with me. And one cold, wet, and miserable evening, he hinted that if I were fairly close-mouthed and none too squeamish, he might show me something rather unusual, something a bit stronger than anything he had in the house. You know, there are things that won't do for Newbury Street, things that are out of place here, and that can be conceived here anyhow. It's my business to catch the overtones of the soul, and you won't find those in a parvenu set of artificial streets on made land. Back Bay isn't Boston. It isn't anything yet, because it's had no time to pick up memories and attract local spirits. If there are any ghosts here, they're the tame ghosts of a salt marsh in a shallow cove, and I want human ghosts, the ghosts of beings highly organized enough to have looked on hell and known the meaning of what they saw. The place for an artist to live is in the North End. If any East Thiet were sincere, he'd put up with the slums for the sake of the mass traditions. God, man, don't you realize that places like that weren't merely made, but actually grew? Generation after generation lived and felt and died there, and in days when people weren't afraid to live and feel and die. Don't you know there was a mill on Copps Hill in 1632, and that half the present streets were laid out by 1650? I can show you houses that have stood two centuries and a half and more. Houses that have witnessed what would make a modern house crumble into powder. What do moderns know of life and the forces behind it? You call the Salem witchcraft a delusion, but I'll wage my four times great-grandmother could have told you things. They hanged her on Gallows Hill, with Cotton Mather looking sanctimoniously on. Mather, damn him, was afraid somebody might succeed in kicking free of this accursed cage of monotony. I wish someone had laid a spell on him or sucked his blood in the night. I can show you a house he lived in, and I can show you another one he was afraid to enter in spite of all his fine, bold talk. He knew things he didn't dare put into that stupid magnalia or that puerile wonders of the invisible world. Look here. Do you know the whole North End once had a set of tunnels that kept certain people in touch with each other's houses and the burying ground and the sea? Let them prosecute and persecute above ground. Things went on every day that they couldn't reach and voices laughed at night that they couldn't place. Why, man? Out of ten surviving houses built before 1700 and not moved since, I'll wager that Nate I can show you something queer in the cellar. There's hardly a month that you don't read of workmen finding bricked-up arches and wells leading nowhere in this or that old place as it comes down. You could see one near Henchman Street from the Elevated last year. There were witches and what their spells summoned, pirates and what they brought in from the sea, smugglers, privateers, and, I tell you, people knew how to live and how to enlarge the bounds of life in the old times. This wasn't the only world a bold and wise man could know. <laughs> and to think of today in contrast, with such pale pink brains that even a club of supposed artists gets shudders and convulsions if a picture goes beyond the feelings of a Beacon Street tea table... Oh, the only saving grace of the present is that it's too damn stupid to question the past very closely. What do maps and records and guidebooks really tell of the North End? At a guess, I'll guarantee to lead you to thirty or forty alleys and networks of alleys north of Prince Street that aren't suspected by ten living beings outside of the foreigners that swarm them. And what do those dagos know of their meaning? No, Thurber. These ancient places are dreaming gorgeously and overflowing with wonder and terror and escapes from the commonplace, and yet there's not a living soul to understand or profit by them. Or rather, there's only one living soul, 
for I haven't been digging around in the past for nothing. See here, you're interested in this sort of thing. What if I told you that I've got another studio up there, where I can catch the night spirit of antique horror and paint things that I couldn't even think of in Newbury Street? Naturally, I don't tell those cursed old maids at the club, with Reed damn him whispering even as it is that I'm a sort of monster bound down the toboggan of reverse evolution. Yes, Thurber. I decided long ago that one must paint terror, as well as beauty from life. So I did some exploring in places where I had reason to know terror lives. I've got a place that I don't believe three living Nordic men beside myself have ever seen. It isn't so very far from the elevated as distance goes, but it's centuries away as the soul goes. I took it because of the queer old brick well in the cellar, one of the sort I told you about. The shack's almost tumbling down so that nobody else would live there, and I'd hate to tell you how little I pay for it. The windows are boarded up, but I like that all the better, since I don't want daylight for what I do. I paint in the cellar, where the inspiration is thickest, but I've other rooms furnished on the ground floor. A Sicilian owns it, and I've hired it under the name of Peters. Now, if you're game, I'll take you there tonight. I think you'd enjoy the pictures. For as I said, I've let myself go a bit there. It's no vast tour. I sometimes do it on foot, for I don't want to attract attention with a taxi in such a place. We can take the shuttle at the South Station for Battery Street, and after that the walk isn't much. Well, Elliot, my nerves are getting the better of me. I think I'd better put the kettle on. So, there wasn't much for me to do after Pickman's harangue but to keep myself from running instead of walking for the first vacant cab we could sight. We changed to the elevated at the South Station, and at about twelve o'clock had climbed down the steps at Battery Street and struck along the old waterfront past Constitution Wharf. I didn't keep track of the cross streets, and can't tell you yet which it was we turned up, but I know it wasn't Greeno Lane. When we did turn, it was to climb through the deserted length of the oldest and dirtiest alley I ever saw in my life, with crumbling-looking gables, broken small-paned windows, and archaic chimneys that stood out half-disintegrated against the moonlit sky. I don't believe there were three houses in sight that hadn't been standing in Cotton Mather's time. Certainly I glimpsed at least two with an overhang— and once I thought I saw a peaked roofline of the almost forgotten pre gambrel type, though antiquarians tell us there are none left in Boston. From that alley, which had a dim light, we turned to the left into an equally silent and still narrower alley, with no light at all, and in a minute made what I think was an obtuse angled bend toward the right in the dark. Not long after this, Pickman produced a flashlight, and revealed an antediluvian ten-panelled door that looked damnably worm-eaten. Unlocking it, he ushered me into a barren hallway, with what was once splendid dark oak panelling. Simple, of course, but thrillingly suggestive of the times of Andrus and Phipps and the witchcraft. Then he took me through a door on the left, lighted an oil lamp, and told me to make myself at home. Now, Elliot— I'm what the man in the street would call fairly hard-boiled, but I'll confess that what I saw in the walls of that room gave me a bad turn. They were his pictures, you know, the ones he couldn't paint or even show in Newbury Street, and he was right when he said he had let himself go. Oh, excuse me, Elliot. Tea awaits. There we are. Should calm my nerves somewhat, and possibly yours, after you've heard the rest of my tale. 
there's no use in my trying to tell you what those pictures were like, because the awful, the blasphemous horror, and the unbelievable loathsomeness and moral fetter came from simple touches quite beyond the power of words to classify. There was none of the exotic technique you see in Sydney Syme, none of the trans-Saturnian landscapes and lunar fungi that Clark Ashton Smith uses to freeze the blood. The backgrounds were mostly old churchyards, deep woods, cliffs by the sea, brick tunnels, ancient panelled rooms, or simple vaults of masonry. Copse Hill Burying Ground, which could not be many blocks away from this very house, was a favourite scene. The madness and monstrosity lay in the figures in the foreground, for Pickman's morbid art was preeminently one of demoniac portraiture. These figures were seldom completely human, but often approached humanity in varying degree. Most of the bodies, while roughly bipedal, had a forward slumping and a vaguely canine cast. The texture of the majority was a kind of unpleasant rubberiness. Oh, I can see them now. Their occupations, well, don't ask me to be too precise. They were usually feeding. I won't say on what. They were sometimes shown in groups in cemeteries or underground passages, and often appeared to be in battle over their prey, or rather their treasure trove. And what damnable expressiveness Pickman sometimes gave the sightless faces of this charnel booty! Occasionally the things were shown leaping through open windows at night, or squatting on the chests of sleepers, worrying at their throats. One canvas showed a ring of them baying about a hanged witch on Gallows Hill, whose dead face held a close kinship to theirs. But don't get the idea that it was all this hideous business of theme and setting which struck me faint. I'm not a three-year-old kid, and I'd seen much like this before. It was the faces, Elliot, those accursed faces, that leered and slavered out of the canvas with the very breath of life. By God, man, I verily believe they were alive. That nauseous wizard had waked the fires of hell in pigment, and his brush had been a nightmare-spawning wand. Oh, Carter, such a comfort you are. There was one thing called the lesson. Heaven pity me that I ever saw it. Listen, can you fancy a squatting circle of nameless dog-like things in a churchyard, teaching a small child how to feed like themselves? The price of a changeling, I suppose. You know, the old myth about how the weird people leave their spawn in cradles in exchange for the human babes they steal? Pickman was showing what happens to those stolen babes, how they grow up, and then I began to see a hideous relationship in the faces of the human and non-human figures. He was, in all his gradations of morbidity, between the frankly non-human and the degradedly human, establishing a sardonic linkage and evolution. The dog things were developed from mortals. And no sooner had I wondered what he made of their own young as left with mankind in the form of changelings, and my eye caught a picture embodying that very thought. It was that of an ancient Puritan interior, a heavily beamed room with lattice windows, a settle, and clumsy seventeenth-century furniture, with the family sitting about while their father read from the scriptures. Every face but one showed nobility and reverence, but that one reflected the mockery of the pit. It was that of a young man in years, and no doubt belonged to a supposed son of that pious father. It was their changeling, and in a spirit of supreme irony, Pickman had given the features a very perceptible resemblance to his own. By this time, Pickman had lighted a lamp in an adjoining room, and was politely holding open the door for me, asking me if I would care to see his modern studies. I hadn't been able to give him much of my opinions, I was too speechless with fright and loathing, but I think he fully understood and felt highly complimented. 
And now I want to assure you again, Elliot, that I'm no mollycoddle to scream at anything which shows a bit of departure from the usual. I'm middle-aged and decently sophisticated, and I guess you saw enough of me in France to know I'm not easily knocked out. Remember, too, that I just about recovered my wind and gotten used to those frightful pictures which turned colonial New England into a kind of annex of hell. Well, in spite of all this, that next room forced a real scream out of me, and I had to clutch at the doorway to keep from keeling over. The other chamber had shown a pack of ghouls and witches overrunning the world of our forefathers, but this one brought the horror right into our own daily life. God, how that man could paint! There was a study called Subway Accident, in which a flock of the vile things were clambering up from some unknown catacomb through a crack in the floor of the Boylston Street subway, and attacking a crowd of people on the platform. Another showed a dance on Copse Hill among the tombs with the background of today. Then there were any number of cellar views, with monsters creeping in through holes and rifts in the masonry, and grinning as they squatted behind barrels or furnaces, and waited for their first victim to descend the stairs. One disgusting canvas seemed to depict a vast cross-section of Beacon Hill, with ant-like armies of the mephitic monsters squeezing themselves through burrows that honeycombed the ground. Dances in the modern cemeteries were freely pictured, and another conception somehow shocked me more than all the rest. A scene in an unknown vault, where scores of the beasts crowded about one who held a well-known Boston guidebook, and was evidently reading aloud. All were pointing to a certain passage, and every face seemed so distorted with epileptic laughter that I almost thought I heard the fiendish echoes. The title of the picture was, Holmes, Lowell, and Longfellow Lie Buried in Mount Auburn. What was that? God, Elliot, I'm overwrought. It's all in my head, I'm sure, but I can't help but think. More tea? No, no, of course not. You've still half a cup. Anyway, as I gradually steadied myself and got readjusted to that second room of deviltry and morbidity, I began to analyse some of the points in my sickening loathing. In the first place, I said to myself, these things repelled because of the utter inhumanity and callous cruelty they showed in Pickman. The fellow must be a relentless enemy of all mankind, to take such glee in the torture of brain and flesh, and the degradation of the mortal tenement. In the second place, they terrified because of their very greatness. Their art was the art that convinced. When we saw the pictures, we saw the demons themselves, and were afraid of them. And the queer part was, that Pickman got none of his power from the use of selectiveness or bizarrery. Nothing was blurred, distorted, or conventionalized. Outlines were sharp and lifelike, and details were almost painfully defined. And the faces! It was not any mere artist's interpretation that we saw, it was pandemonium itself, crystal clear in stark objectivity. That was it, by heaven! The man was not a fantasist or romanticist at all. He did not even try to give us the churning prismatic ephemera of dreams, but coldly and sardonically reflected some stable, mechanistic, and well-established horror world which he saw fully, brilliantly, squarely, and unfalteringly. God knows what that world can have been, or where he ever glimpsed the blasphemous shapes that lope and trotted and crawled through it. But whatever the baffling source of his images, the one thing was plain. Pickman was in every sense, in conception and in execution, a thorough, painstaking, and almost scientific realist. Carter, what's got you riled up so? It's the storm, that's all it is. Then, Elliot, My host was leading the way down the cellar to his actual studio, and I brace myself for some hellish effects among the unfinished canvases. As we reached the bottom of the damp stairs, he 
turned his flashlight to a corner of the large open space at hand, revealing the circular brick curb of what was evidently a great well in the earthen floor. We walked nearer, and I saw that it must be five feet across, with walls a good foot thick and some six inches above the ground level, solid work of the seventeenth century, or I was much mistaken. That, Pickman said, was the kind of thing he had been talking about an aperture of the network of tunnels that used to undermine the hill. I noticed idly that it did not seem to be bricked up, and that a heavy disk of wood formed the apparent cover. Thinking of the things this well must have been connected with, I shivered slightly, then turned to follow him up a step, and through a narrow door into a room of fair size, provided with a wooden floor and furnished as a studio— an acetylene gas outfit gave the light necessary for work. The unfinished pictures on easels or propped against the walls were as ghastly as the finished ones upstairs, and showed the painstaking methods of the artist. Scenes were blocked out with extreme care, and penciled guidelines told of the minute exactitude which Pickman used in getting the right perspective and proportions. The man was great— I say it even now, knowing as much as I do. A large camera on a table excited my notice, and Pickman told me that he used it in taking scenes for backgrounds, so that he might paint them from photographs in the studio, instead of carting his outfit around the town for this or that view. He thought a photograph quite as good as an actual scene or model for sustained work, and declared he employed them regularly. There was something very disturbing about the nauseous sketches and half-finished monstrosities that leered around from every side of the room, and when Pickman suddenly unveiled a huge canvas on the side away from the light, I could not for my life keep back a loud scream, the second I had omitted that night. It echoed and echoed through the dim vaultings of that ancient and nitrous cellar, and I had to choke back a flood of reaction that— threatened to burst out as hysterical laughter. Merciful creator, Elliot, but I don't know how much was real and how much was feverish fancy. It doesn't seem to me that earth can hold a dream like that. It was a colossal and nameless blasphemy with glaring red eyes, and it held in bony claws a thing that had been a man, gnawing at the head as a child nibbles at a stick of candy. Its position was a kind of crouch, and as one looked one felt that at any moment it might drop its present prey and seek a juicier morsel. But, damn it all, it wasn't even the fiendish subject that made it such an immortal fountainhead of all panic. Not that, nor the dog face with its pointed ears, bloodshot eyes, flat nose, and drooling lips. It wasn't the scaly claws, nor the mould-caked body, nor the half-hooved feet— None of these, though any one of them might well have driven an excitable man to madness. It was the technique, Elliot, the cursed, the impious, the unnatural technique. As I am a living being, I never elsewhere saw the actual breath of life so fused into a canvas. The monster was there. It glared and gnawed and gnawed and glared— and I knew that only a suspension of nature's laws could ever let a man paint a thing like that without a model, without some glimpse of the netherworld which no mortal unsold to the fiend has ever had. Pinned with a thumbtack to a vacant part of the canvas was a piece of paper now badly curled up, probably, I thought, a photograph from which Pickman meant to paint a background as hideous as the nightmare it was to enhance. I reached out to uncurl and look at it, when suddenly I saw Pickman start as if shot. He had been listening with peculiar intensity, ever since my shocked scream had waked unaccustomed echoes in the dark cellar, and now he seemed struck with a fright which, though not comparable to my own, had in it more of the physical than of the spiritual. He drew a revolver, and motioned me to silence— and stepped out into the main cellar and closed the door behind him. Damnable racket! The storm will be the death of me, Elliot. But down in that dank cellar, I think I was paralysed for an instant. Imitating Pickman's listening, I 
fancied I heard a faint scurrying sound somewhere, and a series of squeals or bleats in a direction I couldn't determine. I thought of huge rats and shuddered. Then there came a subdued sort of clatter, which somehow set me all in goose flesh, a furtive, groping kind of clatter, though I can't attempt to convey what I mean in words. It was like heavy wood falling on stone or brick, wood on brick. What did that make me think of? Cursed rats! The deuce knows what they eat, Thurber. For those archaic tunnels touched graveyard and witch den and seacoast. But whatever it is, they must have run short, for they were devilish anxious to get out. Your yelling stirred them up, I fancy. Better be cautious in these old places. Our Odin friends were the one drawback, though. I sometimes think they're a positive asset by way of atmosphere and color. Well, Elliot, that was the end of the night's adventure. Pickman had promised to show me the place, and heaven knows he had done it. He led me out of that tangle of alleys in another direction, it seems. But when we sighted a lamppost, we were in a half-familiar street with monotonous rows of mingled tenement blocks and old houses. Charter Street, it turned out to be, but I was too flustered to notice just where we hit it. We were too late for the elevated— and walked back downtown through Hanover Street. I remember that walk. We switched from Tremont up Beacon, and Pickman left me at the corner of Joy, where I turned off. I never spoke to him again. Why did I drop him? No, it wasn't the paintings I saw in that place, though I'll swear they were enough to get him ostracized in nine-tenths of the homes and clubs of Boston— and I guess you won't wonder now why I have to steer clear of subways and cellars. It was something I found in my coat the next morning. You know, the curled-up paper tacked to that frightful canvas in the cellar. The thing I thought was a photograph of some scene he meant to use as a background for that monster. That last scare had come while I was reaching to uncurl it, and it seems I had vacantly crumpled it into my pocket— Yes, that paper was the reason I dropped Pickman. Richard Upton Pickman, the greatest artist I have ever known, and the foulest being that ever leaped the bounds of life into the pits of myth and madness. Elliot, old Reed was right. He wasn't strictly human. Either he was born in strange shadow, or he'd found a way to unlock the forbidden gate. It's all the same now, for he's gone— back into the fabulous darkness he loved to haunt. Don't ask me to explain or even conjecture about what I burned. Don't ask me either what lay behind that mole-like scrambling Pickman was so keen to pass off as rats. There are secrets, you know, which might have come down from old Salem times, and Cotton Mather tells even stranger things. You know how damned lifelike Pickman's paintings were— and we all wondered where he got those faces. Well, that paper wasn't a photograph of any background after all. What it showed was simply the monstrous being he was painting on that awful canvas. It was the model he was using, and its background was merely the wall of the cellar studio in minute detail. But by God, Elliot, it was a photograph from life— Farewell, Elliot. Watch how you go.
Imprisoned with the Pharaohs. One. Mystery attracts mystery. Ever since the wide appearance of my name as a performer of unexplained feats, I have encountered strange narratives and events which my calling has led people to link with my interests and activities. Some of these have been trivial and irrelevant, some deeply dramatic and absorbing some productive of weird and perilous experiences, and some involving me in extensive scientific and historical research. Many of these matters I have told, and shall continue to tell freely, but there is one of which I speak with great reluctance, and which I am now relating only after a session of grilling persuasion from the publishers of this magazine, who had heard vague rumours of it from other members of my family. The hitherto guarded subject pertains to my non-professional visit to Egypt fourteen years ago, and has been avoided by me for several reasons. For one thing, I am averse to exploiting certain unmistakably actual facts and conditions, obviously unknown to the myriad tourists who throng about the pyramids, and apparently secreted with much diligence by the authorities at Cairo, who cannot be wholly ignorant of them. For another thing— I dislike to recount an incident in which my own fantastic imagination must have played so great a part. What I saw, or thought I saw, certainly did not take place, but is rather to be viewed as a result of my then recent readings in Egyptology, and of the speculations anent this theme which my environment naturally prompted. These imaginative stimuli, magnified by the excitement of an actual event terrible enough in itself, undoubtedly gave rise to the culminating horror of that grotesque night so long past. In January 1910, I had finished a professional engagement in England, and signed a contract for a tour of Australian theatres. A liberal time being allowed for the trip, I determined to make the most of it in the sort of travel which chiefly interests me. So, accompanied by my wife, I drifted pleasantly down the continent, and embarked at Marseille on the P&O steamer Malwa, bound for Port Said. From that point I proposed to visit the principal historical localities of Lower Egypt, before leaving finally for Australia. The voyage was an agreeable one, and enlivened by many of the amusing incidents which befall a magical performer, apart from his work. I had intended, for the sake of quiet travel, to keep my name a secret— but was goaded into betraying myself by a fellow magician, whose anxiety to astound the passengers with ordinary tricks tempted me to duplicate and exceed his feats in a manner quite destructive of my incognito. I mention this because of its ultimate effect—an effect I should have foreseen before unmasking to a shipload of tourists about to scatter throughout the Nile Valley. What it did was to herald my identity wherever I subsequently went and deprive my wife and me of all the placid inconspicuousness we had sought. Travelling to seek curiosities, I was often forced to stand inspection as a sort of curiosity myself. We had come to Egypt in search of the picturesque and the mystically impressive, but found little enough when the ship edged up to Port Said, and discharged its passengers in small boats. Low dunes of sand, bobbing boys in shallow water, and a drearily European small town, with nothing of interest save the great de Lesseps statue, made us anxious to get on to something more worth our while. After some discussion, we decided to proceed at once to Cairo and the Pyramids, later going to Alexandria for the Australian boat, and for whatever Greco-Roman sites that ancient metropolis might present. The railway journey was tolerable enough, and consumed only four hours and a half, we saw much of the Suez Canal, whose route we followed as far as Ismailia, and later had a taste of old Egypt and our glimpse of the restored freshwater canal of the Middle Empire. Then at last we saw Cairo glimmering through the growing dusk, a twinkling constellation which became a blaze as we halted at the great Gare Centrale. But once more disappointment awaited us, 
for all that we beheld was European, save the costumes and the crowds. A prosaic subway led to a square teeming with carriages, taxicabs, and trolley cars, and gorgeous with electric light shining on tall buildings, whilst the very theatre where I was vainly requested to play, and which I later attended as a spectator, had recently been renamed the American Cosmograph. We stopped at Shepherd's Hotel, reached in a taxi that sped along broad, smartly built-up streets, and amidst the perfect service of its restaurant, elevators, and generally Anglo-American luxuries, the mysterious East and immemorial past seemed very far away. The next day, however, precipitated us delightfully into the heart of the Arabian Nights atmosphere, and in the winding ways and exotic skyline of Cairo, the Baghdad of Harun al-Rashid seemed to live again. Guided by our Baidecker, we had struck east past the Esbeki Gardens along the Muski, in quest of the native quarter, and were soon in the hands of a clamorous Cicerone, who, notwithstanding later developments, was assuredly a master at his trade. Not until afterward did I see that I should have applied at the hotel for a licensed guide. This man, a shaven, peculiarly hollow-voiced, and relatively cleanly fellow who looked like a pharaoh, and called himself Abdul Raisel Drogman, appeared to have much power over others of his kind, though subsequently the police professed not to know him, and to suggest that Rice is merely a name for any person in authority, whilst Drogman is obviously no more than a clumsy modification of the word for a leader of tourist parties, Dragoman. Abdul led us among such wonders as we had before only read and dreamed of. Old Cairo is itself a storybook and a dream, labyrinths of narrow alleys redolent of aromatic secrets, arabesque balconies and orioles nearly meeting above the cobbled streets, maelstroms of oriental traffic with strange cries, cracking whips, rattling carts, jingling money, and braying donkeys kaleidoscopes of polychrome robes, veils, turbans, and tarbushes, water-carriers and dervishes, dogs and cats, soothsayers and barbers, and over all the whining of blind beggars crouched in alcoves, and the sonorous chanting of muezzins from minarets limb delicately against a sky of deep, unchanging blue. The roofed, quieter bazaars were hardly less alluring. Spice, perfume— Incense, beads, rugs, silks, and brass. Old Mahmoud Suleiman squats cross-legged amidst his gummy bottles, while chattering youths pulverize mustard in the hollowed-out capital of an ancient classic column, a Roman Corinthian, perhaps from neighboring Heliopolis, where Augustus stationed one of his three Egyptian legions. Antiquity begins to mingle with exoticism, and then the mosques and the museum— we saw them all, and tried not to let our Arabian revel succumb to the darker charm of pharaonic Egypt, which the museum's priceless treasures offered. That was to be our climax, and for the present we concentrated on the medieval Saracenic glories of the caliphs, whose magnificent tomb mosques form a glittering fairy necropolis on the edge of the Arabian desert. At length Abdul took us along the Sharia Muhammad Ali, to the ancient mosque of Sultan Hassan, and the tower-flanked Bab al-Azab, beyond which climbs the steep-walled pass to the mighty citadel that Saladin himself built with the stones of forgotten pyramids. It was sunset when we scaled that cliff, circled the modern mosque of Muhammad Ali, and looked down from the dizzying parapet over mystic Cairo. Mystic Cairo, all golden, with its carven domes, its ethereal minarets, and its flaming gardens. Far over the city towered the great Roman dome of the new museum, and beyond it, across the cryptic yellow Nile that is the mother of eons and dynasties, lurked the menacing sands of the Libyan desert, undulant and iridescent and evil with older arcana. The red sun sank low, bringing the relentless chill of Egyptian dusk, and as it stood poised on the world's rim like that ancient god of Heliopolis, Ray Heracti, the horizon sun, we saw silhouetted against its vermeil holocaust the black outlines of the pyramids of Giza. The Paleogean tombs there were hoary with a thousand years, 
when Tutankhamun mounted his golden throne in distant Thebes. Then we knew that we were done with Saracen Cairo, and that we must taste the deeper mysteries of primal Egypt, the black Cam of Re and Amun, Isis, and Osiris. The next morning we visited the pyramids, riding out in a Victoria across the great Nile bridge with its bronze lions, the island of Gezira with its massive labyrinth trees, and the smaller English bridge to the western shore. Down the shore road we drove, between great rows of labyrinths, and past the vast zoological gardens, to the suburb of Giza, where a new bridge to Cairo proper has since been built. Then, turning inland along the Sharia el Haram, we crossed a region of glassy canals and shabby native villages, till before us loomed the objects of our quest, cleaving the mists of dawn and forming inverted replicas in the roadside pools. Forty centuries, as Napoleon had told his campaigners there, indeed looked down upon us. The road now rose abruptly till we finally reached our place of transfer between the trolley station and the Mina House Hotel. Abdul Rice, who capably purchased our pyramid tickets, seemed to have an understanding with the crowding, yelling, and offensive Bedouins who inhabited a squalid mud village some distance away, and pestiferously assailed every traveller, for he kept them very decently at bay, and secured an excellent pair of camels for us, himself mounting a donkey— and assigning the leadership of our animals to a group of men and boys more expensive than useful. The area to be traversed was so small that camels were hardly needed, but we did not regret adding to our experience this troublesome form of desert navigation. The pyramids stand on a high rock plateau, this group forming next to the northernmost of the series of regal and aristocratic cemeteries built in the neighbourhood of the extinct capital Memphis, which lay on the same side of the Nile, somewhat south of Giza, and which flourished between 3400 and 2000 BC. The greatest pyramid, which lies nearest the modern road, was built by King Cheops, or Khufu, about 2800 BC, and stands more than 450 feet in perpendicular height. In a line southwest from this are successively the second pyramid, built a generation later by King Kephron, and though slightly smaller, looking even larger because set on higher ground, and the radically smaller third pyramid of King Misserinus, built about 2700 BC. Near the edge of the plateau, and due east of the second pyramid, with a face probably altered to form a colossal portrait of Kephron, its royal restorer, stands the monstrous Sphinx, mute, sardonic, and wise beyond mankind and memory. Minor pyramids and the traces of ruined minor pyramids are found in several places, and the whole plateau is pitted with the tombs of dignitaries of less than royal rank. These latter were originally marked by mastabas, or stone bench-like structures about the deep burial shafts, as found in other Memphian cemeteries and exemplified by Peneb's tomb in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. At Giza, however— All such visible things have been swept away by time and pillage, and only the rock-hewn shafts, either sand-filled or cleared out by archaeologists, remain to attest their former existence. Connected with each tomb was a chapel, in which priests and relatives offered food and prayer to the hovering car, or vital principle of the deceased. The small tombs have their chapels contained in their stone mastabas or superstructures, but the mortuary chapels of the pyramids, where regal pharaohs lay, were separate temples, each to the east of its corresponding pyramid, and connected by a causeway to a massive gate chapel or propylon at the edge of the rock plateau. The gate chapel leading to the second pyramid, nearly buried in the drifting sands, yawns subterraneously southeast of the Sphinx. Persistent tradition dubs it the Temple of the Sphinx, and it may perhaps be rightly called such, if the Sphinx indeed represents the second pyramid's builder, Kephron. There are unpleasant tales of the Sphinx before Kephron, but whatever its elder features were, the monarch replaced them with his own that men might look at the Colossus without fear. It was in the great gateway temple that the life-size diorite statue of Kephron, now in the Cairo Museum, was found— 
a statue before which I stood in awe when I beheld it. Whether the whole edifice is now excavated, I am not certain, but in 1910 most of it was below ground, with the entrance heavily barred at night. Germans were in charge of the work, and the war or other things may have stopped them. I would give much, in view of my experience, and of certain Bedouin whisperings, discredited or unknown in Cairo, to know what has developed in connection with a certain well in a transverse gallery where statues of the pharaoh were found in curious juxtaposition to the statues of baboons. The road, as we traversed it on our camels that morning, curved sharply past the wooden police quarters, post office, drug store, and shops on the left, and plunged south and east in a complete bend that scaled the rock plateau and brought us face to face with the desert under the lee of the Great Pyramid. Past Cyclopean masonry we rode, rounding the eastern face and looking down ahead into a valley of minor pyramids beyond which the eternal Nile glistened to the east and the eternal desert shimmered to the west. Very close loomed the three major pyramids, the greatest devoid of outer casing and showing its bulk of great stones, but the others retaining here and there the neatly fitted covering which had made them smooth and finished in their day. Presently we descended toward the Sphinx, and sat silent beneath the spell of those terrible unseeing eyes. On the vast stone breast we faintly discerned the emblem of Re Heracti, for whose image the Sphinx was mistaken in a late dynasty, and though sand covered the tablet between the great paws, we recalled what Thutmosis the Fourth inscribed thereon, and the dream he had when a prince. It was then that the smile of the Sphinx vaguely displeased us, and made us wonder about the legends of subterranean passages beneath the monstrous creature, leading down, down, to depths none might dare hint at, depths connected with mysteries older than the dynastic Egypt we excavate, and having a sinister relation to the persistence of abnormal, animal-headed gods in the ancient Nilotic pantheon. Then, too, it was, I asked myself, an idle question, whose hideous significance was not to appear for many an hour. Other tourists now began to overtake us, and we moved on to the sand-choked Temple of the Sphinx, fifty yards to the southeast, which I have previously mentioned as the great gate of the causeway to the Second Pyramid's mortuary chapel on the plateau. Most of it was still underground, and although we dismounted and descended through a modern passageway to its alabaster corridor and pillared hall, I felt that Abdul and the local German attendant had not shown us all there was to see. After this we made the conventional circuit of the Pyramid Plateau, examining the Second Pyramid and the peculiar ruins of its mortuary chapel to the east, the Third Pyramid and its miniature southern satellites and ruined eastern chapel, the rock tombs and the honeycombings of the Fourth and Fifth Dynasties, and the famous Campbell's Tomb, whose shadowy shaft sinks precipitously for fifty-three feet to a sinister sarcophagus, which one of our camel-drivers divested of the cumbering sand after a vertiginous descent by rope. Cries now assailed us from the Great Pyramid, where Bedouins were besieging a party of tourists with offers of guidance to the top, or of displays of speed in the performance of solitary trips up and down. Seven minutes is said to be the record for such an ascent and descent, but many lusty shakes and sons of shakes assured us they could cut it to five, if given the requisite impetus of liberal backsheesh. They did not get this impetus, though we did let Abdul take us up, thus obtaining a view of unprecedented magnificence, which included not only remote and glittering Cairo, with its crown citadel and background of gold-violet hills, but all the pyramids of the Memphian district as well, from Abu Roche on the north to the Dasher on the south. The Saqqara Steppe Pyramid, which marks the evolution of the Loma Staba into the true pyramid, showed clearly and alluringly in the sandy distance. It is close to this transition monument that the famed tomb of Perneb was found, more than four hundred miles north of the Theban rock valley, where Tutankhamun sleeps. Again I was forced to silence through sheer awe, 
the prospect of such antiquity, and the secrets each hoary monument seemed to hold and brood over, filled me with a reverence and sense of immensity nothing else ever gave me. Fatigued by our climb, and disgusted with the importunate Bedouins, whose actions seemed to defy every rule of taste, we omitted the arduous detail of entering the cramped interior passages of any of the pyramids, though we saw several of the hardiest tourists preparing for the suffocating crawl through Cheops's mightiest memorial. As we dismissed and overpaid our local bodyguard, and drove back to Cairo with Abdul Rice under the afternoon sun, we half regretted the omission we had made. Such fascinating things were whispered about the lower pyramid passages not in the guidebooks, passages whose entrances had been hastily blocked up and concealed by certain uncommunicative archaeologists who had found and begun to explore them. Of course, this whispering was largely baseless on the face of it, but it was curious to reflect how persistently visitors were forbidden to enter the pyramids at night, or to visit the lowest burrows and crypt of the Great Pyramid. Perhaps in the latter case, it was the psychological effect which was feared, the effect on the visitor of feeling himself huddled down beneath a gigantic world of solid masonry, joined to the life he is known by the merest tube in which he may only crawl, and which any accident or evil design might block. The whole subject seemed so weird and alluring, that we resolved to pay the Pyramid Plateau another visit at the earliest possible opportunity. For me, this opportunity came much earlier than I expected. That evening, the members of our party feeling somewhat tired after the strenuous programme of the day, I went alone with Abdul Rice for a walk through the picturesque Arab quarter. Though I had seen it by day, I wished to study the alleys and bazaars in the dusk, when rich shadows and mellow gleams of light would add to their glamour and fantastic illusion. The native crowds were thinning, but were still very noisy and numerous, when we came upon a knot of revelling Bedouins in the Souk Anahasin, or Bazaar of the Coppersmiths. Their apparent leader, an insolent youth with heavy features and saucily cocked tabouche, took some notice of us, and evidently recognised, with no great friendliness, my competent but admittedly supercilious and sneeringly disposed guide. Perhaps, I thought, he resented that odd reproduction of the Sphinx's half-smile which I had often remarked with amused irritation, or perhaps he did not like the hollow and sepulchral resonance of Abdul's voice. At any rate, the exchange of ancestrally opprobrious language became very brisk, and before long, Halises, as I heard the stranger called, when called by no worse name, began to pull violently at Abdul's robe, an action quickly reciprocated, and leading to a spirited scuffle, in which both combatants lost their sacredly cherished headgear, and would have reached an even dire condition, had I not intervened and separated them by main force. My interference, at first seemingly unwelcome on both sides, succeeded at last in effecting a truce. Sullenly, each belligerent composed his wrath and his attire, and with an assumption of dignity as profound as it was sudden, the two formed a curious pact of honour, which I soon learned is a custom of great antiquity in Cairo, a pact for the settlement of their difference by means of a nocturnal fist-fight atop the Great Pyramid, long after the departure of the last moonlight sightseer. Each duellist was to assemble a party of seconds, and the affair was to begin at midnight, proceeding by rounds in the most civilised possible fashion. In all this planning, there was much which excited my interest. The fight itself promised to be unique and spectacular, while the thought of the scene on that hoary pile overlooking the antediluvian plateau of Giza under the wan moon of the pallid small hours appealed to every fibre of imagination in me. A request found Abdul exceedingly willing to admit me to his party of seconds, so that all the rest of the early evening I accompanied him to various dens in the most lawless regions of the town, mostly northeast of the Esbeki, where he gathered one by one a select and formidable band of congenial cutthroats as his pugilistic background. Shortly after nine, our party, mounted on donkeys bearing such royal or 
tourist reminiscent names as Ramesses, Mark Twain, J.P. Morgan, and Minnehaha, edged through street labyrinths both Oriental and Occidental, crossed the muddy and mast forested Nile by the bridge of the Bronze Lions, and cantered philosophically between the Lebbocks on the road to Giza. Slightly over two hours were consumed by the trip, toward the end of which we passed the last of the returning tourists, saluted the last inbound trolley car, and were alone with the night and the past and the spectral moon. Then we saw the vast pyramids at the end of the avenue, ghoulish with a dim atavistical menace which I had not seemed to notice in the daytime. Even the smallest of them held a hint of the ghastly. For was it not in this that they had buried Queen Natokris alive in the Sixth Dynasty? Subtle Queen Natokris, who once invited all her enemies to a feast in a temple below the Nile, and drowned them by opening the water gates. I recall that the Arabs whisper things about Natokris, and shun the Third Pyramid at certain phases of the moon. It must have been over her that Thomas Moore was brooding— when he wrote a thing muttered about by Memphian boatmen. The subterranean nymph that dwells mid sunless gems and glories hid, the Lady of the Pyramid. Early as we were, Elise's and his party were ahead of us, for we saw their donkeys outlined against the desert plateau at Kafr el-Haram, toward which squalid Arab settlement close to the Sphinx we had diverged instead of following the regular road to the Mina house, where some of the sleepy, inefficient police might have observed and halted us. Here, where filthy Bedouins stabled camels and donkeys in the rock tombs of Kefren's courtiers, we were led up the rocks and over the sand to the great pyramid, up whose time-worn sides the Arabs swarmed eagerly, Abdul Rais offering me the assistance I did not need. As most travellers know, The actual apex of this structure has long been worn away, leaving a reasonably flat platform twelve yards square. On this eerie pinnacle, a squared circle was formed, and in a few moments the sardonic desert moon leered down upon a battle which, but for the quality of the ringside cries, might well have occurred at some minor athletic club in America. As I watched it, I felt that some of our less desirable institutions were not lacking, for every blow, feint, and defence bespoke stalling to my not inexperienced eye. It was quickly over, and despite my misgivings as to methods, I felt a sort of proprietary pride when Abdul Rais was adjudged the winner. Reconciliation was phenomenally rapid, and amidst the singing, fraternising, and drinking which followed, I found it difficult to realise that a quarrel had ever occurred. Oddly enough, I myself seemed to be more of a centre of notice than the antagonists, and from my smattering of Arabic I judged that they were discussing my professional performances and escapes from every sort of manacle and confinement, in a manner which indicated not only a surprising knowledge of me, but a distinct hostility and scepticism concerning my feats of escape. It gradually dawned on me that the elder magic of Egypt did not depart without leaving traces, and that fragments of a strange, secret lore and priestly cult practices have survived surreptitiously amongst the Falahin to such an extent that the prowess of a strange Hawi or magician is resented and disputed. I thought of how much my hollow-voiced guide Abdul Rice looked like an old Egyptian priest or pharaoh or smiling sphinx, and wondered. Suddenly something happened which in a flash proved the correctness of my reflections, and made me curse the denseness whereby I had accepted this night's events as other than the empty and malicious frame-up they now showed themselves to be. Without warning, and doubtless in answer to some subtle sign from Abdul, the entire band of Bedouins precipitated itself upon me and having produced heavy ropes, soon had me bound as securely as I was ever bound in the course of my life, either on the stage or off. I struggled at first, but soon saw that one man could make no headway against a band of over twenty sinewy barbarians. My hands were tied behind my back, my knees bent to their fullest extent, and my wrists and ankles stoutly linked together— 
with unyielding cords. A stifling gag was forced into my mouth, and a blindfold fastened tightly over my eyes. Then, as the Arabs bore me aloft on their shoulders, and began a jouncing descent of the pyramid, I heard the taunts of my late guide Abdul, who mocked and jeered delightedly in his hollow voice, and assured me that I was soon to have my magic powers put to a supreme test, which would quickly remove any egotism I might have gained, through triumphing over all the tests offered by America and Europe. Egypt, he reminded me, is very old, and full of inner mysteries and antique powers not even conceivable to the experts of today, whose devices had so uniformly failed to entrap me. How far, or in what direction I was carried, I cannot tell, for the circumstances were all against the formation of any accurate judgment. I know, however, that it could not have been a great distance, since my bearers at no point hastened beyond a walk, yet kept me aloft a surprisingly short time. It is this perplexing brevity which makes me feel almost like shuddering whenever I think of Giza and its plateau, for one is oppressed by hints of the closeness to everyday tourist routes of what existed then and must exist still. The evil abnormality I speak of did not become manifest at first. Setting me down on a surface which I recognized as sand rather than rock, my captors passed a rope around my chest, and dragged me a few feet to a ragged opening in the ground, into which they presently lowered me with much rough handling. For apparent eons I bumped against the stony, irregular sides of a narrow-hewn well, which I took to be one of the numerous burial shafts of the plateau, until the prodigious, almost incredible depth of it robbed me of all basis of conjecture. The horror of the experience deepened with every dragging second, that any descent through the sheer solid rock could be so vast without reaching the core of the planet itself, or that any rope made by man could be so long as to dangle me in these unholy and seemingly fathomless profundities of nether-earth, were beliefs of such grotesqueness that it was easier to doubt my agitated senses than to accept them. Even now I am uncertain, for I know how deceitful the sense of time becomes when one or more of the usual perceptions or conditions of life is removed or distorted but I am quite sure that I preserved a logical consciousness that far, that at least I did not add any full-grown phantoms of imagination to a picture hideous enough in its reality, and explicable by a type of cerebral illusion vastly short of actual hallucination. All this was not the cause of my first bit of fainting. The shocking ordeal was cumulative— and the beginning of the later terrors was a very perceptible increase in my rate of descent. They were paying out that infinitely long rope very swiftly now, and I scraped cruelly against the rough and constricted sides of the shaft as I shot madly downward. My clothing was in tatters, and I felt the trickle of blood all over, even above the mounting and excruciating pain. My nostrils, too— were assailed by a scarcely definable menace, a creeping odour of damp and staleness curiously unlike anything I had ever smelt before, and having faint overtones of spice and incense that lent an element of mockery. Then the mental cataclysm came. It was horrible, hideous beyond all articulate description, because it was all of the soul, with nothing of detail to describe. It was the ecstasy of nightmare, and the summation of the fiendish. The suddenness of it was apocalyptic and demoniac. One moment I was plunging agonizingly down that narrow well of million-toothed torture, yet the next moment I was soaring on bat-wings in the gulfs of hell, swinging free and swoopingly through illimitable miles of boundless, musty space rising dizzily to measureless pinnacles of chilling ether, then diving gaspingly to sucking nadirs of ravenous, nauseous lower vacua. Thank God for the mercy that shut out in oblivion those 
clawing furies of consciousness which half unhinged my faculties, and tore harpy-like at my spirit. That one respite, short as it was, gave me the strength and sanity to endure those still greater sublimations of cosmic panic that lurked and gibbered on the road ahead. Two. It was very gradually that I regained my senses after that eldritch flight through Stygian space. The process was infinitely painful, and coloured by fantastic dreams, in which my bound and gagged condition found singular embodiment. The precise nature of these dreams was very clear while I was experiencing them, but became blurred in my recollection almost immediately afterward, and was soon reduced to the merest outline by the terrible events, real or imaginary, which followed. I dreamed that I was in the grasp of a great and horrible paw, a yellow, hairy, five-clawed paw, which had reached out of the earth to crush and engulf me. And when I stopped to reflect what the paw was, it seemed to me that it was Egypt. In the dream, I looked back at the events of the preceding weeks, and saw myself lured and enmeshed little by little, subtly and insidiously, by some hellish ghoul spirit of the Elder Nile sorcery, some spirit that was in Egypt before ever man was, and that will be when man is no more. I saw the horror and unwholesome antiquity of Egypt, and the grisly alliance it has always had with the tombs and temples of the dead. I saw phantom processions of priests with the heads of bulls, falcons, cats, and ibises, phantom processions marching interminably through subterraneous labyrinths, and avenues of titanic propylia beside which a man is as a fly, and offering unnameable sacrifices to indescribable gods. Stone colossi marched in endless night, and drove herds of grinning androsphinxes down to the shores of illimitable stagnant rivers of pitch. And behind it all, I saw the ineffable malignity of primordial necromancy, black and amorphous, and fumbling greedily after me in the darkness to choke out the spirit that had dared to mock it by emulation. In my sleeping brain there took shape a melodrama of sinister hatred and pursuit and I saw the black soul of Egypt singling me out and calling me in inaudible whispers, calling and luring me, leading me on with the glitter and glamour of a Saracenic surface, but ever pulling me down to the age-mad catacombs and horrors of its dead and abysmal pharaonic heart. Then the dream faces took on human resemblances, and I saw my guide Abdul Rice in the robes of a king, with the sneer of the sphinx on his features and I knew that those features were the features of Kephren the Great, who raised the second pyramid, carved over the Sphinx's face in the likeness of his own, and built that titanic gateway temple, whose myriad corridors the archaeologists think they have dug out of the cryptical sand and the uninformative rock. And I looked at the long, lean, rigid hand of Kephren, the long, lean, rigid hand as I had seen it on the diorite statue in the Cairo Museum, the statue they had found in the terrible gateway temple, and wondered that I had not shrieked when I saw it on Abdul Rice. That hand! It was hideously cold, and it was crushing me. It was the cold and cramping of the sarcophagus, the chill and constriction of unrememberable Egypt. It was knighted, necropolitan Egypt itself, that yellow paw, and they whisper such things of Kephren. But at this juncture I began to awake, or at least to assume a condition less completely that of sleep than the one just preceding. I recalled the fight atop the pyramid, the treacherous Bedouins and their attack, my frightful descent by rope through endless rock depths, and my mad swinging and plunging in a chill void redolent of aromatic putrescence. I perceived that I now lay on a damp rock floor, and that my bonds were still biting into me with unloosened force. It was very cold, and I seemed to detect a faint current of noisome air sweeping across me. The cuts and bruises I had received from the jagged sides of the rock shaft 
were paining me woefully. Their soreness enhanced to a stinging or burning acuteness by some pungent quality in the faint draught, and the mere act of rolling over was enough to set my whole frame throbbing with untold agony. As I turned, I felt a tug from above, and concluded that the rope whereby I was lowered still reached to the surface. Whether or not the Arabs still held it, I had no idea, nor had I any idea how far within the earth I was. I knew that the darkness around me was wholly or nearly total, since no ray of moonlight penetrated my blindfold. But I did not trust my senses enough to accept as evidence of extreme depth the sensation of vast duration which had characterized my descent. Knowing at least that I was in a space of considerable extent reached from the surface directly above by an opening in the rock, I doubtfully conjectured that my prison was perhaps the buried gateway chapel of old Kephron, the temple of the Sphinx, perhaps some inner corridor which the guides had not shown me during my morning visit, and from which I might easily escape if I could find my way to the barred entrance. It would be a labyrinthine wandering, but no worse than others out of which I had in the past found my way. The first step was to get free of my bonds, gag, and blindfold, and this I knew would be no great task, since subtler experts than these Arabs had tried every known species of fetter upon me during my long and varied career as an exponent of escape, yet had never succeeded in defeating my methods. Then it occurred to me that the Arabs might be ready to meet and attack me at the entrance upon any evidence of my probable escape from the binding cords, as would be furnished by any decided agitation of the rope which they probably held. This, of course, was taking for granted that my place of confinement was indeed Kephren's Temple of the Sphinx. The direct opening in the roof, wherever it might lurk, could not be beyond easy reach of the ordinary modern entrance near the Sphinx, if in truth it were any great distance at all on the surface, since the total area known to visitors is not at all enormous. I had not noticed any such opening during my daytime pilgrimage, but knew that these things are easily overlooked amidst the drifting sands. Thinking these matters over as I lay bent and bound on the rock floor, I nearly forgot the horrors of the abysmal descent and cavernous swinging which had so lately reduced me to a coma. My present thought was only to outwit the Arabs, and I accordingly determined to work myself free as quickly as possible, avoiding any tug on the descending line which might betray an effective or even problematical attempt at freedom. This, however, was more easily determined than effected. A few preliminary trials made it clear that little could be accomplished without considerable motion, and it did not surprise me when, after one especially energetic struggle, I began to feel the coils of falling rope as they piled up about me and upon me. Obviously, I thought, the Bedouins had felt my movements and released their end of the rope, hastening, no doubt, to the temple's true entrance to lie murderously in wait for me. The prospect was not pleasing— but I had faced worse in my time without flinching, and would not flinch now. At present I must first of all free myself of bonds, then trust to ingenuity to escape from the temple unharmed. It is curious how implicitly I had come to believe myself in the old temple of Kephrim beside the Sphinx, only a short distance below the ground. That belief was shattered and every pristine apprehension of preternatural depth and demoniac mystery revived, by a circumstance which grew in horror and significance even as I formulated my philosophical plan. I have said that the falling rope was piling up about and upon me. Now I saw that it was continuing to pile, as no rope of normal length could possibly do. It gained in momentum and became an avalanche of hemp, accumulating mountainously on the floor, and half burying me beneath its swiftly multiplying coils. Soon I was completely engulfed and gasping for breath, as the increasing convulsion submerged and stifled me. My senses tottered again, and I vainly tried to fight off a menace desperate and ineluctable. It was not merely that I was tortured beyond human endurance— not merely that life and breath seemed to be crushed slowly out of me, it was the knowledge of what those unnatural lengths of rope implied, 
and the consciousness of what unknown and incalculable gulfs of inner earth must at this moment be surrounding me. My endless descent and swinging flight through goblin space, then, must have been real, and even now I must be lying helpless in some nameless cavern world toward the core of the planet. Such a sudden confirmation of ultimate horror was insupportable, and a second time I lapsed into merciful oblivion. When I say oblivion, I do not imply that I was free from dreams. On the contrary, my absence from the conscious world was marked by visions of the most unutterable hideousness. God, if only I had not read so much Egyptology before coming to this land which is the fountain of all darkness and terror. This second spell of fainting filled my sleeping mind anew with shivering realization of the country and its archaic secrets, and through some damnable chance my dreams turned to the ancient notions of the dead and their sojournings in soul and body beyond those mysterious tombs which were more houses than graves. I recalled, in dream shapes which it is as well that I do not remember, the peculiar and elaborate construction of Egyptian sepulchres, and the exceedingly singular and terrific doctrines which determined this construction. All these people thought of was death and the dead. They conceived of a literal resurrection of the body, which made them mummify it with desperate care, and preserve all the vital organs in canopic jars near the corpse, whilst, besides the body, they believed in two other elements. The soul, which after its weighing and approval by Osiris, dwelt in the land of the blessed, and the obscure and portentous car, or life-principle, which wandered about the upper and lower worlds in a horrible way, demanding occasional access to the preserved body, consuming the food offerings brought by priests and pious relatives to the mortuary chapel, and sometimes, as men whispered, taking its body or the wooden double always buried beside it, and stalking noxiously abroad on errands peculiarly repellent. For thousands of years those bodies rested gorgeously encased and staring glassily upward when not visited by the car, awaiting the day when Osiris should restore both car and soul, and lead forth the stiff legions of the dead from the sunken houses of sleep. It was to have been a glorious rebirth, but not all souls were approved, nor were all tombs inviolate, so that certain grotesque mistakes and Fiendish abnormalities were to be looked for. Even today the Arabs murmur of unsanctified convocations and unwholesome worship in forgotten nether abysses, which only winged invisible cars and soulless mummies may visit and return unscathed. Perhaps the most leeringly blood-congealing legends are those which relate to certain perverse products of decadent priestcraft, Composite mummies made by the artificial union of human trunks and limbs with the heads of animals in imitation of the elder gods. At all stages of history, the sacred animals were mummified, so that consecrated bulls, cats, ibises, crocodiles, and the like might return some day to greater glory. But only in the decadence did they mix the human and animal in the same mummy. Only in the decadence— when they did not understand the rights and prerogatives of the car and the soul. What happened to those composite mummies is not told of, at least publicly, and it is certain that no Egyptologist ever found one. The whispers of Arabs are very wild, and cannot be relied upon. They even hint that old Kephron, he of the Sphinx, the Second Pyramid, and the Yawning Gateway Temple, lives far underground, wedded to the ghoul queen Natokris, and ruling over the mummies that are neither of man nor of beast. It was of these, of Kephren and his consort and his strange armies of the hybrid dead, that I dreamed, and that is why I am glad the exact dream shapes have faded from my memory. My most horrible vision was connected with an idle question I had asked myself the day before when, looking at the great carven riddle of the desert, and wondering with what unknown depths the temple so close to it might be secretly connected. That question, so innocent and whimsical then, 
assumed in my dream a meaning of frenetic and hysterical madness. What huge and loathsome abnormality was the Sphinx originally carven to represent? My second awakening, if awakening it was, is a memory of stark hideousness which nothing else in my life, save one thing which came after, can parallel, and that life has been full and adventurous beyond most men's. Remember that I had lost consciousness whilst buried beneath a cascade of falling rope whose immensity revealed the cataclysmic depth of my present position. Now, as perception returned, I felt the entire weight gone, and realized upon rolling over that although I was still tied, gagged, and blindfolded, some agency had removed completely the suffocating hempen landslide which had overwhelmed me. The significance of this condition, of course, came to me only gradually, but even so I think it would have brought unconsciousness again, had I not by this time reached such a state of emotional exhaustion that no new horror could make much difference. I was alone. With what? Before I could torture myself with any new reflection, or make any fresh effort to escape from my bonds, an additional circumstance became manifest. Pains not formally felt were racking my arms and legs, and I seemed coated with a profusion of dried blood beyond anything my former cuts and abrasions could furnish. My chest, too, seemed pierced by a hundred wounds, as though some malign, titanic ibis had been pecking at it. Assuredly, the agency which had removed the rope was a hostile one, and it began to wreak terrible injuries upon me when somehow impelled to desist. Yet at the time my sensations were distinctly the reverse of what one might expect. Instead of sinking into a bottomless pit of despair, I was stirred to a new courage and action. For now I felt that the evil forces were physical things which a fearless man might encounter on an even basis. On the strength of this thought, I tugged again at my bonds, and used all the art of a lifetime to free myself, as I had so often done amidst the glare of lights and the applause of vast crowds. The familiar details of my escaping process commenced to engross me, and now that the long rope was gone, I half regained my belief that the supreme horrors were hallucinations after all, and that there had never been any terrible shaft, measureless abyss, or interminable rope. Was I, after all, in the gateway temple of Kephrim beside the Sphinx, and had the sneaking Arab stolen in to torture me as I lay helpless there? At any rate, I must be free. Let me stand up unbound, ungagged, and with eyes open, to catch any glimmer of light which might come trickling from any source, and I could actually delight in the combat against evil and treacherous foes. How long I took in shaking off my encumbrances, I cannot tell. It must have been longer than in my exhibition performances, because I was wounded, exhausted, and enervated by the experiences I had passed through. When I was finally free, and taking deep breaths of a chill, damp, evilly spiced air all the more horrible when encountered without the screen of gag and blindfold edges, I found that I was too cramped and fatigued to move at once. There I lay, trying to stretch a frame bent and mangled for an indefinite period, and straining my eyes to catch a glimpse of some ray of light which would give a hint as to my position. By degrees my strength and flexibility returned, but my eyes beheld nothing. As I staggered to my feet, I peered diligently in every direction, yet met only an ebony blackness, as great as that I had known when blindfolded. I tried my legs, blood-encrusted beneath my shredded trousers, and found that I could walk, yet could not decide in what direction to go. Obviously, I ought not to walk at random, and perhaps retreat directly from the entrance I sought. So I paused to note the direction of the cold, fetid, natron-scented air current, which I had never ceased to feel. Accepting the point of its source as the possible entrance to the abyss, I strove to keep track of this landmark, and to walk consistently toward it. I had had a matchbox with me, and even a small electric flashlight, 
But, of course, the pockets of my tossed and tattered clothing were long since emptied of all heavy articles. As I walked cautiously in the blackness, the draught grew stronger and more offensive, till at length I could regard it as nothing less than a tangible stream of detestable vapour pouring out of some aperture like the smoke of the genie from the fisherman's jar in the eastern tail. The East, Egypt. Truly, this dark cradle of civilization was ever the wellspring of horrors and marvels unspeakable. The more I reflected on the nature of this cavern wind, the greater my sense of disquiet became. For although despite its odour I had sought its source as at least an indirect clue to the outer world, I now saw plainly that this foul emanation could have no admixture or connection whatsoever with the clean air of the Libyan desert but must be essentially a thing vomited from sinister gulfs still lower down. I had, then, been walking in the wrong direction. After a moment's reflection, I decided not to retrace my steps. Away from the draught, I would have no landmarks, for the roughly level rock floor was devoid of distinctive configurations. If, however, I followed up the strange current— I would undoubtedly arrive at an aperture of some sort, from whose gate I could perhaps work round the walls to the opposite side of this cyclopean and otherwise unnavigable hall. That I might fail, I well realised. I saw that this was no part of Kefren's gateway temple, which tourists know, and it struck me that this particular hall might be unknown even to archaeologists and merely stumbled upon by the inquisitive and malignant Arabs who had imprisoned me. If so, was there any present gate of escape to the known parts, or to the outer air? What evidence, indeed, did I now possess that this was the gateway temple at all? For a moment, all my wildest speculations rushed back upon me, and I thought of that vivid melange of impressions, descent, suspension in space, the rope, my wounds, and the dreams that were frankly dreams. Was this the end of life for me? Or, indeed, would it be merciful if this moment were the end? I could answer none of my own questions, but merely kept on till fate, for a third time, reduced me to oblivion. This time there were no dreams, for the suddenness of the incident shocked me out of all thought, either conscious or subconscious. Tripping on an unexpected descending step, at a point where the offensive draught became strong enough to offer an actual physical resistance, I was precipitated headlong down a black flight of huge stone stairs, into a gulf of hideousness unrelieved. That I ever breathed again is a tribute to the inherent vitality of the healthy human organism. Often, I look back to that night and feel a touch of actual humour— in those repeated lapses of consciousness, lapses whose succession reminded me at the time of nothing more than the crude cinema melodramas of that period. Of course, it is possible that the repeated lapses never occurred, and that all the features of that underground nightmare were merely the dreams of one long coma, which began with the shock of my descent into that abyss, and ended with the healing balm of the outer air, and of the rising sun which found me stretched on the sands of Giza, before the sardonic and dawn-flushed face of the great Sphinx. I prefer to believe this latter explanation as much as I can. Hence was glad when the police told me that the barrier to Kefren's gateway temple had been found unfastened, and that a sizable rift to the surface did actually exist in one corner of the still buried part. I was glad, too, when the doctors pronounced my wounds only those to be expected from my seizure, blindfolding, lowering, struggling with bonds, falling some distance, perhaps into a depression in the temple's inner gallery, dragging myself to the outer barrier, and escaping from it, and experiences like that, a very soothing diagnosis. And yet I know that there must be more than appears on the surface— That extreme descent is too vivid a memory to be dismissed, and it is odd that no one has ever been able to find a man answering the description of my guide, Abdul Raisel Drogman, the tomb-throated guide who looked and smiled like King Kefren. I have digressed from my connected narrative. 
perhaps in the vain hope of evading the telling of that final incident, that incident which of all is most certainly an hallucination. But I promise to relate it, and do not break promises. When I recovered, or seemed to recover my senses after that fall down the black stone stairs, I was quite as alone and in darkness as before. The windy stench, bad enough before, was now fiendish, yet I had acquired enough familiarity by this time to bear it stoically. Dazedly, I began to crawl away from the place whence the putrid wind came, and with my bleeding hands felt the colossal blocks of a mighty pavement. Once my head struck against a hard object, and when I felt of it I learned that it was the base of a column, a column of unbelievable immensity, whose surface was covered with gigantic chiselled hieroglyphics, very perceptible to my touch. Crawling on, I encountered other titan columns at incomprehensible distances apart, when suddenly my attention was captured by the realization of something which must have been impinging on my subconscious hearing long before the conscious sense was aware of it. From some still lower chasm in earth's bowels were proceeding certain sounds, measured and definite, and like nothing I had ever heard before. That they were very ancient and distinctly ceremonial, I felt almost intuitively, and much reading in Egyptology led me to associate them with the flute, the sambuc, the sistrum, and the tympanum. In their rhythmic piping, droning, rattling, and beating, I felt an element of terror beyond all the known terrors of earth, a terror peculiarly disassociated from personal fear, and taking the form of a sort of objective pity for our planet, that it should hold within its depth such horrors as must lie beyond these Ajapanic cacophonies. The sounds increased in volume, and I felt that they were approaching. Then, and may all the gods of all pantheons unite to keep the like from my ears again, I began to hear, faintly and afar off, the morbid and millennial tramping of the marching things. It was hideous that footfalls so dissimilar should move in such perfect rhythm. The training of unhallowed thousands of years must lie behind that march of earth's inmost monstrosities, padding, clicking, walking, stalking, rumbling, lumbering, crawling, and all to the abhorrent discords of those mocking instruments. And then, God keep the memory of those Arab legends out of my head, the mummies without souls, the meeting place of the wandering cars, the hordes of the devil-cursed pharaonic dead of forty centuries, the composite mummies led through the uttermost onyx voids by King Kefren and his ghoul queen, Nitocris. The tramping drew nearer. Heaven save me from the sound of those feet and paws and hooves and pads and talons as it commenced to acquire detail. Down limitless reaches of sunless pavement a spark of light flickered in the malodorous wind, and I drew behind the enormous circumference of a cyclopic column that I might escape for a while the horror that was stalking million-footed toward me through gigantic hyperstyles of inhuman dread and phobic antiquity. The flickers increased, and the tramping and dissonant rhythm grew sickeningly loud. In the quivering orange light there stood faintly forth a scene of such stony awe that I gasped from a sheer wonder that conquered even fear and repulsion. Bases of columns whose middles were higher than human sight, mere bases of things that must each dwarf the Eiffel Tower to insignificance, hieroglyphics carved by unthinkable hands in caverns where daylight can be only a remote legend. I would not look at the marching things. That I desperately resolved as I heard their creaking joints and nitrous wheezing above the dead music and the dead tramping. It was merciful that they did not speak, but God, their crazy torches began to cast shadows on the surface of those stupendous columns. Heaven take it away! Hippopotami should not have human hands and carry torches! Men should not have the heads of crocodiles! 
I tried to turn away, but the shadows and the sounds and the stench were everywhere. Then I remembered something I used to do in half-conscious nightmares as a boy, and began to repeat to myself, This is a dream! This is a dream! But it was of no use, and I could only shut my eyes and pray. At least that is what I think I did, for one is never sure in visions, and I know this can have been nothing more. I wondered whether I should ever reach the world again, and at times would furtively open my eyes to see if I could discern any feature of the place, other than the wind of spiced putrefaction, the topless columns, and the thaumatropically grotesque shadows of abnormal horror. The sputtering glare of multiplying torches now shone, and unless this hellish place were wholly without walls, I could not fail to see some boundary or fixed landmark soon, but I had to shut my eyes again when I realized how many of the things were assembling, and when I glimpsed a certain object walking solemnly and steadily without any body above the waist. A fiendish and allulent corpse gurgle or death rattle now split the very atmosphere, the charnel atmosphere poisonous with naphtha and bitumen blasts, in one concerted chorus from the ghoulish legion of hybrid blasphemies. My eyes, perversely shaken open, gazed for an instant upon a sight which no human creature could even imagine without panic fear and physical exhaustion. The things had filed ceremonially in one direction, the direction of the noisome wind, where the light of their torches showed their bended heads, or the bended heads of such as had heads. They were worshipping before a great black fetter belching aperture, which reached up almost out of sight, and which I could see was flanked at right angles by two giant staircases, whose ends were far away in shadow. One of these was indubitably the staircase I had fallen down. The dimensions of the whole were fully in proportion with those of the columns. An ordinary house would have been lost in it, and any average public building could easily have been moved in and out. It was so vast a surface that only by moving the eye could one trace its boundaries. So vast, so hideously black, and so aromatically stinking— Directly in front of this yawning polyphemus door, the things were throwing objects, evidently sacrifices or religious offerings, to judge by their gestures. Kefren was their leader, sneering King Kefren, or the guide Abdul Rice, crowned with a golden skent, and intoning endless formulae with a hollow voice of the dead. By his side knelt beautiful Queen Netocris, whom I saw in profile for a moment noting that the right half of her face was eaten away by rats or other ghouls. And I shut my eyes again when I saw what objects were being thrown as offerings to the fetid aperture or its possible local deity. It occurred to me that, judging from the elaborateness of this worship, the concealed deity must be one of considerable importance. Was it to Cyrus or Isis, Horus or Anubis, or some vast unknown god of the dead, still more central and supreme. There is a legend that terrible altars and colossi were reared to an unknown one, before ever the known gods were worshipped. And now, as I steeled myself to watch the rapt and sepulchral adorations of those nameless things, a thought of escape flashed upon me. The hall was dim, and the columns heavy with shadow with every creature of that nightmare throng absorbed in shocking raptures, it might be barely possible for me to creep past to the faraway end of one of the staircases and ascend unseen, trusting to fate and skill to deliver me from the upper reaches. Where I was I neither knew nor seriously reflected upon, and for a moment it struck me as amusing to plan a serious escape from that which I knew to be a dream— Was I in some hidden and unsuspected lower realm of Kefren's gateway temple, that temple which generations have persistently called the Temple of the Sphinx? I could not conjecture, but I resolved to ascend to life and consciousness, if wit and muscle could carry me. Wriggling flat on my stomach, 
I began the anxious journey toward the foot of the left-hand staircase, which seemed the more accessible of the two. I cannot describe the incidents and sensations of that crawl, but they may be guessed when one reflects on what I had to watch steadily in that malign, wind-blown torchlight in order to avoid detection. The bottom of the staircase was, as I have said, far away in shadow, as it had to be to rise without a bend to the dizzy parapeted landing above the titanic aperture. This placed the last stages of my crawl at some distance from the noisome herd, though the spectacle chilled me even when quite remote at my right. At length I succeeded in reaching the steps, and began to climb, keeping close to the wall, on which I observed decorations of the most hideous sort, and relying for safety on the absorbed, ecstatic interest with which the monstrosities watched the foul-breezed aperture, and the impious objects of nourishment they had flung on the pavement before it. Though the staircase was huge and steep, fashioned of vast porphyry blocks as if for the feet of a giant, the ascent seemed virtually interminable. Dread of discovery and the pain which renewed exercise had brought to my wounds combined to make that upward crawl a thing of agonizing memory. I had intended, on reaching the landing, to climb immediately onward along whatever upper staircase might mount from there, stopping for no last look at the carrion abominations that poured and genuflected some seventy or eighty feet below, yet a sudden repetition of that thunderous corpse-gurgle and death-rattle chorus, coming as I had nearly gained the top of the flight, and showing by its ceremonial rhythm that it was not an alarm of my discovery, caused me to pause and peer cautiously over the parapet. The monstrosities were hailing something which had poked itself out of the nauseous aperture to seize the hellish fare proffered it. It was something quite ponderous, even as seen from my height, something yellowish and hairy, and endowed with a sort of nervous motion. It was as large, perhaps, as a good-sized hippopotamus, but very curiously shaped. It seemed to have no neck, but five separate shaggy heads springing in a row from a roughly cylindrical trunk, the first very small, the second good-sized, the third and fourth equal and largest of all, and the fifth rather small, though not so small as the first. Out of these heads darted curious rigid tentacles, which seized ravenously on the excessively great quantities of unmentionable food placed before the aperture. Once in a while, the thing would leap up, and occasionally it would retreat into its den in a very odd manner. Its locomotion was so inexplicable that I stared in fascination, wishing it would emerge further from the cavernous lair beneath me. Then it did emerge. It did emerge, and at the sight I turned and fled into the darkness up the higher staircase that rose behind me, fled unknowingly up incredible steps and ladders and inclined planes to which no human sight or logic guided me, and which I must ever relegate to the world of dreams for want of any confirmation. It must have been a dream, or the dawn would never have found me breathing on the sands of Giza before the sardonic dawn-flushed face of the Great Sphinx. The Great Sphinx? God! That idle question I asked myself on that sun-blessed morning before— what huge and loathsome abnormality was the Sphinx originally carven to represent? Accursed is the sight, be it in dream or not, that revealed to me the supreme horror, the unknown god of the dead, which licks its colossal chops in the unsuspected abyss, fed hideous morsels by soulless absurdities that should not exist. The five-headed monster that emerged, that five-headed monster as large as a hippopotamus, the five-headed monster, and that of which it is the merest forepaw. But I survived, and I know it was only a dream.
in the vault. There is nothing more absurd, as I view it, than that conventional association of the homely and the wholesome, which seems to pervade the psychology of the multitude. Bench in a bucolic Yankee setting, a bungling and thick-fibred village undertaker, and a careless mishap in a tomb, and no average reader can be brought to expect more than a hearty, albeit grotesque, phase of comedy. God knows, though, that the prosy tale which George Birch's death permits me to tell has in it aspects besides which some of our darkest tragedies are light. Birch acquired a limitation, and changed his business in 1881, yet never discussed the case when he could avoid it. Neither did his old physician, Dr. Davis, who died years ago. It was generally stated that the affliction and shock were results of an unlucky slip, whereby Birch had locked himself for nine hours in the receiving tomb of Peck Valley Cemetery, escaping only by crude and disastrous mechanical means. But while this much was undoubtedly true, there were other and blacker things which the man used to whisper to me in his drunken delirium toward the last. He confided in me because I was his doctor, and because he probably felt the need of confiding in someone else after Davis died. He was a bachelor, wholly without relatives. Birch, before 1881, had been the village undertaker of Peck Valley, and was a very callous and primitive specimen, even as such specimens go. The practices I heard attributed to him would be unbelievable today, at least in a city— and even Peck Valley would have shuddered a bit had it known the easy ethics of its mortuary artist in such debatable matters as the ownership of costly laying out apparel invisible beneath a casket's lid, and the degree of dignity to be maintained in posing and adapting the unseen members of lifeless tenants to containers not always calculated with sublimest accuracy. Most distinctly, Birch was lax, insensitive, and professionally undesirable— yet I still think he was not an evil man. He was merely crass of fibre and function, thoughtless, careless, and licorice, as his easily avoidable accident proves, and without that modicum of imagination which holds the average citizen within certain limits fixed by taste. Just where to begin Birch's story, I can hardly decide, since I am no practised teller of tales. I suppose one should start in the cold December of 1880, when the ground froze, and the cemetery delvers found they could dig no more graves till spring. Fortunately, the village was small, and the death rate low, so that it was possible to give all of Birch's inanimate charges a temporary haven in the single antiquated receiving tomb. The undertaker grew doubly lethargic in the bitter weather— and seemed to outdo even himself in carelessness. Never did he knock together flimsier and ungainlier caskets, or disregard more flagrantly the needs of the rusty lock on the tomb door, which he slammed open and shut with such nonchalant abandon. At last the spring thaw came, and graves were laboriously prepared for the nine silent harvests of the grim reaper which waited in the tomb. But— though dreading the bother of removal and interment, began his task of transference one disagreeable April morning, but ceased before noon, because of a heavy rain that seemed to irritate his horse, after having laid but one mortal tenement to its permanent rest. That was Darius Peck, the nonagenarian, whose grave was not far from the tomb. Birch decided that he would begin the next day with little old Matthew Fenner, whose grave was also nearby but actually postponed the matter for three days, not getting to work till Good Friday, the 15th. Being without superstition, he did not heed the day at all, though ever afterward he refused to do anything of importance on that fateful sixth day of the week. Certainly, the events of that evening greatly changed George Birch. On the afternoon of Friday, April 15th, then, Birch set out for the tomb with horse and wagon, to transfer the body of Matthew Fenner. That he was not perfectly sober, he subsequently admitted, though he had not then taken to the wholesale drinking by which he later tried to forget certain things. 
He was just dizzy and careless enough to annoy his sensitive horse, which, as he drew it viciously up at the tomb, neighed and pawed and tossed its head, much as on that former occasion when the rain had vexed it. The day was clear, but a high wind had sprung up, and Birch was glad to get to shelter as he unlocked the iron door and entered the side-hill vault. Another might not have relished the damp, odorous chamber with the eight carelessly placed coffins, but Birch in those days was insensitive, and was concerned only in getting the right coffin for the right grave. He had not forgotten the criticism aroused when Hannah Bixby's relatives, wishing to transport her body to the cemetery in the city whither they had moved, found the casket of Judge Capwell beneath her headstone. The light was dim, but Birch's sight was good, and he did not get a Saff Sawyer's coffin by mistake, although it was very similar. He had, indeed, made that coffin for Matthew Fenner, but had cast it aside at last as too awkward and flimsy, in a fit of curious sentimentality, aroused by recalling how kindly and generous the little old man had been to him during his bankruptcy five years before. He gave old Matt the very best his skill could produce, but was thrifty enough to save the rejected specimen, and to use it when a Saff Sawyer died of a malignant fever. Sawyer was not a lovable man, and many stories were told of his almost inhuman vindictiveness, and tenacious memory for wrongs, real or fancied. To him Birch had felt no compunction in assigning the carelessly made coffin, which he now pushed out of the way in his quest for the Fenner casket. It was just as he had recognized old Matt's coffin, that the door slammed to in the wind, leaving him in a dusk even deeper than before. The narrow transom admitted only the feeblest of rays, and the overhead ventilation funnel virtually none at all, so that he was reduced to a profane fumbling as he made his halting way among the long boxes toward the latch. In this funereal twilight he rattled the rusty handles, pushed at the iron panels, and wondered why the massive portal had grown so suddenly recalcitrant. In this twilight, too, he began to realize the truth, and to shout loudly, as if his horse outside could do more than neigh an unsympathetic reply, for the long-neglected latch was obviously broken, leaving the careless undertaker trapped in the vault, a victim of his own oversight. The thing must have happened at about three-thirty in the afternoon. Birch, being a temperament phlegmatic and practical, did not shout long, but proceeded to grope about for some tools which he recalled seeing in a corner of the tomb. It is doubtful whether he was touched at all by the horror and exquisite weirdness of his position, but the bold fact of imprisonment, so far from the daily paths of men, was enough to exasperate him thoroughly. His day's work was sadly interrupted, and unless chance presently brought some rambler hither, he might have to remain all night or longer. The pile of tools soon reached, and a hammer and chisel selected, Birch returned over the coffins to the door. The air had begun to be exceedingly unwholesome, but to this detail he paid no attention, as he toiled, half by feeling, at the heavy and corroded metal of the latch. He would have given much for a lantern or bit of candle, but lacking these, bungled semi-sightlessly as best he might. When he perceived that the latch was hopelessly unyielding, at least to such meagre tools and under such tenebrous conditions as these, Birch glanced about for other possible points of escape. The vault had been dug from a hillside, so that the narrow ventilation funnel in the top ran through several feet of earth, making this direction utterly useless to consider. Over the door, however, the high, slit-like transom in the brick façade gave promise of possible enlargement to a diligent worker. Hence upon this his eyes long rested, as he racked his brains for means to reach it. There was nothing like a ladder in the tomb, and the coffin niches on the sides and rear, which Birch seldom took the trouble to use, afforded no ascent to the space above the door. Only the coffins themselves remained as potential stepping-stones, 
and as he considered these, he speculated on the best mode of arranging them. Three coffin heights, he reckoned, would permit him to reach the transom, but he could do better with four. The boxes were fairly even, and could be piled up like blocks, so he began to compute how he might most stably use the eight to rear a scalable platform four deep. As he planned, he could not but wish that the units of his contemplated staircase had been more securely made. Whether he had imagination enough to wish they were empty, is strongly to be doubted. Finally, he decided to lay a base of three parallel with the wall, to place upon this two layers of two each, and upon these a single box to serve as the platform. This arrangement could be ascended with a minimum of awkwardness, and would furnish the desired height. Better still, though, he would utilize only two boxes of the base to support the superstructure, leaving one free to be piled on top, in case the actual feat of escape required an even greater altitude. And so the prisoner toiled in the twilight, heaving the unresponsive remnants of mortality with little ceremony, as his miniature Tower of Babel rose, course by course. Several of the coffins began to split under the stress of handling, and he planned to save the stoutly built casket of little Matthew Fenner for the top, in order that his feet might have as certain a surface as possible. In the semi-gloom, he trusted mostly to touch to select the right one, and indeed came upon it almost by accident, since it tumbled into his hands as if through some odd volition, after he had unwittingly placed it beside another on the third layer. The tower at length finished, and his aching arms rested by a pause during which he sat on the bottom step of his grim device, Birch cautiously ascended with his tools, and stood abreast of the narrow transom. The borders of the space were entirely of brick, and there seemed little doubt but that he could shortly chisel away enough to allow his body to pass. As his hammer blows began to fall, the horse outside whinnied in a tone which may have been encouraging, and may have been mocking. In either case, it would have been appropriate for the unexpected tenacity of the easy-looking brickwork was surely a sardonic commentary on the vanity of mortal hopes, and the source of a task whose performance deserved every possible stimulus. Dusk fell, and found Birch still toiling. He worked largely by feeling now, since newly gathered clouds hid the moon, and though progress was still slow, he felt heartened at the extent of his encroachments on the top and bottom of the aperture. He could, he was sure, get out by midnight, though it is characteristic of him that this thought was untinged with eerie implications. Undisturbed by oppressive reflections on the time, the place, and the company beneath his feet, he philosophically chipped away the stony brickwork, cursing when a fragment hit him in the face and laughing when one struck the increasingly excited horse that poured near the cypress tree. In time, the hole grew so large that he ventured to try his body in it now and then, shifting about so that the coffins beneath him rocked and creaked. He would not, he found, have to pile another on its platform to make the proper height, for the hole was on exactly the right level to use as soon as its size might permit. It must have been midnight at least when Birch decided he could get through the transom. Tired and perspiring despite many rests, he descended to the floor and sat a while on the bottom box to gather strength for the final wriggle and leap to the ground outside. The hungry horse was neighing repeatedly, and almost uncannily, and he vaguely wished it would stop. He was curiously unelated over his impending escape, and almost dreaded the exertion, for his form had the indolent stoutness of early middle age. As he remounted the splitting coffins, he felt his weight very poignantly, especially when, upon reaching the topmost one, he heard that aggravated crackle which bespeaks the wholesale rending of wood. He had, it seems, planned in vain when choosing the stoutest coffin for the platform, for no sooner was his full bulk again upon it, 
and the rotting lid gave way, jouncing him two feet down on a surface which even he did not care to imagine. Maddened by the sound, or by the stench which billowed forth even to the open air, the waiting horse gave a scream that was too frantic for a neigh, and plunged madly off through the night, the wagon rattling crazily behind it. Birch, in his ghastly situation— was now too low for an easy scramble out of the enlarged transom, but gathered his energies for a determined try. Clutching the edges of the aperture, he sought to pull himself up, when he noticed a queer retardation in the form of an apparent drag on both his ankles. In another moment, he knew fear for the first time that night, for struggle as he would, he could not shake clear of the unknown grasp which held his feet in relentless captivity. Horrible pains, as of savage wounds, shot through his calves, and in his mind was a vortex of fright mixed with an unquenchable materialism that suggested splinters, loose nails, or some other attribute of a breaking wooden box. Perhaps he screamed. At any rate, he kicked and squirmed frantically and automatically, whilst his consciousness was almost eclipsed in a half-swoon. Instinct guided him in his wriggle through the transom, and in the crawl which followed his jarring thud on the damp ground. He could not walk, it appeared, and the emerging moon must have witnessed a horrible sight as he dragged his bleeding ankles toward the cemetery lodge his fingers clawing the black mould in brainless haste, and his body responding with that maddening slowness from which one suffers when chased by the phantoms of nightmare. There was evidently, however, no pursuer, for he was alone and alive when Armington, the lodgekeeper, answered his feeble clawing at the door. Armington helped Birch to the outside of a spare bed and sent his little son Edwin for Dr. Davis. The afflicted man was fully conscious, but would say nothing of any consequence, merely muttering such things as, Oh, my ankles! Let go! Or, Shut in the tomb! Then the doctor came with his medicine case and asked crisp questions, and removed the patient's outer clothing, shoes, and socks. The wounds— for both ankles were frightfully lacerated about the Achilles' tendons, seemed to puzzle the old physician greatly, and finally almost to frighten him. His questioning grew more than medically tense, and his hands shook as he dressed the mangled members, binding them as if he wished to get the wounds out of sight as quickly as possible. For an impersonal doctor, Davis's ominous and awestruck cross-examination became very strange indeed as he sought to drain from the weakened undertaker every least detail of his horrible experience. He was oddly anxious to know if Birch were sure, absolutely sure, of the identity of that top coffin of the pile, how he had chosen it, how he had been certain of it as the Fenner coffin in the dusk, and how he had distinguished it from the inferior duplicate coffin of vicious Asaph Sawyer, would the firm Fenner casket have caved in so readily? Davis, an old-time village practitioner, had of course seen both at the respective funerals, as indeed he had attended both Fenner and Sawyer in their last illnesses. He had even wondered at Sawyer's funeral how the vindictive farmer had managed to lie straight in a box so closely akin to that of the diminutive Fenner. After a full two hours, Dr. Davis left, urging Birch to insist at all times that his wounds were caused entirely by loose nails and splintering wood. What else, he added, could ever in any case be proved or believed? But it would be well to say as little as could be said, and to let no other doctor treat the wounds. Birch heeded this advice all the rest of his life, till he told me his story, and when I saw the scars— Ancient and whitened as they then were, I agreed that he was wise in so doing. He always remained lame, for the great tendons had been severed, but I think the greatest lameness was in his soul. 
his thinking processes, once so phlegmatic and logical, had become ineffaceably scarred, and it was pitiful to note his response to certain chance allusions such as Friday, tomb, coffin, and words of less obvious concatenation. His frightened horse had gone home, but his frightened wits never quite did that. He changed his business, but something always preyed upon him. It may have been just fear, and it may have been fear mixed with a queer belated sort of remorse for bygone crudities. His drinking, of course, only aggravated what it was meant to alleviate. When Dr. Davis left Birch that night, he had taken a lantern and gone to the old receiving tomb. The moon was shining on the scattered brick fragments and marred façade, and the latch of the great door yielded readily to a touch from the outside. Steeled by old ordeals in dissecting rooms, the doctor entered and looked about, stifling the nausea of mind and body that everything in sight and smell induced. He cried aloud once, and a little later gave a gasp that was more terrible than a cry. Then he fled back to the lodge, and broke all the rules of his calling by rousing and shaking his patient, and hurling at him a succession of shuddering whispers that seared into the bewildered ears like the hissing of vitriol. It was a Saf's coffin, Birch, just as I thought. I knew his teeth, with the front ones missing on the upper jaw. Never, for God's sake, show those wounds. The body was pretty badly gone, but if ever I saw vindictiveness on any face or former face, you know what a fiend he was for revenge. How he ruined old Raymond thirty years after their boundary suit, and how he stepped on the puppy that snapped at him a year ago last August. He was the devil incarnate, Birch, and I believe his eye for an eye fury could beat old father death himself. God, what a rage! I'd hate to have it aimed at me. Why did you do it, Birch? He was a scoundrel, and I don't blame you for giving him a cast-aside coffin, but you always did go too damned far. Well, enough to skimp on the thing some way, but you knew what a little man old Fenner was. I'll never get the picture out of my head as long as I live. You kicked hard, for a saf's coffin was on the floor. His head was broken in, and everything was tumbled about. I've seen sights before, but there was one thing too much here. An eye for an eye. Great heavens, Birch! But you got what you deserved. The skull turned my stomach, but the other was worse. Those ankles cut neatly off to fit Matt Fenner's cast-aside coffin. The Transition of Juan Romero Of the events which took place at the Norton Mine on October 18th and 19th, 1894, I have no desire to speak. A sense of duty to science is all that impels me to recall, in these last years of my life, scenes and happenings fraught with a terror doubly acute, because I cannot wholly define it. But I believe that— before I die, I should tell what I know of the, shall I say, transition of Juan Romero. My name and origin need not be related to posterity. In fact, I fancy it is better that they should not be. For when a man suddenly migrates to the States or the colonies, he leaves his past behind him. Besides, what I once was is not in the least relevant to my narrative, save perhaps the fact that during my service in India— I was more at home amongst white-bearded native teachers than amongst my brother officers. I had delved not a little into odd eastern lore when overtaken by the calamities which brought about my new life in America's vast west, a life wherein I found it well to accept a name, my present one, which is very common and carries no meaning. In the summer and autumn of 1894, 
I dwelt in the drear expanses of the Cactus Mountains, employed as a common labourer at the celebrated Norton Mine, whose discovery by an aged prospector some years before had turned the surrounding region from a nearly unpeopled waste to a seething cauldron of sordid life. A cavern of gold, lying deep below a mountain lake, had enriched its venerable finder beyond his wildest dreams, and now formed the seat of extensive tunnelling operations on the part of the corporation to which it had finally been sold. Additional grottoes had been found, and the yield of yellow metal was exceedingly great, so that a mighty and heterogeneous army of miners toiled day and night in the numerous passages and rock hollows. The superintendent, a Mr. Arthur, often discussed the singularity of the local geological formations, speculating on the probable extent of the chain of caves, and estimating the future of the titanic mining enterprise. He considered the auriferous cavities the result of the action of water, and believed the last of them would soon be opened. It was not long after my arrival and employment that Juan Romero came to the Norton Mine. One of a large herd of unkempt Mexicans attracted thither from the neighbouring country, he at first commanded attention only because of his features, which, though plainly of the red Indian type, were yet remarkable for their light colour and refined conformation, being vastly unlike those of the average greaser or Paiute of the locality. It is curious that, although he differed so widely from the mass of Hispanicized and tribal Indians, Romero gave not the least impression of Caucasian blood. It was not the Castilian conquistador or the American pioneer, but the ancient and noble Aztec whom imagination called to view, when the silent peon would rise in the early morning and gaze in fascination at the sun as it crept above the eastern hills, meanwhile stretching out his arms to the orb, as if in the performance of some rite whose nature he did not himself comprehend. But save for his face, Romero was not in any way suggestive of nobility. Ignorant and dirty, he was at home amongst the other brown-skinned Mexicans, having come, so I was afterward told, from the very lowest sort of surroundings. He had been found as a child in a crude mountain hut, the only survivor of an epidemic which had stalked lethally by. Near the hut, close to a rather unusual rock fissure, had lain two skeletons, newly picked by vultures, and presumably forming the sole remains of his parents. No one recalled their identity, and they were soon forgotten by the many. Indeed, the crumbling of the adobe hut and the closing of the rock fissure by a subsequent avalanche had helped to efface even the scene from recollection. Reared by a Mexican cattle thief who had given him his name, Juan differed little from his fellows. The attachment which Romero manifested toward me was undoubtedly commenced through the quaint and ancient Hindu ring which I wore when not engaged in active labour. Of its nature and manner of coming into my possession I cannot speak. It was my last link with a chapter of life forever closed, and I valued it highly. Soon I observed that the odd-looking Mexican was likewise interested— eyeing it with an expression that banished all suspicion of mere covetousness. Its hoary hieroglyphs seemed to stir some faint recollection in his untutored but active mind, though he could not possibly have beheld their like before. Within a few weeks after his advent, Romero was like a faithful servant to me, this notwithstanding the fact that I was myself but an ordinary miner. Our conversation was necessarily limited— he knew but a few words of English, while I found my Oxonian Spanish was something quite different from the patois of the peon of New Spain. The event which I am about to relate was unheralded by long premonitions. Though the man Romero had interested me, and though my ring had affected him peculiarly, I think that neither of us had any expectation of what was to follow when the great blast was set off. Geological considerations— had dictated an extension of the mine directly downward from the deepest part of the subterranean area, and the belief of the superintendent that only solid rock would be encountered had led to the placing of a prodigious charge of dynamite. With this work, Romero and I were not connected, 
Wherefore, our first knowledge of extraordinary conditions came from others. The charge, heavier perhaps than had been estimated, had seemed to shake the entire mountain. Windows in shanties on the slope outside were shattered by the shock, whilst miners throughout the nearer passages were knocked from their feet. Jewel Lake, which lay above the scene of action, heaved as in a tempest. Upon investigation— it was seen that a new abyss yawned indefinitely below the seat of the blast, an abyss so monstrous that no handy line might fathom it, nor any lamp illuminate it. Baffled, the excavator sought a conference with the superintendent, who ordered great lengths of rope to be taken to the pit, and spliced and lowered without cessation till a bottom might be discovered. Shortly afterward, the pale-faced workman apprised the superintendent of their failure. Firmly, though, respectfully, they signified their refusal to revisit the chasm, or indeed to work further in the mine until it might be sealed. Something beyond their experience was evidently confronting them, for so far as they could ascertain, the void below was infinite. The superintendent did not reproach them. Instead, he pondered deeply— and made many plans for the following day. The night shift did not go on that evening. At two in the morning, a lone coyote on the mountain began to howl dismally. From somewhere within the works a dog barked in answer, either to the coyote or to something else. A storm was gathering around the peaks of the range, and weirdly shaped clouds scudded horribly across the blurred patch of celestial light which marked a gibbous moon's attempts to shine through many layers of cirrostratus vapours. It was Romero's voice, coming from the bunk above, that awakened me, a voice excited and tense with some vague expectation I could not understand. "'Mother of God! The sound! That sound! Listen! Do you hear it? Senor, that sound!' I listened, wondering what sound he meant. The coyote, the dog, the storm, all were audible, the last named now gaining ascendancy, as the wind shrieked more and more frantically. Flashes of lightning were visible through the bunkhouse window. I questioned the nervous Mexican, repeating the sounds I had heard. The coyote? The dog? The wind? But Romero did not reply. Then he commenced whispering as in awe. The rhythm, senor! the rhythm of the earth, that throb down in the ground. And now I also heard, heard and shivered, and without knowing why. Deep, deep below me was a sound, a rhythm just as the peon had said, which, though exceedingly faint, yet dominated even the dog, the coyote, and the increasing tempest. To seek to describe it were useless— for it was such that no description is possible. Perhaps it was like the pulsing of the engines far down in a great liner, as sensed from the deck. Yet it was not so mechanical, not so devoid of the element of life and consciousness. Of all its qualities, remoteness in the earth most impressed me. To my mind rushed fragments of a passage in Joseph Glanville, which Poe has quoted with tremendous effect. The vastness— profundity, and unsearchableness of his works, which have a depth in them greater than the well of Democritus. Suddenly, Romero leaped from his bunk, pausing before me to gaze at the strange ring on my hand, which glistened queerly in every flash of lightning, and then staring intently in the direction of the mine shaft. I also rose, and both stood motionless for a time, straining our ears as the uncanny rhythm seemed more and more to take on a vital quality. Then, without apparent volition, we began to move toward the door, whose rattling in the gale held a comforting suggestion of earthly reality. The chanting in the depths, for such the sound now seemed to be, grew in volume and distinctness, and we felt irresistibly urged out into the storm, and thence to the gaping blackness of the shaft. We encountered no living creature, for the men of the night shift had been released from duty, and were doubtless at the dry gulch settlement pouring sinister rumours into the ear of some drowsy bartender. From the watchman's cabin, however, 
gleamed a small square of yellow light like a guardian eye. I dimly wondered how the rhythmic sound had affected the watchman, but Romero was moving more swiftly now, and I followed without pausing. As we descended the shaft, the sound beneath grew definitely composite. It struck me as horribly like a sort of oriental ceremony, with the beating of drums and chanting of many voices. I have, as you are aware, been much in India. Romero and I moved without material hesitancy through drifts and down ladders, ever toward the thing that allured us, yet ever with a pitifully helpless fear and reluctance. At one time I fancied I had gone mad— this was when, on wondering how our way was lighted in the absence of lamp or candle, I realized that the ancient ring on my finger was glowing with eerie radiance, diffusing a pallid luster through the damp, heavy air around. It was without warning that Romero, after clambering down one of the many rude ladders, broke into a run and left me alone. Some new and wild note in the drumming and chanting, perceptible but slightly to me, had acted on him in startling fashion, and with a wild outcry he forged ahead, unguided in the cavern's gloom. I heard his repeated shrieks before me, as he stumbled awkwardly along the level places and scrambled madly down the rickety ladders, and frightened as I was, I yet retained enough of perception to note that his speech, when articulate, was not of any sort known to me. Harsh but impressive polysyllables had replaced the customary mixture of bad Spanish and worse English, and of these only the oft-repeated cry, Huitzilopochtli, seemed in the least familiar. Later, I definitely placed that word in the works of a great historian, and shuddered when the association came to me. The climax of that awful night was composite but fairly brief— beginning just as I reached the final cavern of the journey. Out of the darkness immediately ahead burst a final shriek from the Mexican, which was joined by such a chorus of uncouth sound as I could never hear again and survive. In that moment, it seemed as if all the hidden terrors and monstrosities of earth had become articulate in an effort to overwhelm the human race. Simultaneously, the light from my ring was extinguished, and I saw a new light glimmering from lower space but a few yards ahead of me. I had arrived at the abyss, which was now redly aglow, and which had evidently swallowed up the unfortunate Romero. Advancing, I peered over the edge of that chasm which no line could fathom, and which was now a pandemonium of flickering flame and hideous uproar. At first, I beheld nothing but a seething blur of luminosity, but then shapes, all infinitely distant, began to detach themselves from the confusion, and I saw—was it Juan Romero? But God, I dare not tell you what I saw. Some power from heaven, coming to my aid, obliterated both sights and sounds in such a crash as may be heard when two universes collide in space. Chaos supervened, and I knew the peace of oblivion. I hardly know how to continue, since conditions so singular are involved, but I will do my best, not even trying to differentiate betwixt the real and the apparent. When I awaked, I was safe in my bunk, and the red glow of dawn was visible at the window. Some distance away, the lifeless body of Juan Romero lay upon a table, surrounded by a group of men, including the camp doctor. The men were discussing the strange death of the Mexican, as he lay asleep, a death seemingly connected in some way with the terrible bolt of lightning which had struck and shaken the mountain. No direct cause was evident, and an autopsy failed to show any reason why Romero should not be living. Snatches of conversation indicated beyond a doubt that neither Romero nor I had left the bunkhouse during the night, that neither had been awake during the frightful storm which had passed over the cactus range. That storm, said men who had ventured down the mine shaft, had caused extensive caving in, and had completely closed the deep abyss which had created so much apprehension the day before. 
When I asked the watchman what sounds he had heard prior to the mighty thunderbolt, he mentioned a coyote, a dog, and the snarling mountain wind. Nothing more. Nor do I doubt his word. Upon the resumption of work, Superintendent Arthur called on some especially dependable men to make a few investigations around the spot where the gulf had appeared. Though hardly eager, they obeyed, and a deep boring was made. Results were very curious. The roof of the void, as seen whilst it was open, was not by any means thick. Yet now the drills of the investigators met what appeared to be a limitless extent of solid rock. Finding nothing else, not even gold, the superintendent abandoned his attempts, but a perplexed look occasionally steals over his countenance as he sits thinking at his desk. One other thing is curious. Shortly after waking on that morning after the storm, I noticed the unaccountable absence of my Hindu ring from my finger. I had prized it greatly, yet nevertheless felt a sensation of relief at its disappearance. If one of my fellow miners appropriated it, he must have been quite clever in disposing of his booty, for despite advertisements and a police search, the ring was never seen again. Somehow I doubt if it were stolen by mortal hands, for many strange things were taught me in India. My opinion of my whole experience varies from time to time. In broad daylight, and at most seasons, I am apt to think the greater part of it a mere dream. But sometimes in the autumn, about two in the morning, when winds and animals howl dismally, there comes from inconceivable depths below a damnable suggestion of rhythmical throbbing. And I feel that the transition of Juan Romero was a terrible one indeed. The Beast in the Cave the horrible conclusion which had been gradually obtruding itself upon my confused and reluctant mind was now an awful certainty. I was lost, completely, hopelessly lost, in the vast and labyrinthine recesses of the mammoth cave. Turn as I might, in no direction could my straining vision seize on any object capable of serving as a guidepost to set me on the outward path that never more should I behold the blessed light of day, or scan the pleasant hills and dales of the beautiful world outside, my reason could no longer entertain the slightest unbelief. Hope had departed. Yet, indoctrinated as I was by a life of philosophical study, I derived no small measure of satisfaction from my unimpassioned demeanour, for although I had frequently read of the wild frenzies into which were thrown the victims of similar situations, I experienced none of these, but stood quiet as soon as I clearly realised the loss of my bearings. Nor did the thought that I had probably wandered beyond the utmost limits of an ordinary search cause me to abandon my composure even for a moment. If I must die, I reflected, then was this terrible yet majestic cavern as welcome a sepulchre as that which any churchyard might afford, a conception which carried with it more of tranquillity than of despair. Starving would prove my ultimate fate. Of this I was certain. Some, I knew, had gone mad under circumstances such as these, but I felt that this end would not be mine. My disaster was the result of no fault save my own, since, unbeknown to the guide, I had separated myself from the regular party of sightseers, and, wandering for over an hour in forbidden avenues of the cave, had found myself unable to retrace the devious windings which I had pursued since forsaking my companions. Already my torch had begun to expire— Soon I would be enveloped by the total and almost palpable blackness of the bowels of the earth. As I stood in the waning, unsteady light, I idly wondered over the exact circumstances of my coming end. I remembered the accounts which I had heard of the colony of consumptives, who, taking their residence in this gigantic grotto to find health from the apparently salubrious air of the underground world, with its steady, uniform temperature, pure air, and peaceful quiet, had found, instead, death in strange and ghastly form. 
I had seen the sad remains of their ill-made cottages as I passed them by with the party, and had wondered what unnatural influence a long sojourn in this immense and silent cavern would exert upon one as healthy and as vigorous as I. Now, I grimly told myself, my opportunity for settling this point had arrived, provided that want of food should not bring me too speedy a departure from this life. As the last fitful rays of my torch faded into obscurity, I resolved to leave no stone unturned, no possible means of escape neglected. So, summoning all the powers possessed by my lungs, I set up a series of loud shoutings, in the vain hope of attracting the attention of the guide by my clamour. Yet, as I called, I believed in my heart that my cries were to no purpose, and that my voice, magnified and reflected by the numberless ramparts of the black maze about me, fell upon no ears save my own. All at once, however, my attention was fixed with a start, as I fancied that I heard the sound of soft approaching steps on the rocky floor of the cavern. Was my deliverance about to be accomplished so soon? Had then all my horrible apprehensions been for naught, and was the guide, having marked my unwarranted absence from the party, following my course and seeking me out in this limestone labyrinth? Whilst these joyful queries arose in my brain, I was on the point of renewing my cries, in order that my discovery might come the sooner, when in an instant my delight was turned to horror as I listened, for my ever acute ear, now sharpened in even greater degree by the complete silence of the cave, bore to my benumbed understanding the unexpected and dreadful knowledge that these footfalls were not like those of any mortal man. In the unearthly stillness of this subterranean region, the tread of the booted guide would have sounded like a series of sharp and incisive blows. These impacts were soft and stealthy, as of the padded paws of some feline. Besides, at times, when I listened carefully, I seemed to trace the falls of four instead of two feet. I was now convinced that I had by my cries aroused and attracted some wild beast— perhaps a mountain lion, which had accidentally strayed within the cave. Perhaps, I considered, the Almighty had chosen for me a swifter and more merciful death than that of hunger. Yet the instinct of self-preservation, never wholly dormant, was stirred in my breast, and though escape from the oncoming peril might but spare me for a sterner and more lingering end, I determined nevertheless to part with my life at as high a price as I could command. Strange as it may seem, my mind conceived of no intent on the part of the visitor save that of hostility. Accordingly, I became very quiet, in the hope that the unknown beast would, in the absence of a guiding sound, lose its direction, as had I, and thus pass me by. But this hope was not destined for realization, for the strange footfall steadily advanced, the animal evidently having obtained my scent, which— in an atmosphere so absolutely free from all distracting influences as is that of the cave, could doubtless be followed at great distance. Seeing, therefore, that I must be armed for defence against an uncanny and unseen attack in the dark, I grouped about me the largest of the fragments of rock which were strewn upon all parts of the floor of the cavern in the vicinity, and, grasping one in each hand for immediate use, awaited with resignation the inevitable result. Meanwhile, the hideous pattering of the paws drew near. Certainly, the conduct of the creature was exceedingly strange. Most of the time, the tread seemed to be that of a quadruped, walking with a singular lack of unison betwixt hind and forefeet. Yet, at brief and infrequent intervals, I fancied that but two feet were engaged in the process of locomotion. I wondered what species of animal was to confront me. It must, I thought, be some— unfortunate beast who had paid for its curiosity to investigate one of the entrances of the fearful grotto with a lifelong confinement in its interminable recesses. It doubtless obtained as food the eyeless fish, bats, and rats of the cave, as well as some of the ordinary fish that are wafted in at every freshet of Green River, which communicates in some occult manner with the waters of the cave. I occupied my terrible vigil with grotesque conjectures of what— alterations cave life might have wrought in the physical structure of the beast, remembering the awful appearances ascribed by local tradition to the consumptives who had died after longer residence in the cavern. Then I remembered with a start that 
Even should I succeed in killing my antagonist, I should never behold its form, as my torch had long since been extinct, and I was entirely unprovided with matches. The tension on my brain now became frightful. My disordered fancy conjured up hideous and fearsome shapes from the sinister darkness that surrounded me, and that actually seemed to press upon my body. Nearer, nearer the dreadful footfalls approached. It seemed that I must give vent to a piercing scream, yet had I been sufficiently irresolute to attempt such a thing, my voice could scarce have responded. I was petrified, rooted to the spot. I doubted if my right arm would allow me to hurl its missile at the oncoming thing when the crucial moment should arrive. Now the steady pat-pat of the steps was close at hand, now very close. I could hear the laboured breathing of the animal, and terror-struck as I was, I realised that it must have come from a considerable distance, and was correspondingly fatigued. Suddenly the spell broke. My right hand, guided by my ever-trustworthy sense of hearing, threw with full force the sharp-angled bit of limestone which it contained, toward that point in the darkness from which emanated the breathing and pattering. And, wonderful to relate, it nearly reached its goal, for I heard the thing jump, landing at a distance away, where it seemed to pause. Having readjusted my aim, I discharged my second missile, this time most effectively, for with a flood of joy I listened as the creature fell in what sounded like a complete collapse and evidently remained prone and unmoving. Almost overpowered by the great relief which rushed over me, I reeled back against the wall. The breathing continued in heavy, gasping inhalations and expirations, whence I realised that I had no more than wounded the creature, and now all desire to examine the thing ceased. At last something allied to groundless, superstitious fear had entered my brain and I did not approach the body, nor did I continue to cast stones at it in order to complete the extinction of its life. Instead, I ran at full speed in what was, as nearly as I could estimate in my frenzied condition, the direction from which I had come. Suddenly I heard a sound, or rather, a regular succession of sounds. In another instant they had resolved themselves into a series of sharp, metallic clicks. This time there was no doubt. It was the guide and then I shouted, yelled, screamed, even shrieked with joy as I beheld in the vaulted arches above the faint and glimmering effulgence which I knew to be the reflected light of an approaching torch. I ran to meet the flare, and before I could completely understand what had occurred, was lying upon the ground at the feet of the guide, embracing his boots and gibbering, despite my boasted reserve, in a most meaningless and idiotic manner, pouring out my terrible story— and at the same time overwhelming my auditor with protestations of gratitude. At length I awoke to something like my normal consciousness. The guide had noted my absence upon the arrival of the party at the entrance of the cave, and had, from his own intuitive sense of direction, proceeded to make a thorough canvas of the by-passages just ahead of where he had last spoken to me, locating my whereabouts after a quest of about four hours. By the time he had related this to me— I, emboldened by his torch and his company, began to reflect upon the strange beast which I had wounded but a short distance back in the darkness, and suggested that we ascertain, by the rushlight's aid, what manner of creature was my victim. Accordingly I retraced my steps, this time with a courage born of companionship, to the scene of my terrible experience. Soon we descried a white object upon the floor, an object whiter even than the gleaming limestone itself. Cautiously advancing, we gave vent to a simultaneous ejaculation of wonderment, for of all the unnatural monsters either of us had in our lifetimes beheld, this was in surpassing degree the strangest. It appeared to be an anthropoid ape of large proportions, escaped perhaps from some itinerant menagerie. Its hair was snow-white, a thing due no doubt to the bleaching action of a long existence within the inky confines of the cave— but it was also surprisingly thin, being indeed largely absent save on the head, where it was of such length and abundance that it fell over the shoulders in considerable profusion. The face was turned away from us, as the creature lay almost directly upon it. The inclination of the limbs was very singular, explaining, however, the alternation in their use which I had before noted. 
whereby the beast you sometimes all four, and on other occasions but two for its progress. From the tips of the fingers or toes, long nail-like claws extended. The hands or feet were not prehensile, a fact that I ascribed to that long residence in the cave, which, as I before mentioned, seemed evident from the all-pervading and almost unearthly whiteness so characteristic of the whole anatomy. No tail seemed to be present. The respiration had now grown very feeble, and the guide had drawn his pistol with the evident intent of dispatching the creature, when a sudden sound emitted by the latter caused the weapon to fall unused. The sound was of a nature difficult to describe. It was not like the normal note of any known species of simian, and I wondered if this unnatural quality were not the result of a long-continued and complete silence, broken by the sensations produced by the advent of the light, a thing which the beast could not have seen since its first entrance into the cave. The sound, which I might feebly attempt to classify as a kind of deep-toned chattering, was faintly continued. All at once a fleeting spasm of energy seemed to pass through the frame of the beast. The paws went through a convulsive motion, and the limbs contracted. With a jerk, the white body rolled over so that its face was turned in our direction. For a moment I was so struck with horror at the eyes thus revealed that I noted nothing else. They were black, those eyes, deep, jetty black, in hideous contrast to the snow-white hair and flesh, like those of other cave denizens, they were deeply sunken in their orbits, and were entirely destitute of iris. As I looked more closely, I saw that they were set in a face less prognathous than that of the average ape, and infinitely more hairy. The nose was quite distinct. As we gazed upon the uncanny sight presented to our vision, the thick lips opened, and several sounds issued from them, after which the thing relaxed in death. The guide clutched my coat sleeve and trembled so violently that the light shook fitfully, casting weird moving shadows on the walls about us. I made no motion, but stood rigidly still, my horrified eyes fixed upon the floor ahead. Then fear left, and wonder, awe, compassion, and reverence succeeded in its place, for the sounds uttered by the stricken figure that lay stretched out on the limestone had told us the awesome truth. The creature I had killed, the strange beast of the unfathomed cave, was, or had at one time been, a man. Dagon. Ah, Dr. Raymond. This way, please. <laughs> He's an odd one, sir. Speaks of volcanic rocks and slippery bodies. Here we are, sir. Are you going to behave yourself, mister? I'll be on me best behaviour, sir. Not you, you wretched piece of slime. Your friend there. You have my word, Turner. If he so much as looks at you the wrong way, sir, just holler. I'll be right outside. Well then, come to hear my story, have you? to determine whether or not I am fit to stand trial? And for what crime am I guilty, exactly? Is it a crime to be afraid? To lash out in fear? To speak the truth? To warn of horrors hitherto unknown to man? Oh, well, don't just stand there. Take a seat. Your opinion is of no interest to me, since by tonight I shall be no more. Locked away, my supply of the drug which alone made life endurable, confiscated by the ruffians who keep me here against my will, I can bear the torture no longer. I shall hang myself with the bedclothes. Do not think my slavery to morphine has made me a weakling or a degenerate. 
When you have heard my story, you may guess, though never fully realize, why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. And what a story it is, sir. Keep it down, Phipps. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German sea raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Han had not completely sunk to their later degradation, so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors, that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat, with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath a scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship, or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastnesses of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awaked, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished for there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish, and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing, and nothing in sight, save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me, that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might nor were there any sea-fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side, and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for travelling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odour of the fish was maddening, 
but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still travelled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. By the fourth evening I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. Tell him about the dreams. Keep it down, man. You're going to wake the dead. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of paradise lost, and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. Tell him about the object. Enough! Everything all right, sir? I'll be right outside. Oh, well, all at once my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith, whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, 
on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size were an array of bas-reliefs, whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Dore. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail, for the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or Bulwer, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seemed to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale— represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing, whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then suddenly, I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemous lichen, loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Saints preserve us! The horror! Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. When I came out of the shadows, I found myself here, brought thither by the captain of the American ship, which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, they tell me I attacked the first mate, accused him of horrors unknown to men. I've left him scarred, they say. But it wasn't my fault. I wasn't in my right mind. He talks in his sleep, sir. Speaks of Dagon. The fish god! Yes, it is at night that I see the thing, and as I pass into twilight, I can sense it drawing near. (laughs) So now I am to end it all, having told you the truth, as I know it. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm, a a mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. 
I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. <laughs> what is that? What? What's happening? No! Don't let it get me! No! 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 no. It can't no. be! No. It, it shall! It shall not find me! It, it, never! It shall never find me! <laughs> the shunned house. One. From even the greatest of horrors, irony is seldom absent. Sometimes it enters directly into the composition of the events, while sometimes it relates only to their fortuitous position among persons and places. The latter sort is splendidly exemplified by a case in the ancient city of Providence, where in the late forties Edgar Allan Poe used to sojourn often during his unsuccessful wooing of the gifted poetess Mrs. Whitman. Poe generally stopped at the mansion house in Benefit Street, the renamed Golden Ball Inn, whose roof has sheltered Washington, Jefferson, and Lafayette, and his favourite walk led northward along the same street to Mrs. Whitman's home, and the neighbouring hillside churchyard of St. John's, whose hidden expanse of eighteenth-century gravestones had for him a peculiar fascination. Now, the irony is this. In this walk, so many times repeated, the world's greatest master of the terrible and the bizarre was obliged to pass a particular house on the eastern side of the street, a dingy, antiquated structure perched on the abruptly rising side hill, with a great unkempt yard dating from a time when the region was partly open country. It does not appear that he ever wrote or spoke of it, nor is there any evidence that he even noticed it. And yet that house, to the two persons in possession of certain information, equals or outranks in horror the wildest fantasy of the genius who so often passed it unknowingly, and stands starkly leering as a symbol of all that is unutterably hideous. The house was, and for that matter still is, of a kind to attract the attention of the curious. Originally a farm or semi-farm building, it followed the average New England colonial lines of the middle eighteenth century, the prosperous peaked roof sort, with two stories and dormerless attic, and with the Georgian doorway and interior panelling dictated by the progress of taste at that time. It faced south, with one gable end buried to the lower windows and the eastward rising hill, and the other exposed to the foundations toward the street. Its construction, over a century and a half ago, had followed the grading and straightening of the road in that especial vicinity. For Benefit Street, at first called Back Street, was laid out as a lane winding amongst the graveyards of the first settlers, and straightened only when the removal of the bodies to the north burial ground made it decently possible to cut through the old family plots. At the start, the western wall had lain some twenty feet up a precipitous lawn from the roadway, but a widening of the street at about the time of the Revolution sheared off most of the intervening space, exposing the foundations so that a brick basement wall had to be made, giving the deep cellar a street frontage, with door and two windows above ground, close to the new line of public travel. When the sidewalk was laid out a century ago, the last of the intervening space was removed, and Poe, in his walks, must have seen only a sheer ascent of dull grey brick flush with the sidewalk, and surmounted at a height of ten feet by the antique shingled bulk of the house proper. The farm-like grounds extended back very deeply up the hill, almost to Wheaton Street. The space south of the house, abutting on Benefit Street, was of course greatly above the existing sidewalk level, forming a terrace bounded by a high bank wall of damp, mossy stone, pierced by a steep flight of narrow steps, 
which led inward between canyon-like surfaces to the upper region of mangy lawn, roomy brick walls, and neglected gardens whose dismantled cement urns, rusted kettles fallen from tripods of knotty sticks, and similar paraphernalia, set off the weather-beaten front door with its broken fanlight, rotting ionic pilasters, and wormy triangular pediment. What I heard in my youth about the shunned house was merely that people died there, in alarmingly great numbers. That, I was told, was why the original owners had moved out some twenty years after building the place. It was plainly unhealthy, perhaps because of the dampness and fungus growth in the cellar, the general sickish smell, the draughts of the hallways, or the quality of the well and pump water. These things were bad enough, and these were all that gained belief among the persons whom I knew. Only the notebooks of my antiquarian uncle, Dr. Elihu Whipple, revealed to me at length the darker, vaguer surmises which formed an undercurrent of folklore among old-time servants and humble folk, surmises which never travelled far, and which were largely forgotten when Providence grew to be a metropolis with a shifting modern population. The general fact is, that the house was never regarded by the solid part of the community as in any real sense haunted. There were no widespread tales of rattling chains, cold currents of air, extinguished lights, or faces at the window. Extremists sometimes said the house was unlucky, but that is as far as even they went. What was really beyond dispute is that a frightful proportion of persons died there, or more accurately, had died there, since after some peculiar happenings over sixty years ago, the building had become deserted through the sheer impossibility of renting it. These persons were not all cut off suddenly by any one cause, rather did it seem that their vitality was insidiously sapped, so that each one died the sooner from whatever tendency to weakness he may have naturally had. And those who did not die, displayed in varying degree a type of anemia or consumption, and sometimes a decline of the mental faculties, which spoke ill for the salubriousness of the building. Neighbouring houses, it must be added, seemed entirely free from the noxious quality. This much I knew before my insistent questioning led my uncle to show me the notes which finally embarked us both on our hideous investigation. In my childhood, the shunned house was vacant, with barren, gnarled, and terrible old trees, long, queerly pale grass, and nightmarishly misshapen weeds in the high terraced yard, where birds never lingered. We boys used to overrun the place, and I can still recall my youthful terror, not only at the morbid strangeness of this sinister vegetation, but at the eldritch atmosphere and odour of the dilapidated house, whose Unlocked front door was often entered in quest of shudders. The small paned windows were largely broken, and a nameless air of desolation hung round the precarious panelling, shaky interior shutters, peeling wallpaper, falling plaster, rickety staircases, and such fragments of battered furniture as still remained. The dust and cobwebs added their touch of the fearful and brave indeed was the boy who would voluntarily ascend the ladder to the attic, a vast raftered length lighted only by small blinking windows in the gable ends, and filled with a massed wreckage of chests, chairs, and spinning wheels which infinite years of deposit had shrouded and festooned into monstrous and hellish shapes. But after all, the attic was not the most terrible part of the house. It was the dank, humid cellar which somehow exerted the strongest repulsion on us, even though it was wholly above ground on the street side, with only a thin door and window pierced brick wall to separate it from the busy sidewalk. We scarcely knew whether to haunt it in spectral fascination, or to shun it for the sake of our souls and our sanity. For one thing, the bad odour of the house was strongest there, and for another thing, we did not like the white fungus growths which occasionally sprang up in rainy summer weather from the hard earth floor. Those fungi, 
grotesquely like the vegetation in the yard outside, were truly horrible in their outlines, detestable parodies of toadstools and Indian pipes, whose like we had never seen in any other situation. They rotted quickly, and at one stage became slightly phosphorescent, so that nocturnal passers-by sometimes spoke of witch-fires glowing behind the broken panes of the fetter-spreading windows. We never, even in our wildest Halloween moods, visited this cellar by night, but in some of our daytime visits could detect the phosphorescence, especially when the day was dark and wet. There was also a subtler thing we often thought we detected, a very strange thing which was, however, merely suggestive at most. I refer to a sort of cloudy, whitish pattern on the dirt floor, a vague, shifting deposit of mould or nitre, which we sometimes thought we could trace amidst the sparse fungus growths near the huge fireplace of the basement kitchen. Once in a while, it struck us that this patch bore an uncanny resemblance to a doubled-up human figure, though generally no such kinship existed, and often there was no whitish deposit whatever. On a certain rainy afternoon, when this illusion seemed phenomenally strong, and when, in addition, I had fancied I glimpsed a kind of thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation rising from the nitrous pattern toward the yawning fireplace, I spoke to my uncle about the matter. He smiled at this odd conceit, but it seemed that his smile was tinged with reminiscence. Later, I heard that a similar notion entered into some of the wild ancient tales of the common folk, a notion likewise alluding to ghoulish, wolfish shapes taken by smoke from the great chimney, and queer contours assumed by certain of the sinuous tree-roots that thrust their way into the cellar through the loose foundation stones. 2. Not till my adult years did my uncle set before me the notes and data which he had collected concerning the shunned house. Dr. Whipple was a sane, conservative physician of the old school, and for all his interest in the place, was not eager to encourage young thoughts toward the abnormal. His own view, postulating simply a building and location of markedly unsanitary qualities, had nothing to do with abnormality but he realised that the very picturesqueness which aroused his own interest would in a boy's fanciful mind take on all manner of gruesome imaginative associations. The doctor was a bachelor, a white-haired, clean-shaven, old-fashioned gentleman, and a local historian of note, who had often broken a lance with such controversial guardians of tradition as Sidney S. Ryder and Thomas W. Bicknell. He lived with one manservant in a Georgian homestead with knocker and iron-railed steps, balanced eerily on a steep ascent of North Court Street, beside the ancient brick court and colony house, where his grandfather, a cousin of that celebrated privateersman Captain Whipple, who burnt His Majesty's armed schooner Gaspé in 1772, had voted in the legislature on May 4, 1776, for the independence of the Rhode Island colony. Around him in the damp, low-sealed library with the musty white panelling, heavy carved over mantel, and small-paned, vine-shaded windows, were the relics and records of his ancient family, among which were many dubious allusions to the shunned house in Benefit Street. That pest spot lies not far distant, for Benefit runs ledgewise just above the courthouse along the precipitous hill up which the first settlement climbed. When, in the end, my insistent pestering and maturing years evoked from my uncle the hoarded lore I sought, there lay before me a strange enough chronicle. Long-winded, statistical, and drearily genealogical as some of the matter was, there ran through it a continuous thread of brooding, tenacious horror, and preternatural malevolence which impressed me even more than it had impressed the good doctor. Separate events fitted together uncannily, and seemingly irrelevant details held minds of hideous possibilities. A new and burning curiosity grew in me, compared to which my boyish curiosity was feeble and inchoate. 
The first revelation led to an exhaustive research, and finally to that shuddering quest which proved so disastrous to myself and mine. For at last my uncle insisted on joining the search I had commenced, and after a certain night in that house he did not come away with me. I am lonely without that gentle soul whose long years were filled only with honour, virtue, good taste, benevolence, and learning. I have reared a marble urn to his memory in St. John's churchyard, the place that Poe loved, the hidden grove of giant willows on the hill, where tombs and headstones huddle quietly between the hoary bulk of the church and the houses and bank walls of Benefit Street. The history of the house, opening amidst a maze of dates, revealed no trace of the sinister, either about its construction or about the prosperous and honourable family who built it. Yet from the first a taint of calamity, soon increased to boding significance, was apparent. My uncle's carefully compiled record began with the building of the structure in 1763, and followed the theme with an unusual amount of detail. The shunned house, it seems, was first inhabited by William Harris and his wife Roby Dexter, with their children Elkana, born in 1755, Abigail, born in 1757, William Jr., born in 1759, and Ruth, born in 1761. Harris was a substantial merchant and seaman in the West India trade, connected with the firm of Obadiah Brown and his nephews. After Brown's death in 1761, the new firm of Nicholas Brown and Company made him master of the brig Prudence, Providence-built, of 120 tons, thus enabling him to erect the new homestead he had desired ever since his marriage. The site he had chosen, a recently straightened part of the new and fashionable back street which ran along the side of the hill above crowded Cheapside, was all that could be wished, and the building did justice to the location. It was the best that moderate means could afford, and Harris hastened to move in before the birth of a fifth child, which the family expected. That child, a boy, came in December, but was still born nor was any child to be born alive in that house for a century and a half. The next April sickness occurred among the children, and Abigail and Ruth died before the month was over. Dr. Job Ives diagnosed the trouble as some infantile fever, though others declared it was more of a mere wasting away or decline. It seemed, in any event, to be contagious, for Hannah Bowen, one of the two servants, died of it in the following June. Eli Lydiason, the other servant, constantly complained of weakness, and would have returned to his father's farm in Rehoboth, but for a sudden attachment for Mahitable Pierce, who was hired to succeed Hannah. He died the next year, a sad year indeed, since it marked the death of William Harris himself, enfeebled as he was by the climate of Martinique, where his occupation had kept him for considerable periods during the preceding decade. The widowed Roby Harris never recovered from the shock of her husband's death, and the passing of her first-born Elkana two years later was the final blow to her reason. In 1768 she fell victim to a mild form of insanity, and was thereafter confined to the upper part of the house, her elder maiden sister, Mercy Dexter, having moved in to take charge of the family. Mercy was a plain, raw-boned woman of great strength, but her health visibly declined from the time of her advent. She was greatly devoted to her unfortunate sister, and had an especial affection for her only surviving nephew, William, who from a sturdy infant had become a sickly, spindling lad. In this year, the servant Mehitable died, and the other servant, Preserved Smith, left without coherent explanation or at least with only some wild tales, and a complaint that he disliked the smell of the place. For a time, Mercy could secure no more help, since the seven deaths and case of madness, all occurring within five years' space, had begun to set in motion the body of fireside rumour, which later became so bizarre. Ultimately, however, she obtained new servants from out of town, Anne White, 
a morose woman from that part of North Kingstown, now set off as the township of Exeter, and a capable Boston man named Zenas Lowe. It was Anne White who first gave definite shape to the sinister, idle talk. Mercy should have known better than to hire anyone from the Nooseneck Hill Country, for that remote bit of backwoods was then, as now, a seat of the most uncomfortable superstitions. As lately as 1892, an Exeter community exhumed a dead body, and ceremoniously burnt its heart, in order to prevent certain alleged visitations injurious to the public health and peace, and one may imagine the point of view of the same section in 1768. Anne's tongue was perniciously active, and within a few months Mercy discharged her, filling her place with a faithful and amiable Amazon from Newport, Maria Robbins. Meanwhile, poor Roby Harris, in her madness, gave voice to dreams and imaginings of the most hideous sort. At times, her screams became insupportable, and for long periods she would utter shrieking horrors, which necessitated her son's temporary residence with his cousin, Peleg Harris, in Presbyterian Lane, near the new college building. The boy would seem to improve after these visits, and had Mercy been as wise as she was well-meaning, she would have let him live permanently with Peleg. Just what Mrs. Harris cried out in her fits of violence, tradition hesitates to say, or rather, presents such extravagant accounts that they nullify themselves through sheer absurdity. Certainly, it sounds absurd to hear that a woman educated only in the rudiments of French often shouted for hours in a coarse and idiomatic form of that language, or that the same person, alone and guarded, complained wildly of a staring thing which bit and chewed at her. In 1772, the servant Zenas died, and when Mrs. Harris heard of it, she laughed with a shocking delight utterly foreign to her. The next year, she herself died, and was laid to rest in the North Burial Ground, beside her husband. Upon the outbreak of trouble with Great Britain in 1775, William Harris, despite his scant sixteen years and feeble constitution, managed to enlist in the Army of Observation under General Green, and from that time on, enjoyed a steady rise in health and prestige. In 1780, as a captain in Rhode Island forces in New Jersey under Colonel Angel, he met and married Phoebe Hetfield of Elizabethtown, whom he brought to Providence upon his honourable discharge in the following year. The young soldier's return was not a thing of unmitigated happiness. The house, it is true, was still in good condition, and the street had been widened and changed in name from Back Street to Benefit Street. But Mercy Dexter's once robust frame had undergone a sad and curious decay, so that she was now a stooped and pathetic figure, with hollow voice and disconcerting pallor, qualities shared to a singular degree by the one remaining servant, Maria. In the autumn of 1782, Phoebe Harris gave birth to a stillborn daughter, and on the 15th of the next May, Mercy Dexter took leave of a useful, austere, and virtuous life. William Harris, at last thoroughly convinced of the radically unhealthful nature of his abode, now took steps toward quitting it and closing it forever. Securing temporary quarters for himself and his wife at the newly opened Golden Ball Inn, he arranged for the building of a new and finer house in Westminster Street, in the growing part of the town across the Great Bridge. There, in 1785, his son Duty was born, and there the family dwelt till the encroachments of commerce drove them back across the river and over the hill to Angel Street, in the newer East Side Residence District, where the late Archer Harris built his sumptuous but hideous French-roofed mansion in 1876. William and Phoebe both succumbed to the yellow fever epidemic of 1797, but Duty was brought up by his cousin, Rathbone Harris, Peleg's son. Rathbone was a practical man, and rented the Benefit Street house, despite William's wish to keep it vacant. He considered it an obligation to his ward to make the most of all the boy's property, 
nor did he concern himself with the deaths and illnesses which caused so many changes of tenants, or the steadily growing aversion with which the house was generally regarded. It is likely that he felt only vexation when, in 1804, the town council ordered him to fumigate the place with sulphur, tar, and gum camphor on account of the much-discussed deaths of four persons, presumably caused by the then diminishing fever epidemic. They said the place had a febrile smell. Duty himself thought little of the house, for he grew up to be a privateersman, and served with distinction on the vigilant under Captain Carhoon in the War of 1812. He returned unharmed, married in 1814, and became a father on that memorable night of September 23, 1815, when a great gale drove the waters of the bay over half the town, and floated a tall sloop well up Westminster Street, so that its masts almost tapped the Harris windows in symbolic affirmation that the new boy, Welcome, was a seaman's son. Welcome did not survive his father, but lived to perish gloriously at Fredericksburg in 1862. Neither he nor his son Archer knew of the shunned house as other than a nuisance almost impossible to rent, perhaps on account of the mustiness and sickly odour of unkempt old age. Indeed, it never was rented after a series of deaths culminating in 1861, which the excitement of the war tended to throw into obscurity. Carrington Harris, last of the male line, knew it only as a deserted and somewhat picturesque centre of legend, until I told him my experience. He had meant to tear it down and build an apartment house on the site, but after my account decided to let it stand, install plumbing, and rent it. Nor has he yet had any difficulty in obtaining tenants. The horror has gone. 3. It may well be imagined how powerfully I was affected by the annals of the Harrises. In this continuous record there seemed to me to brood a persistent evil beyond anything in nature as I had known it, an evil clearly connected with the house and not with the family. This impression was confirmed by my uncle's less systematic array of miscellaneous data legends transcribed from servant gossip, cuttings from the papers, copies of death certificates by fellow physicians, and the like. All of this material I cannot hope to give, for my uncle was a tireless antiquarian and very deeply interested in the shunned house, but I may refer to several dominant points which are noticed by their recurrence through many reports from diverse sources. For example, the servant gossip was practically unanimous in attributing to the fungus and malodorous cellar of the house a vast supremacy and evil influence. There had been servants, and White especially, who would not use the cellar kitchen, and at least three well-defined legends bore upon the queer quasi-human or diabolic outlines assumed by tree roots and patches of mould in that region. These latter narratives interested me profoundly, on account of what I had seen in my boyhood, but I felt that most of the significance had in each case been largely obscured by additions from the common stock of local ghost lore. Anne White, with her Exeter superstition, had promulgated the most extravagant and at the same time most consistent tale, alleging that there must lie buried beneath the house one of those vampires the dead who retain their bodily form and live on the blood or breath of the living, whose hideous legions send their praying shapes or spirits abroad by night. To destroy a vampire one must, the grandmothers say, exhume it and burn its heart, or at least drive a stake through that organ, and Anne's dogged insistence on a search under the cellar had been prominent in bringing about her discharge. Her tales, however, commanded a wide audience and were the more readily accepted because the house indeed stood on land once used for burial purposes. To me their interest depended less on this circumstance than on the peculiarly appropriate way in which they dovetailed with certain other things. The complaint of the departing servant preserved Smith, who had preceded Anne and never heard of her, 
that something sucked his breath at night. The death certificates of fever victims of 1804, issued by Dr. Chad Hopkins, and showing the four deceased persons all unaccountably lacking in blood, and the obscure passages of poor Roby Harris's ravings, where she complained of the sharp teeth of a glassy-eyed, half-visible presence. Free from unwarranted superstition though I am, these things produced in me an odd sensation, which was intensified by a pair of widely separated newspaper cuttings, relating to deaths in the shunned house, one from the Providence Gazette and Country Journal of April 12, 1815, and the other from the Daily Transcript and Chronicle of October 27, 1845, each of which detailed an appallingly grisly circumstance, whose duplication was remarkable. It seems that in both instances, the dying person, in 1815, a gentle old lady named Stafford, and in 1845, a schoolteacher of middle age named Eliza Durfee, became transfigured in a horrible way, glaring glassily and attempting to bite the throat of the attending physician. Even more puzzling, though, was the final case which put an end to the renting of the house, a series of anemia deaths preceded by progressive madnesses, wherein the patient would craftily attempt the lives of his relatives by incisions in the neck or wrist. This was in 1860 and 1861, when my uncle had just begun his medical practice, and before leaving for the front he heard much of it from his elder professional colleagues. The really inexplicable thing, was the way in which the victims, ignorant people, for the ill-smelling and widely shunned house could now be rented to no others, would babble maledictions in French, a language they could not possibly have studied to any extent. It made one think of poor Roby Harris nearly a century before, and so moved my uncle that he commenced collecting historical data on the house after listening, sometime subsequent to his return from the war, to the first-hand account of Doctors Chase and Whitmarsh. Indeed, I could see that my uncle had thought deeply on the subject, and that he was glad of my own interest, an open-minded and sympathetic interest which enabled him to discuss with me matters at which others would merely have laughed. His fancy had not gone so far as mine, but he felt that the place was rare in its imaginative potentialities and worthy of note as an inspiration in the field of the grotesque and macabre. For my part, I was deposed to take the whole subject with profound seriousness, and began at once not only to review the evidence, but to accumulate as much more as I could. I talked with the elderly Archer Harris, then owner of the house, many times before his death in 1916, and obtained from him and his still surviving maiden sister Alice, an authentic corroboration of all the family data my uncle had collected. When, however, I asked them what connection with France or its language the house could have, they confessed themselves as frankly baffled and ignorant as I. Archer knew nothing, and all that Miss Harris could say was that an old illusion her grandfather, Duty Harris, had heard of, might have shed a little light. The old seaman, who had survived his son Welcome's death in battle by two years, had not himself known the legend, but recalled that his earliest nurse, the ancient Maria Robbins, seemed darkly aware of something that might have lent a weird significance to the French ravings of Roby Harris, which she had so often heard during the last days of that hapless woman. Maria had been at the shunned house from 1769 till the removal of the family in 1783, and had seen Mercy Dexter die. Once, she hinted to the child duty of a somewhat peculiar circumstance in Mercy's last moments, but he had soon forgotten all about it, save that it was something peculiar. The granddaughter, moreover, recalled even this much with difficulty. She and her brother were not so much interested in the house as was Archer's son Carrington, the present owner, with whom I talked after my experience. Having exhausted the Harris family of all the information it could furnish, I turned my attention to early town records and deeds, with a zeal more penetrating than that which my uncle had occasionally shown in the same work. 
what I wished was a comprehensive history of the site from its very settlement in 1636, or even before, if any Narragansett Indian legend could be unearthed to supply the data. I found, at the start, that the land had been part of the long strip of home lot granted originally to John Throck Morton, one of many similar strips beginning at the town street beside the river, and extending up over the hill to a line roughly corresponding with the modern Hope Street. The Throck Morton lot had later, of course, been much subdivided, and I became very assiduous in tracing that section through which Back or Benefit Street was later run. It had, a rumour indeed said, been the Throckmorton graveyard, but as I examined the records more carefully, I found that the graves had all been transferred at an early date to the North Burial Ground on the Portucket West Road. Then suddenly I came, by a rare piece of chance, since it was not in the main body of records and might easily have been missed, upon something which aroused my keenest eagerness, fitting in as it did with several of the queerest phases of the affair. It was the record of a lease in 1697, of a small tract of ground to an Etienne Roulet and wife. At last, the French element had appeared, that and another deeper element of horror, which the name conjured up from the darkest recesses of my weird and heterogeneous reading, and I feverishly studied the platting of the locality, as it had been before the cutting through and partial straightening of Backstreet between 1747 and 1758. I found what I had half expected, that where the shunned house now stood, the Roulets had laid out their graveyard, behind a one-story and attic cottage, and that no record of any transfer of graves existed. The document, indeed, ended in much confusion, and I was forced to ransack both the Rhode Island Historical Society and Shepley Library, before I could find a local door which the name Etienne Roulet would unlock. In the end I did find something, something of such vague but monstrous import, that I set about at once to examine the cellar of the shunned house itself, with a new and excited minuteness. The Roulets, it seemed, had come in 1696 from East Greenwich, down the west shore of Narragansett Bay. They were Huguenots from Cord, and had encountered much opposition before the Providence selectmen allowed them to settle in the town. Unpopularity had dogged them in East Greenwich, whether they had come in 1686, after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and rumour said that the cause of dislike extended beyond mere racial and national prejudice, or the land disputes which involved other French settlers with the English in rivalries which not even Governor Andros could quell. But their ardent Protestantism, too ardent, some whispered, and their evident distress when virtually driven from the village down the bay, had moved the sympathy of the town fathers. Here the strangers had been granted a haven, and the swarthy Etienne Roulet, less apt at agriculture than at reading queer books and drawing queer diagrams, was given a clerical post in the warehouse at Pardon Tillingast's Wharf, far south in Town Street. There had, however, been a riot of some sort later on, perhaps forty years later, after old Roulet's death, and no one seemed to hear of the family after that. For a century and more, it appeared, the Roulets had been well remembered and frequently discussed as vivid incidents in the quiet life of a New England seaport. Etienne's son, Paul, a surly fellow whose erratic conduct had probably provoked the riot which wiped out the family, was particularly a source of speculation, and though Providence never shared the witchcraft panics of her Puritan neighbours, it was freely intimated by old wives that his prayers were neither uttered at the proper time, nor directed toward the proper object. All this had undoubtedly formed the basis of the legend known by old Maria Robbins. What relation it had to the French ravings of Roby Harris and other inhabitants of the shunned house, imagination or future discovery alone could determine. I wondered how many of those who had known the legends realized that additional link with the terrible which my wide reading had given me, that ominous item in the annals of morbid horror, which tells of the creature Jacques Roulet of Cord, who in 1598 
was condemned to death as a demoniac, but afterwards saved from the stake by the Paris Parliament, and shut in a madhouse. He had been found covered with blood and shreds of flesh in a wood, shortly after the killing and rending of a boy by a pair of wolves. One wolf was seen to lope away unhurt. Surely a pretty hearthside tale, with a queer significance as to name and place, but I decided that the Providence gossips could not have generally known of it. Had they known, the coincidence of names would have brought some drastic and frightened action. Indeed, might not its limited whispering have precipitated the final riot which erased the roulets from the town? I now visited the accursed place with increased frequency, studying the unwholesome vegetation of the garden, examining all the walls of the building, and poring over every inch of the earthen cellar floor. Finally, with Carrington Harris's permission, I fitted a key to the disused door opening from the cellar directly upon Benefit Street, preferring to have a more immediate access to the outside world than the dark stairs, ground-floor hall, and front door could give. There, where morbidity lurked most thickly, I searched and poked during long afternoons, when the sunlight filtered in through the cobwebbed above-ground windows, and a sense of security glowed from the unlocked door, which placed me only a few feet from the placid sidewalk outside. Nothing new rewarded my efforts, only the same depressing mustiness and faint suggestions of noxious odours and nitrous outlines on the floor and I fancy that many pedestrians must have watched me curiously through the broken panes. At length, upon a suggestion of my uncle's, I decided to try the spot nocturnally, and one stormy midnight ran the beams of an electric torch over the mouldy floor, with its uncanny shapes and distorted, half-phosphorescent fungi. The place had dispirited me curiously that evening, and I was almost prepared when I saw, or thought I saw, amidst the whitish deposits, a particularly sharp definition of the huddled form I had suspected from boyhood. Its clearness was astonishing and unprecedented, and as I watched I seemed to see again the thin, yellowish, shimmering exhalation which had startled me on that rainy afternoon so many years before. Above the anthropomorphic patch of mould by the fireplace it rose, a subtle, sickish, almost luminous vapour which, as it hung trembling in the dampness, seemed to develop vague and shocking suggestions of form, gradually trailing off into nebulous decay, and passing up into the blackness of the great chimney with a fetter in its wake. It was truly horrible and the more so to me because of what I knew of the spot. Refusing to flee, I watched it fade, and as I watched I felt that it was in turn watching me, greedily, with eyes more imaginable than visible. When I told my uncle about it, he was greatly aroused, and after a tense hour of reflection arrived at a definite and drastic decision. Weighing in his mind the importance of the matter, and the significance of our relation to it, he insisted that we both test, and if possible destroy, the horror of the house by a joint night or nights of aggressive vigil in that musty and fungus-cursed cellar. 4. On Wednesday, June 25, 1919, after a proper notification of Carrington Harris, which did not include surmises as to what we expected to find, my uncle and I conveyed to the shunned house two camp chairs and a folding camp cot, together with some scientific mechanism of greater weight and intricacy. These we placed in the cellar during the day, screening the windows with paper, and planning to return in the evening for our first vigil. We had locked the door from the cellar to the ground floor, and having a key to the outside cellar door, we were prepared to leave our expensive and delicate apparatus which we had obtained secretly and at great cost, as many days as our vigils might need to be protracted. It was our design to sit up together till very late, and then watch singly till dawn in two-hour stretches, myself first, and then my companion, the inactive member resting on the cot. 
the natural leadership with which my uncle procured the instruments from the laboratories of Brown University and the Cranston Street Armory, and instinctively assumed direction of our venture, was a marvellous commentary on the potential vitality and resilience of a man of eighty-one. Elihu Whipple had lived according to the hygienic laws he had preached as a physician, and but for what happened later would be here in full vigour today. Only two persons suspect what did happen, Carrington Harris and myself. I had to tell Harris because he owned the house, and deserved to know what had gone out of it. Then, too, we had spoken to him in advance of our quest, and I felt after my uncle's going that he would understand and assist me in some vitally necessary public explanations. He turned very pale, but agreed to help me, and decided that it would now be safe to rent the house. To declare that we were not nervous on that rainy night of watching, would be an exaggeration both gross and ridiculous. We were not, as I have said, in any sense childishly superstitious, but scientific study and reflection had taught us that the known universe of three dimensions embraces the merest fraction of the whole cosmos of substance and energy. In this case, an overwhelming preponderance of evidence from numerous authentic sources pointed to the tenacious existence of certain forces of great power, and, so far as the human point of view is concerned, exceptional malignancy. To say that we actually believed in vampires or werewolves would be a carelessly inclusive statement. Rather, must it be said that we were not prepared to deny the possibility of certain unfamiliar and unclassified modifications of vital force and attenuated matter— existing very infrequently in three-dimensional space because of its more intimate connection with other spatial units, yet close enough to the boundary of our own to furnish us occasional manifestations which we, for lack of proper vantage point, may never hope to understand. In short, it seemed to my uncle and me that an incontrovertible array of facts pointed to some lingering influence in the shunned house, traceable to one or another of the ill-favoured French settlers of two centuries before, and still operative through rare and unknown laws of atomic and electronic motion. That the family of Roulet had possessed an abnormal affinity for outer circles of entity, dark spheres which for normal folk hold only repulsion and terror, their recorded history seemed to prove. Had not, then, the riots of those bygone seventeen thirties set moving certain kinetic patterns in the morbid brain of one or more of them, notably the sinister Paul Roulet, which obscurely survived the bodies murdered and buried by the mob, and continued to function in some multiple dimension space along the original lines of force determined by a frantic hatred of the encroaching community? Such a thing was surely not a physical or biochemical impossibility in the light of a newer science which includes the theories of relativity and interatomic action. One might easily imagine an alien nucleus of substance or energy, formless or otherwise, kept alive by imperceptible or immaterial subtractions from the life force or bodily tissues and fluids of other and more palpably living things into which it penetrates, and with whose fabric it sometimes completely merges itself. It might be actively hostile, or it might be dictated merely by blind motives of self-preservation. In any case, such a monster must of necessity be, in our scheme of things, an anomaly, and an intruder, whose extirpation forms a primary duty with every man not an enemy to the world's life, health, and sanity. What baffled us was our utter ignorance of the aspect in which we might encounter the thing. No sane person had even seen it, and few had ever felt it definitely. It might be pure energy, a form ethereal and outside the realm of substance, or it might be partly material, some unknown and equivocal mass of plasticity, capable of changing at will to nebulous approximations of the solid, liquid, gaseous, or tenuously unparticled states. The anthropomorphic patch of mould on the floor, the form of the yellowish vapour, and the curvature of the tree-roots in some of the old tales, 
all argued at least a remote and reminiscent connection with the human shape, but how representative or permanent that similarity might be, none could say with any kind of certainty. We had devised two weapons to fight it, a large and specially fitted Crookes tube operated by powerful storage batteries, and provided with peculiar screens and reflectors, in case it proved intangible and opposable only by vigorously destructive ether radiations, and a pair of military flamethrowers, of the sort used in the World War, in case it proved partly material, and susceptible of mechanical destruction. For like the superstitious Exeter rustics, we were prepared to burn the thing's heart out, if heart existed to burn. All this aggressive mechanism we set in the cellar in positions carefully arranged with reference to the cot and chairs, and to the spot before the fireplace, where the mould had taken strange shapes. That suggestive patch, by the way, was only faintly visible, when we placed our furniture and instruments, and when we returned that evening for the actual vigil. For a moment I half doubted that I had ever seen it in the more definitely limbed form, but then I thought of the legends. Our cellar vigil began at 10 p.m., daylight saving time, and as it continued we found no promise of pertinent developments. A weak, filtered glow from the rain-harassed street lamps outside, and a feeble phosphorescence from the detestable fungi within, showed the dripping stone of the walls from which all traces of whitewash had vanished, the dank, fetid, and mildew-tainted hard-earth floor with its obscene fungi, the rotting remains of what had been stools, chairs, and tables, and other more shapeless furniture, the heavy planks and massive beams of the ground floor overhead, the decrepit plank door leading to bins and chambers beneath other parts of the house, the crumbling stone staircase with ruined wooden handrail, and the crude and cavernous fireplace of blackened brick, where rusted iron fragments revealed the past presence of hooks, and iron, spit, crane, and a door to the Dutch oven. These things, and our austere cot and camp chairs, and the heavy and intricate destructive machinery we had brought. We had, as in my own former explorations, left the door to the street unlocked, so that a direct and practical path of escape might lie open, in case of manifestations beyond our power to deal with. It was our idea that our continued nocturnal presence would call forth whatever malign entity lurked there, and that being prepared, we could dispose of the thing with one or the other of our provided means, as soon as we had recognized and observed it sufficiently. How long it might require to evoke and extinguish the thing, we had no notion. It occurred to us, too, that our venture was far from safe, for in what strength a thing might appear no one could tell. But we deemed the game worth the hazard, and embarked on it alone and unhesitatingly, conscious that the seeking of outside aid would only expose us to ridicule, and perhaps defeat our entire purpose. Such was our frame of mind as we talked, far into the night, till my uncle's growing drowsiness made me remind him to lie down for his two-hour sleep. Something like fear chilled me as I sat there in the small hours alone. I say alone, for one who sits by a sleeper is indeed alone, perhaps more alone than he can realize. My uncle breathed heavily, his deep inhalations and exhalations accompanied by the rain outside, and punctuated by another nerve-wracking sound of distant, dripping water within. The house was repulsively damp, even in dry weather, and in this storm positively swamp-like. I studied the loose, antique masonry of the walls in the fungus light, and the feeble rays which stole in from the street through the screened windows, and once— when the noisome atmosphere of the place seemed about to sicken me, I opened the door and looked up and down the street, feasting my eyes on familiar sights, and my nostrils on the wholesome air. Still, nothing occurred to reward my watching, and I yawned repeatedly, fatigue getting the better of apprehension. 
Then the stirring of my uncle in his sleep attracted my notice. He had turned restlessly on the cot several times during the latter half of the first hour, but now he was breathing with unusual irregularity, occasionally heaving a sigh which held more than a few of the qualities of a choking moan. I turned my electric flashlight on him, and found his face averted, so rising and crossing to the other side of the cot, I again flashed the light to see if he seemed in any pain. What I saw unnerved me most surprisingly, considering its relative triviality. It must have been merely the association of any odd circumstance with the sinister nature of our location and mission, for surely the circumstance was not in itself frightful or unnatural. It was merely that my uncle's facial expression, disturbed no doubt by the strange dreams which our situation prompted, betrayed considerable agitation, and seemed not at all characteristic of him. His habitual expression was one of kindly and well-bred calm, whereas now a variety of emotions seemed struggling within him. I think, on the whole, that it was this variety which chiefly disturbed me. My uncle, as he gasped and tossed in increasing perturbation, and with eyes that had now started open, seemed not one, but many men, and suggested a curious quality of alienage from himself. All at once he commenced to mutter, and I did not like the look of his mouth and teeth as he spoke. The words were at first indistinguishable, and then, with a tremendous start, I recognized something about them, which filled me with icy fear, till I recalled the breadth of my uncle's education, and the interminable translations he had made from anthropological and antiquarian articles in the Revue des Deux Mondes. For the venerable Elihu Whipple was muttering in French, and the few phrases I could distinguish seemed connected with the darkest myths he had ever adapted from the famous Paris magazine. Suddenly, a perspiration broke out on the sleeper's forehead, and he leaped abruptly up, half awake. The jumble of French changed to a cry in English, and the hoarse voice shouted excitedly, My breath! My breath! Then the awakening became complete, and with a subsidence of facial expression to the normal state, my uncle seized my hand and began to relate a dream whose nucleus of significance I could only surmise with a kind of awe. He had, he said, floated off from a very ordinary series of dream pictures into a scene whose strangeness was related to nothing he had ever read. It was of this world, and yet not of it, a shadowy geometrical confusion, in which could be seen elements of familiar things in most unfamiliar and perturbing combinations. There was a suggestion of queerly disordered pictures superimposed one upon another, an arrangement in which the essentials of time as well as of space seemed dissolved and mixed in the most illogical fashion. In this kaleidoscopic vortex of phantasmal images were occasional snapshots, if one might use the term, of singular clearness but unaccountable heterogeneity. Once my uncle thought he lay in a carelessly dug-open pit, with a crowd of angry faces framed by straggling locks and three-cornered hats frowning down on him. Again, he seemed to be in the interior of a house, an old house apparently, but the details and inhabitants were constantly changing, and he could never be certain of the faces or the furniture, or even of the room itself, since doors and windows seemed in just as great a state of flux as the more presumably mobile objects. It was queer, damnably queer, and my uncle spoke almost sheepishly, as if half expecting not to be believed, when he declared that of the strange faces many had unmistakably borne the features of the Harris family. And all the while there was a personal sensation of choking, as if some pervasive presence had spread itself through his body and sought to possess itself of his vital processes. I shuddered at the thought of those vital processes— worn as they were by eighty-one years of continuous functioning, in conflict with unknown forces of which the youngest and strongest system might well be afraid. 
but in another moment reflected that dreams are only dreams, and that these uncomfortable visions could be, at most, no more than my uncle's reaction to the investigations and expectations which had lately filled our minds to the exclusion of all else. Conversation, also, soon tended to dispel my sense of strangeness, and in time I yielded to my yawns and took my turn at slumber. My uncle seemed now very wakeful, and welcomed his period of watching, even though the nightmare had aroused him far ahead of his allotted two hours. Sleep seized me quickly, and I was at once haunted with dreams of the most disturbing kind. I felt, in my visions, a cosmic and abysmal loneness, with hostility surging from all sides upon some prison where I lay confined. I seemed bound and gagged, and taunted by the echoing yells of distant multitudes who thirsted for my blood. My uncle's face came to me with less pleasant associations than in waking hours, and I recall many futile struggles and attempts to scream. It was not a pleasant sleep, and for a second I was not sorry for the echoing shriek which clove through the barriers of dream and flung me to a sharp and startled awakeness in which every actual object before my eyes stood out with more than natural clearness and reality. 5. I had been lying with my face away from my uncle's chair, so that in this sudden flash of awakening I saw only the door to the street, the more northerly window, and the wall and floor and ceiling toward the north of the room all photographed with morbid vividness on my brain in a light brighter than the glow of the fungi or the rays from the street outside. It was not a strong or even a fairly strong light, certainly not nearly strong enough to read an average book by, but it cast a shadow of myself and the cot on the floor, and had a yellowish, penetrating force that hinted at things more potent than luminosity. This I perceived with unhealthy sharpness, despite the fact that two of my other senses were violently assailed. For on my ears rang the reverberations of that shocking scream, while my nostrils revolted at the stench which filled the place. My mind, as alert as my senses, recognized the gravely unusual, and almost automatically I leaped up and turned about to grasp the destructive instruments which we had left trained on the mouldy spot before the fireplace. As I turned, I dreaded what I was to see, for the scream had been in my uncle's voice, and I knew not against what menace I should have to defend him and myself. Yet, after all, the sight was worse than I had dreaded. There are horrors beyond horrors, and this was one of those nuclei of all dreamable hideousness which the cosmos saves to blast an accursed and unhappy few. Out of the fungus-ridden earth steamed up a vaporous corpse light, yellow and diseased, which bubbled and lapped to a gigantic height in vague outlines, half human and half monstrous, through which I could see the chimney and fireplace beyond. It was all eyes, wolfish and mocking, and the rugose insect-like head dissolved at the top to a thin stream of mist, which curled putridly about, and finally vanished up the chimney. I say that I saw this thing, but it is only in conscious retrospection that I ever definitely traced its damnable approach to form. At the time, it was to me only a seething, dimly phosphorescent cloud of fungus loathsomeness, enveloping and dissolving to an abhorrent plasticity, the one object to which all my attention was focused. That object was my uncle, the venerable Elihu Whipple, who with blackening and decaying features leered and gibbered at me, and reached out dripping claws to rend me in the fury which this horror had brought. It was a sense of routine which kept me from going mad. I had drilled myself in preparation for the crucial moment, and blind training saved me. Recognizing the bubbling evil as no substance reachable by matter or material chemistry, 
and therefore ignoring the flamethrower which loomed on my left, I threw on the current of the crook's tube apparatus, and focused toward that scene of immortal blasphemousness the strongest ether radiations which man's art can arouse from the spaces and fluids of nature. There was a bluish haze and a frenzied sputtering, and the yellowish phosphorescence grew dimmer to my eyes. But I saw the dimness was only that of contrast, and that the waves from the machine had no effect whatever. Then, in the midst of that demoniac spectacle, I saw a fresh horror which brought cries to my lips and sent me fumbling and staggering toward that unlocked door to the quiet street, careless of what abnormal terrors I loosed upon the world, or what thoughts or judgments of men I brought down upon my head. In that dim blend of blue and yellow, the form of my uncle had commenced a nauseous liquefaction, whose essence eludes all description and in which there played across his vanishing face such changes of identity as only madness can conceive. He was at once a devil and a multitude, a charnel-house and a pageant, lit by the mixed and uncertain beams, that gelatinous face assumed a dozen, a score, a hundred aspects, grinning as it sank to the ground on a body that melted like tallow in the caricatured likeness of legion strange, and yet not strange. I saw the features of the Harris line, masculine and feminine, adult and infantile, and other features old and young, coarse and refined, familiar and unfamiliar. For a second there flashed a degraded counterfeit of a miniature of poor mad Roby Harris that I had seen in the School of Design Museum, and another time I thought I caught the raw-boned image of Mercy Dexter, as I recalled her from a painting in Carrington Harris's house. It was frightful beyond conception. Toward the last, when a curious blend of servant and baby visages flickered close to the fungus floor, where a pool of greenish grease was spreading, it seemed as though the shifting features fought against themselves, and strove to form contours like those of my uncle's kindly face. I like to think that he existed at that moment, and that he tried to bid me farewell. It seems to me I hiccoughed a farewell from my own parched throat, as I lurched out into the street a thin stream of grease following me through the door to the rain-drenched sidewalk. The rest is shadowy and monstrous. There was no one in the soaking street, and in all the world there was no one I dared tell. I walked aimlessly south past College Hill and the Athenaeum, down Hopkins Street, and over the bridge to the business section, where tall buildings seemed to guard me as modern material things guard the world from ancient and unwholesome wonder. Then grey dawn unfolded wetly from the east, silhouetting the archaic hill and its venerable steeples, and beckoning me to the place where my terrible work was still unfinished. And in the end I went, wet, hatless, and dazed in the morning light, and entered that awful door in Benefit Street, which I had left ajar, and which still swung cryptically, in full sight of the early householders, to whom I dared not speak. The grease was gone, for the mouldy floor was porous, and in front of the fireplace was no vestige of the giant doubled-up form in nitre. I looked at the cot, the chairs, the instruments, my neglected hat, and the yellowed straw hat of my uncle. Dazedness was uppermost, and I could scarcely recall what was dream, and what was reality. Then thought trickled back, and I knew that I had witnessed things more horrible than I had dreamed. Sitting down, I tried to conjecture as nearly as sanity would let me just what had happened, and how I might end the horror, if indeed it had been real. Matter it seemed not to be, nor ether, nor anything else conceivable by mortal mind. What, then, but some— exotic emanation, some vampirish vapour such as Exeter rustics tell of as lurking over certain churchyards? This, I felt, was the clue, and again I looked at the floor before the fireplace, where the mould and nitre had taken strange forms. In ten minutes 
my mind was made up, and taking my hat I set out for home, where I bathed, ate, and gave by telephone an order for a pickaxe, a spade, a military gas mask, and six carboys of sulfuric acid, all to be delivered the next morning at the cellar door of the shunned house in Benefit Street. After that I tried to sleep, and failing, passed the hours in reading and in the composition of inane verses to counteract my mood. At eleven a.m. the next day, I commenced digging. It was sunny weather, and I was glad of that. I was still alone, for as much as I feared the unknown horror I sought, there was more fear in the thought of telling anybody. Later, I told Harris only through sheer necessity, and because he had heard odd tales from old people which disposed him ever so little toward belief. As I turned up the stinking black earth in front of the fireplace, my spade causing a viscous yellow ichor to ooze from the white fungi which it severed, I trembled at the dubious thoughts of what I might uncover. Some secrets of inner earth are not good for mankind, and this seemed to me one of them. My hand shook perceptibly, but still I delved, after a while standing in the large hole I had made. With the deepening of the hole, which was about six feet square, the evil smell increased, and I lost all doubt of my imminent contact with the hellish thing whose emanations had cursed the house for over a century and a half. I wondered what it would look like, what its form and substance would be, and how big it might have waxed through long ages of life-sucking. At length, I climbed out of the hole and dispersed the heaped-up dirt. Then, arranging the great carboys of acid around and near the two sides, so that when necessary, I might empty them all down the aperture in quick succession. After that, I dumped earth only along the other two sides, working more slowly, and donning my gas mask as the smell grew. I was nearly unnerved at my proximity to a nameless thing at the bottom of a pit. Suddenly, my spade struck something softer than earth. I shuddered, and made a motion as if to climb out of the hole, which was now as deep as my neck. Then courage returned, and I scraped away more dirt in the light of the electric torch I had provided. The surface I uncovered was fishy and glassy, a kind of semi-putrid congealed jelly with suggestions of translucency. I scraped further, and saw that it had form. There was a rift where a part of the substance was folded over. The exposed area was huge and roughly cylindrical, like a mammoth soft blue-white stovepipe doubled in two, its largest part some two feet in diameter. Still more I scraped, and then abruptly I leaped out of the hole and away from the filthy thing, frantically unstopping and tilting the heavy carboys, and precipitating their corrosive contents one after another down that charnel gulf, and upon the unthinkable abnormality whose titan elbow I had seen. The blinding maelstrom of greenish-yellow vapour which surged tempestuously up from that hole as the floods of acid descended, will never leave my memory. All along the hill people tell of the yellow day, when virulent and horrible fumes arose from the factory waste dumped in the Providence River, but I know how mistaken they are as to the source. They tell, too, of the hideous roar which at the same time came from some disordered water pipe or gas main underground, but again I could correct them if I dared. It was unspeakably shocking, and I do not see how I live through it. I did faint after emptying the fourth carboy, which I had to handle after the fumes had begun to penetrate my mask, but when I recovered, I saw that the hole was emitting no fresh vapours. The two remaining carboys I emptied down without particular result, and after a time, I felt it safe to shovel the earth back into the pit. It was twilight before I was done, but fear had gone out of the place. The dampness was less fetid, and all the strange fungi had withered to a kind of harmless, greyish powder, which blew ash-like along the floor. One of Earth's nethermost terrors had perished forever, and if there be a hell, 
it had received at last the demon soul of an unhallowed thing. And as I patted down the last spadeful of mould, I shed the first of the many tears with which I have paid unaffected tribute to my beloved uncle's memory. The next spring no more pale grass and strange weeds came up in the shunned house's terraced garden, and shortly afterward Carrington Harris rented the place. It is still spectral, but its strangeness fascinates me, and I shall find mixed with my relief a queer regret when it is torn down to make way for a tawdry shop or vulgar apartment building. The barren old trees in the yard have begun to bear small, sweet apples, and last year the birds nested in their gnarled boughs. The Lurking Fear 1. The Shadow on the Chimney There was thunder in the air on the night I went to the deserted mansion atop Tempest Mountain to find the lurking fear. I was not alone, for foolhardiness was not then mixed with that love of the grotesque and the terrible which has made my career a series of quests for strange horrors in literature and in life. With me were two faithful and muscular men for whom I had sent when the time came, men long associated with me in my ghastly explorations, because of their peculiar fitness. We had started quietly from the village because of the reporters who still lingered about after the eldritch panic of a month before, the nightmare creeping death. Later, I thought, they might aid me but I did not want them then. Would to God I had let them share the search, that I might not have had to bear the secret alone so long, to bear it alone for fear the world would call me mad, or go mad itself at the demon implications of the thing. Now that I am telling it anyway, lest the brooding make me a maniac, I wish I had never concealed it, for I, and I only, know what manner of fear lurked on that spectral and desolate mountain. In a small motor-car, we covered the miles of primeval forest and hill, until the wooded ascent checked in. The country bore an aspect more than usually sinister, as we viewed it by night and without the accustomed crowds of investigators, so that we were often tempted to use the acetylene headlight, despite the attention it might attract. It was not a wholesome landscape after dark, and I believe I would have noticed its morbidity even had I been ignorant of the terror that stalked there. Of wild creatures there were none. They are wise when death leers close. The ancient, lightning-scarred trees seemed unnaturally large and twisted, and the other vegetation unnaturally thick and feverish, while curious mounds and hummocks in the weedy, fulgurite pitted earth reminded me of snakes and dead men's skulls, swelled to gigantic proportions. Fear had lurked on Tempest Mountain for more than a century. This I learned at once from newspaper accounts of the catastrophe which first brought the region to the world's notice. The place is a remote, lonely elevation in that part of the Catskills where Dutch civilization once feebly and transiently penetrated, leaving behind as it receded only a few ruined mansions and a degenerate squatter population inhabiting pitiful hamlets on isolated slopes. Normal beings seldom visited the locality till the state police were formed, and even now only infrequent troopers patrol it. The fear, however, is an old tradition throughout the neighbouring villages, since it is a prime topic in the simple discourse of the poor mongrels who sometimes leave their valleys to trade hand-woven baskets for such primitive necessities as they cannot shoot, raise, or make. The lurking fear dwelt in the shunned and deserted Martens mansion, which crowned the high but gradual eminence whose liability to frequent thunderstorms gave it the name of Tempest Mountain. For over a hundred years the antique, grove-circled stone house had been the subject of stories incredibly wild and 
monstrously hideous, stories of a silent, colossal, creeping death which stalked abroad in summer. With whimpering insistence, the squatters told tales of a demon which seized lone wayfarers after dark, either carrying them off or leaving them in a frightful state of gnawed dismemberment, while sometimes they whispered of blood trails toward the distant mansion. Some said the thunder called the lurking fear out of its habitation, while others said the thunder was its voice. No one outside the backwoods had believed these varying and conflicting stories, with their incoherent, extravagant descriptions of the half-glimpsed fiend, yet not a farmer or villager doubted that the Martens mansion was ghoulishly haunted. Local history forbade such a doubt, although no ghostly evidence was ever found by such investigators as had visited the building after some especially vivid tale of the squatters. Grandmothers told strange myths of the Martens spectre, myths concerning the Martens family itself, its queer hereditary dissimilarity of eyes, its long, unnatural annals, and the murder which had cursed it. The terror which brought me to the scene was a sudden and portentous confirmation of the mountaineer's wildest legends. One summer night, after a thunderstorm of unprecedented violence, the countryside was aroused by a squatter stampede which no mere delusion could create. The pitiful throngs of natives shrieked and whined of the unnameable horror which had descended upon them, and they were not doubted. They had not seen it, but had heard such cries from one of their hamlets that they knew a creeping death had come. In the morning, citizens and state troopers followed the shuddering mountaineers to the place where they said the death had come. Death was indeed there. The ground under one of the squatters' villages had caved in after a lightning stroke, destroying several of the malodorous shanties, but upon this property damage was superimposed an organic devastation which paled it to insignificance. Of a possible seventy-five natives who had inhabited this spot, not one living specimen was visible. The disordered earth was covered with blood and human debris bespeaking too vividly the ravages of demon teeth and talons, yet no visible trail led away from the carnage. That some hideous animal must be the cause, everyone quickly agreed, nor did any tongue now revive the charge that such cryptic deaths formed merely the sordid murders common in decadent communities. That charge was revived only when about twenty-five of the estimated population were found missing from the dead, and even then it was hard to explain the murder of fifty by half that number. But the fact remained that on a summer night a bolt had come out of the heavens and left a dead village whose corpses were horribly mangled, chewed, and clawed. The excited countryside immediately connected the horror with the haunted Martens mansion, though the localities were over three miles apart. The troopers were more sceptical, including the mansion only casually in their investigations, and dropping it altogether when they found it thoroughly deserted. Country and village people, however, canvassed the place with infinite care, overturning everything in the house, sounding ponds and brooks, beating down bushes, and ransacking the nearby forests. All was in vain. The death that had come had left no trace save destruction itself. By the second day of the search, the affair was fully treated by the newspapers, whose reporters overran Tempest Mountain. They described it in much detail, and with many interviews to elucidate the horror's history, as told by local grandams. I followed the accounts languidly at first, for I am a connoisseur in horrors, but after a week I detected an atmosphere which stirred me oddly, so that on August 5, 1921, I registered among the reporters who crowded the hotel at Leffert's Corners, nearest village to Tempest Mountain, and acknowledged headquarters of the searchers. Three weeks more, and the dispersal of the reporters left me free to begin a terrible exploration, based on the minute inquiries and surveying with which I had meanwhile busied myself. So, on this summer night, while distant thunder rumbled, I left a silent motor-car and tramped with two armed companions up the last mound-covered reaches of Tempest Mountain, casting the beams of an electric torch on the spectral grey walls that began to appear through giant oaks ahead. 
In this morbid night solitude and feeble shifting illumination, the vast box-like pile displayed obscure hints of terror which day could not uncover. Yet I did not hesitate, since I had come with fierce resolution to test an idea. I believed that the thunder called the death demon out of some fearsome secret place, and be that demon solid entity or vaporous pestilence, I meant to see it. I had thoroughly searched the ruin before, hence knew my plan well, choosing as the seat of my vigil the old room of Jan Martens, whose murder looms so great in the rural legends. I felt subtly that the apartment of this ancient victim was best for my purposes. The chamber, measuring about twenty feet square, contained, like the other room, some rubbish which had once been furniture. It lay on the second story, on the southeast corner of the house, and had an immense east window and narrow south window, both devoid of panes or shutters. Opposite the large window was an enormous Dutch fireplace, with scriptural tiles representing the prodigal son, and opposite the narrow window was a spacious bed built into the wall. As the tree-muffled thunder grew louder, I arranged my plan's details. First, I fastened side by side to the ledge of the large window three rope ladders which I had brought with me. I knew they reached a suitable spot on the grass outside, where I had tested them. Then the three of us dragged from another room a wide four-poster bedstead, crowding it laterally against the window. Having strown it with fir boughs, all now rested on it, with drawn automatics, two relaxing while the third watched. From whatever direction the demon might come, our potential escape was provided. If it came from within the house, we had the window ladders. If from outside, the door and the stairs. We did not think, judging from precedent, that it would pursue us far, even at worst. I watched from midnight to one o'clock, when in spite of the sinister house, the unprotected window, and the approaching thunder and lightning, I felt singularly drowsy. I was between my two companions, George Bennett being toward the window, and William Toby toward the fireplace. Bennett was asleep, having apparently felt the same anomalous drowsiness which affected me, so I designated Toby for the next watch, although even he was nodding. It is curious how intently I had been watching that fireplace. The increasing thunder must have affected my dreams, for in the brief time I slept, there came to me apocalyptic visions. Once I partly awaked, probably because the sleeper toward the window had restlessly flung an arm across my chest. I was not sufficiently awake to see whether Toby was attending to his duties as sentinel, but felt a distinct anxiety on that score. Never before had the presence of evil so poignantly oppressed me. Later, I must have dropped asleep again, for it was out of a phantasmal chaos that my mind leaped when the night grew hideous with shrieks beyond anything in my former experience or imagination. In that shrieking, the inmost soul of human fear and agony clawed hopelessly and insanely at the ebony gates of oblivion. I awoke to red madness and the mockery of diabolism, as farther and farther down inconceivable vistas that phobic and crystalline anguish retreated and reverberated. There was no light, but I knew from the empty space at my right that Toby was gone, God alone knew whither. Across my chest still lay the heavy arm of the sleeper at my left. Then came the devastating stroke of lightning, which shook the whole mountain, lit the darkest crypts of the hoary grove, and splintered the patriarch of the twisted trees. In the demon flash of a monstrous fireball, the sleeper started up suddenly, while the glare from beyond the window threw his shadow vividly upon the chimney above the fireplace from which my eyes had never strayed. That I am still alive and sane is a marvel I cannot fathom. I cannot fathom it, for the shadow on that chimney was not that of George Bennett or of any other human creature, but a blasphemous abnormality from hell's nethermost craters, a nameless, shapeless abomination, which no mind could fully grasp, and no pen even partly describe. In another second, I was alone in the accursed mansion, shivering and gibbering. George Bennett and William Toby had left no trace, not even of a struggle. They were never heard of again. Two, a passer in the storm.
For days after that hideous experience in the forest-swathed mansion, I lay nervously exhausted in my hotel room at Leffert's Corners. I do not remember exactly how I managed to reach the motor car, start it, and slip unobserved back to the village, for I retain no distinct impression, save of wild-armed titan trees, demoniac mutterings of thunder, and coronian shadows athwart the low mounds that dotted and streaked the region. As I shivered and brooded on the casting of that brain-blasting shadow, I knew that I had at last pried out one of earth's supreme horrors, one of those nameless blights of outer voids, whose faint demon scratchings we sometimes hear on the farthest rim of space, yet from which our own finite vision has given us a merciful immunity. The shadow I had seen, I hardly dared to analyze or identify. Something had lain between me and the window that night, but I shuddered whenever I could not cast off the instinct to classify it. If it had only snarled, or bayed, or laughed titteringly, even that would have relieved the abysmal hideousness. But it was so silent. It had rested a heavy arm or foreleg on my chest. Obviously it was organic, or had once been organic. Jan Martens, whose room I had invaded, was buried in the graveyard near the mansion. I must find Bennett and Toby, if they lived. Why had it picked them and left me for the last? Drowsiness is so stifling, and dreams are so horrible. In a short time I realized that I must tell my story to someone or break down completely. I had already decided not to abandon the quest for the lurking fear, for in my rash ignorance it seemed to me that uncertainty was worse than enlightenment however terrible the latter might prove to be. Accordingly, I resolved in my mind the best course to pursue, whom to select for my confidences, and how to track down the thing which had obliterated two men and cast a nightmare shadow. My chief acquaintances at Leffert's Corners had been the affable reporters, of whom several still remained to collect final echoes of the tragedy. It was from these that I determined to choose a colleague, and the more I reflected— the more my preference inclined toward one Arthur Munro, a dark, lean man of about thirty-five, whose education, taste, intelligence, and temperament all seemed to mark him as one not bound to conventional ideas and experiences. On an afternoon in early September, Arthur Munro listened to my story. I saw from the beginning that he was both interested and sympathetic, and when I had finished, he analyzed and discussed the thing with the greatest shrewdness and judgment. His advice, moreover, was eminently practical, for he recommended a postponement of operations at the Martens mansion until we might become fortified with more detailed historical and geographical data. On his initiative, we combed the countryside for information regarding the terrible Martens family, and discovered a man who possessed a marvelously illuminating ancestral diary. We also talked at length with such of the mountain mongrels as had not fled from the terror and confusion to remoter slopes, and arranged to proceed our culminating task, the exhaustive and definitive examination of the mansion in the light of its detailed history, with an equally exhaustive and definitive examination of spots associated with the various tragedies of squatter legend. The results of this examination were not at first very enlightening though our tabulation of them seemed to reveal a fairly significant trend, namely, that the number of reported horrors was by far the greatest in areas either comparatively near the avoided house, or connected with it by stretches of the morbidly overnourished forest. There were, it is true, exceptions. Indeed, the horror which had caught the world's ear had happened in a treeless space, remote alike from the mansion and from any connecting woods. As to the nature and appearance of the lurking fear, nothing could be gained from the scared and witless shanty-dwellers. In the same breath, they called it a snake and a giant, a thunder-devil and a bat, a vulture and a walking tree. We did, however, deem ourselves justified in assuming that it was a living organism, highly susceptible to electrical storms, and although certain of the stories suggested wings— we believed that its aversion for open spaces made land locomotion a more probable theory. The only thing really incompatible with the latter view was the rapidity with which the creature must have travelled in order to perform all the deeds attributed to it. 
when we came to know the squatters better, we found them curiously likable in many ways. Simple animals they were, gently descending the evolutionary scale because of their unfortunate ancestry and stultifying isolation. They feared outsiders, but slowly grew accustomed to us, finally helping vastly when we beat down all the thickets and tore out all the partitions of the mansion in our search for the lurking fear. When we asked them to help us find Bennett and Toby, they were truly distressed, for they wanted to help us, yet knew that these victims had gone as wholly out of the world as their own missing people. That great numbers of them had actually been killed and removed, just as the wild animals had long been exterminated, we were of course thoroughly convinced, and we waited apprehensively for further tragedies to occur. By the middle of October, we were puzzled by our lack of progress. Owing to the clear nights, no demoniac aggressions had taken place, and the completeness of our vain searches of house and country almost drove us to regard the lurking fear as a non-material agency. We feared that the cold weather would come on and halt our explorations, for all agreed that the demon was generally quiet in winter. Thus, there was a kind of haste and desperation in our last daylight canvas of the horror-visited hamlet, a hamlet now deserted because of the squatter's fears. The ill-fated squatter hamlet had borne no name, but had long stood in a sheltered though treeless cleft between two elevations, called respectively Cone Mountain and Maple Hill. It was closer to Maple Hill than to Cone Mountain, some of the crude abodes indeed being dugouts on the side of the former eminence. Geographically, it lay about two miles northwest of the base of Tempest Mountain, and three miles from the Oak Girt Mansion. Of the distance between the hamlet and the mansion, fully two miles and a quarter on the hamlet side was entirely open country, the plain being of fairly level character, save for some of the low snake-like mounds, and having as vegetation only grass and scattered weeds. Considering this topography, we had finally concluded that the demon must have come by way of Cone Mountain, a wooded southern prolongation of which ran to within a short distance of the westernmost spur of Tempest Mountain. The upheaval of ground we traced conclusively to a landslide from Maple Hill, a tall lone splintered tree on whose side had been the striking point of the thunderbolt which summoned the fiend. As for the twentieth time or more Arthur Monroe and I went minutely over every inch of the violated village, we were filled with a certain discouragement coupled with vague and novel fears. It was acutely uncanny, even when frightful and uncanny things were common, to encounter so blankly clueless a scene after such overwhelming occurrences, and we moved about beneath the leaden, darkening sky with that tragic directionless zeal which results from a combined sense of futility and necessity of action. Our care was gravely minute. Every cottage was again entered, every hillside dugout again searched for bodies, every thorny foot of adjacent slope again scanned for dens and caves, but all without result. And yet, as I have said, vague new fears hovered menacingly over us, as if giant bat-winged griffins squatted invisibly on the mountain tops and leered with a bad eyes that had looked on transcosmic gulfs. As the afternoon advanced, it became increasingly difficult to see, and we heard the rumble of a thunderstorm gathering over Tempest Mountain. This sound in such a locality naturally stirred us, though less than it would have done at night. As it was, we hoped desperately that the storm would last until well after dark, and with that hope, turned from our aimless hillside searching toward the nearest inhabited hamlet to gather a body of squatters as helpers in the investigation. Timid as they were, a few of the younger men were sufficiently inspired by our protective leadership to promise such help. We had hardly more than turned, however, when there descended such a blinding sheet of torrential rain that shelter became imperative. The extreme, almost nocturnal darkness of the sky caused us to stumble sadly, but guided by the frequent flashes of lightning and by our minute knowledge of the hamlet, we soon reached the least porous cabin of the lot, a heterogeneous combination of logs and boards, whose still existing door and single tiny window both faced Maple Hill. Barring the door after us against the fury of the wind and rain, 
we put in place the crude window shutter, which our frequent searches had taught us where to find. It was dismal sitting there on rickety boxes in the pitchy darkness, but we smoked pipes and occasionally flashed our pocket lamps about. Now and then we could see the lightning through the cracks in the wall. The afternoon was so incredibly dark that each flash was extremely vivid. The stormy vigil reminded me shudderingly of my ghastly night on Tempest Mountain. My mind turned to that odd question, which had kept recurring ever since the nightmare thing had happened, and again I wondered why the demon, approaching the three watchers either from the window or the interior, had begun with the men on each side, and left the middleman till the last, when the titan fireball had scared it away. Why had it not taken its victims in natural order, with myself second, from whichever direction it had approached? With what manner of far-reaching tentacles did it pray? Or did it know that I was the leader, and save me for a fate worse than that of my companions? In the midst of these reflections, as if dramatically arranged to intensify them, there fell nearby a terrific bolt of lightning, followed by the sound of sliding earth. At the same time, the wolfish wind rose to demoniac crescendos of ululation. We were sure that the lone tree on Maple Hill had been struck again, and Monroe rose from his box and went to the tiny window to ascertain the damage. When he took down the shutter, the wind and rain howled deafeningly in, so that I could not hear what he said, but I waited while he leaned out and tried to fathom nature's pandemonium. Gradually, a calming of the wind and dispersal of the unusual darkness told of the storm's passing. I had hoped it would last into the night to help our quest, but a furtive sunbeam from a knothole behind me removed the likelihood of such a thing. Suggesting to Munro that we had better get some light, even if more showers came, I unbarred and opened the crude door. The ground outside was a singular mass of mud and pools, with fresh heaps of earth from the slight landslide, but I saw nothing to justify the interest which kept my companion silently leaning out the window. Crossing to where he leaned, I touched his shoulder, but he did not move. Then, as I playfully shook him and turned him around, I felt the strangling tendrils of a cancerous horror whose roots reached into illimitable pasts and fathomless abysms of the night that broods beyond time. For Arthur Monroe was dead, and on what remained of his chewed and gouged head, there was no longer a face. 3. What the Red Glare Meant On the tempest-wracked night of November 8, 1921, with a lantern which cast charnel shadows, I stood digging alone and idiotically in the grave of Jan Martens. I had begun to dig in the afternoon, because a thunderstorm was brewing, and now that it was dark and the storm had burst above the maniacally thick foliage, I was glad. I believed that my mind was partly unhinged by events since August 5th, the demon shadow in the mansion, the general strain and disappointment, and the thing that occurred at the hamlet in an October storm. After that thing I had dug a grave for one whose death I could not understand. I knew that others could not understand either, so let them think Arthur Munro had wandered away. They searched, but found nothing. The squatters might have understood, but I dared not frighten them more. I myself seemed strangely callous. That shock at the mansion had done something to my brain, and I could think only of the quest for a horror now grown to cataclysmic stature in my imagination, a quest which the fate of Arthur Munro made me vow to keep silent and solitary. The scene of my excavations would alone have been enough to unnerve any ordinary man. Baleful primal trees of unholy size, age and grotesqueness, leered above me like the pillars of some hellish druidic temple, muffling the thunder, hushing the clawing wind, and admitting but little rain. Beyond the scarred trunks in the background, illumined by faint flashes of filtered lightning, rose the damp, ivied stones of the deserted mansion, while somewhat nearer was the abandoned Dutch garden, whose walks and beds were polluted by a white, fungus, fetid, overnourished vegetation that never saw full daylight. And nearest of all was the graveyard, 
where deformed trees tossed insane branches as their roots displaced unhallowed slabs and sucked venom from what lay below. Now and then, beneath the brown pall of leaves that rotted and festered in the antediluvian forest darkness, I could trace the sinister outlines of some of those low mounds which characterized the lightning-pierced region. History had led me to this archaic grave. History, indeed, was all I had after everything else ended in mocking Satanism. I now believed that the lurking fear was no material thing, but a wolf-fanged ghost that rode the midnight lightning. And I believed, because of the masses of local tradition I had unearthed in my search with Arthur Munro, that the ghost was that of Jan Martens, who died in 1762. That is why I was digging idiotically in his grave. The Martens mansion was built in 1670 by Garrett Martens, a wealthy New Amsterdam merchant who disliked the changing order under British rule, and had constructed this magnificent domicile on a remote woodland summit, whose untrodden solitude and unusual scenery pleased him. The only substantial disappointment encountered in this site was that which concerned the prevalence of violent thunderstorms in summer. When selecting the hill and building his mansion, Mania Martens had laid these frequent natural outbursts to some peculiarity of the year, but in time he perceived that the locality was especially liable to such phenomena. At length, having found these storms injurious to his health, he fitted up a cellar into which he could retreat from their wildest pandemonium. Of Garrett Martens's descendants, less is known than of himself, since they were all reared in hatred of the English civilization and trained to shun such of the colonists as accepted it. Their life was exceedingly secluded, and people declared that their isolation had made them heavy of speech and comprehension. In appearance, all were marked by a peculiar inherited dissimilarity of eyes, one generally being blue and the other brown. Their social contacts grew fewer and fewer, till at last they took to intermarrying with the numerous menial class about the estate. Many of the crowded family degenerated, moved across the valley, and merged with the mongrel population, which was later to produce the pitiful squatters. The rest had stuck sullenly to their ancestral mansion, becoming more and more clannish and taciturn, yet developing a nervous responsiveness to the frequent thunderstorms. Most of this information reached the outside world through young Jan Martens, who from some kind of restlessness joined the colonial army when news of the Albany Convention reached Tempest Mountain. He was the first of Garrett's descendants to see much of the world, and when he returned in 1760 after six years of campaigning, he was hated as an outsider by his father, uncles, and brothers, in spite of his dissimilar Martens eyes. No longer could he share the peculiarities and prejudices of the Martenses, while the very mountain thunderstorms failed to intoxicate him as they had before. Instead, his surroundings depressed him, and he frequently wrote to a friend in Albany of plans to leave the paternal roof. In the spring of 1763, Jonathan Gifford, the Albany friend of Jan Martens, became worried by his correspondent's silence, especially in view of the conditions and quarrels at the Martens mansion. Determined to visit Jan in person, he went into the mountains on horseback. His diary states that he reached Tempest Mountain on September 20th, finding the mansion in great decrepitude. The sullen, odd-eyed Martenses, whose unclean animal aspect shocked him, told him in broken gutturals that Jan was dead. He had, they insisted, been struck by lightning the autumn before, and now lay buried behind the neglected, sunken gardens. They showed the visit to the grave, barren and devoid of markers. Something in the Martenses' manner gave Gifford a feeling of repulsion and suspicion, and a week later he returned with spade and mattock to explore the sepulchral spot. He found what he expected, a skull crushed cruelly, as if by savage blows. So, returning to Albany, he openly charged the Martenses with the murder of their kinsmen. Legal evidence was lacking, but the story spread rapidly round the countryside, and from that time the Martenses were ostracized by the world. No one would deal with them, 
and their distant manor was shunned as an accursed place. Somehow they managed to live on independently by the products of their estate, for occasional lights glimpsed from faraway hills attested their continued presence. These lights were seen as late as 1810, but toward the last they became very infrequent. Meanwhile there grew up about the mansion and the mountain a body of diabolic legendary. The place was avoided with doubled assiduousness, and invested with every whispered myth tradition could supply. It remained unvisited till 1816, when the continued absence of lights was noticed by the squatters. At that time a party made investigations, finding the house deserted and partly in ruins. There were no skeletons about, so that departure rather than death was inferred. The clan seemed to have left several years before, and improvised penthouses showed how numerous it had grown prior to its migration. Its cultural level had fallen very low, as proved by decaying furniture and scattered silverware, which must have been long abandoned when its owners left. But though the dreaded martenses were gone, the fear of the haunted house continued, and grew very acute when new and strange stories arose among the mountain decadence. There it stood, deserted, feared, and linked with the vengeful ghost of Jan Martens. There it still stood, on the night I dug in Jan Martens's grave. I have described my protracted digging as idiotic, and such it indeed was in object and method. The coffin of Jan Martens had soon been unearthed. It now held only dust and nitre, but in my fury to exhume his ghost, I delved irrationally and clumsily down beneath where he had lain. God knows what I expected to find. I only felt that I was digging in the grave of a man whose ghost stalked by night. It is impossible to say what monstrous depth I had attained when my spade, and soon my feet, broke through the ground beneath. The event, under the circumstances, was tremendous, for in the existence of a subterranean space here, my mad theories had terrible confirmation. My slight fall had extinguished the lantern, but I produced an electric pocket lamp, and viewed the small horizontal tunnel which led away indefinitely in both directions. It was amply large enough for a man to wriggle through, and though no sane person would have tried it at that time, I forgot danger, reason, and cleanliness in my single-minded fever to unearth the lurking fear. Choosing the direction toward the house, I scrambled recklessly into the narrow burrow, squirming ahead blindly and rapidly, and flashing but seldom the lamp I kept before me. What language can describe the spectacle of a man lost in infinitely abysmal earth, pawing, twisting, wheezing, scrambling madly through sunken convolutions of immemorial blackness, without an idea of time, safety, direction, or definite object? There is something hideous in it, but that is what I did. I did it for so long that life faded to a far memory, and I became one with the moles and grubs of nighted depths. Indeed, it was only by accident that after interminable writhings I jarred my forgotten electric lamp alight so that it shone eerily along the burrow of caked loam that stretched and curved ahead. I had been scrambling in this way for some time, so that my battery had burned very low, when the passage suddenly inclined sharply upward, altering my mode of progress, and as I raised my glance, it was without preparation that I saw glistening in the distance two demoniac reflections of my expiring lamp, two reflections glowing with a baneful and unmistakable effulgence, and provoking maddeningly nebulous memories. I stopped automatically, though lacking the brain to retreat. The eyes approached, yet of the thing that bore them I could distinguish only a claw. But what a claw! Then, far overhead, I heard a faint crashing which I recognized. It was the wild thunder of the mountain, raised to hysteric fury. I must have been crawling upward for some time, so that the surface was now quite near, and as the muffled thunder clattered, those eyes still stared with vacuous viciousness. Thank God I did not then know what it was, else I should have died. But I was saved by the very thunder that had summoned it, for after a hideous wait, 
there burst from the unseen outside sky one of those frequent mountainwood bolts whose aftermath I had noticed here and there as gashes of disturbed earth and fulgurites of various sizes. With cyclopean rage it tore through the soil above that damnable pit, blinding and deafening me, yet not wholly reducing me to a coma. In the chaos of sliding, shifting earth, I clawed and floundered helplessly, till the rain on my head steadied me, and I saw that I had come to the surface in a familiar spot a steep, unforested place on the southwest slope of the mountain. Recurrent sheet lightnings illumined the tumbled ground, and the remains of the curious low hummock which had stretched down from the wooded higher slope, but there was nothing in the chaos to show my place of egress from the lethal catacomb. My brain was as great a chaos as the earth, and as a distant red glare burst on the landscape from the south, I hardly realized the horror I had been through. But when two days later the squatters told me what the red glare meant, I felt more horror than that which the mole burrow and the claw and eyes had given, more horror because of the overwhelming implications. In a hamlet twenty miles away, an orgy of fear had followed the bolt which brought me above ground, and a nameless thing had dropped from an overhanging tree into a weak-roofed cabin. It had done a deed— but the squatters had fired the cabin in frenzy before it could escape. It had been doing that deed at the very moment the earth caved in on the thing with the claw and eyes. 4. The Horror in the Eyes There can be nothing normal in the mind of one who, knowing what I knew of the horrors of Tempest Mountain, would seek alone for the fear that lurked there. That at least two of the fear's embodiments were destroyed, formed but a slight guarantee of mental and physical safety in this acheron of multiform diabolism, yet I continued my quest with even greater zeal, as events and revelations became more monstrous. When, two days after my frightful crawl through that crypt of the eyes and claw, I learned that a thing had malignly hovered twenty miles away at the same instant the eyes were glaring at me, I experienced virtual convulsions of fright, but that fright was so mixed with wonder and alluring grotesqueness that it was almost a pleasant sensation. Sometimes, in the throes of a nightmare, when unseen powers whirl one over the roofs of strange dead cities toward the grinning chasm of Nis, it is a relief and even a delight to shriek wildly and throw oneself voluntarily along with the hideous vortex of dream doom into whatever bottomless gulf may yawn. And so it was with the waking nightmare of Tempest Mountain, the discovery that two monsters had haunted the spot gave me ultimately a mad craving to plunge into the very earth of the accursed region, and with bare hands dig out the death that leered from every inch of the poisonous soil. As soon as possible I visited the grave of Jan Martens, and dug vainly where I had dug before. Some extensive cave-in had obliterated all trace of the underground passage, while the rain had washed so much earth back into the excavation that I could not tell how deeply I had dug that other day. I likewise made a difficult trip to the distant hamlet where the death creature had been burnt, and was little repaid for my trouble. In the ashes of the fateful cabin I found several bones, but apparently none of the monsters. The squatters said the thing had had only one victim, but in this I judged them inaccurate, since besides the complete skull of a human being, there was another bony fragment, which seemed certainly to have belonged to a human skull at some time. Though the rapid drop of the monster had been seen, no one could say just what the creature was like. Those who had glimpsed it called it simply a devil. Examining the great tree where it had lurked, I could discern no distinctive marks. I tried to find some trail into the black forest, but on this occasion could not stand the sight of those morbidly large bowls, or of those vast serpent-like roots that twisted so malevolently before they sank into the earth. My next step was to re-examine with microscopic care the deserted hamlet where death had come most abundantly, and where Arthur Munro had seen something he never lived to describe. Though my vain previous searches had been exceedingly minute, 
I now had new data to test, for my horrible grave crawl convinced me that at least one of the phases of the monstrosity had been an underground creature. This time, on the 14th of November, my quest concerned itself mostly with the slopes of Cone Mountain and Maple Hill, where they overlook the unfortunate hamlet, and I gave particular attention to the loose earth of the landslide region on the latter eminence. The afternoon of my search brought nothing to light, and dusk came as I stood on Maple Hill, looking down at the hamlet and across the valley to Tempest Mountain. There had been a gorgeous sunset, and now the moon came up, nearly full and shedding a silver flood over the plain, the distant mountainside, and the curious low mounds that rose here and there. It was a peaceful, Arcadian scene, but knowing what it hid, I hated it. I hated the mocking moon, the hypocritical plain, the festering mountain, and those sinister mounds. Everything seemed to me tainted with a loathsome contagion, and inspired by a noxious alliance with distorted, hidden powers. Presently, as I gazed abstractedly at the moonlit panorama, my eye became attracted by something singular in the nature and arrangement of a certain topographical element. Without having any exact knowledge of geology, I had from the first been interested in the odd mounds and hummocks of the region. I had noticed that they were pretty widely distributed around Tempest Mountain, though less numerous on the plain than near the hilltop itself, where prehistoric glaciation had doubtless found feebler opposition to its striking and fantastic caprices. Now, in the light of that low moon which cast long, weird shadows, it struck me forcibly that the various points and lines of the mound system had a peculiar relation to the summit of Tempest Mountain. That summit was undeniably a centre, from which the lines or rows of points radiated indefinitely and irregularly, as if the unwholesome Martens mansion had thrown visible tentacles of terror. The idea of such tentacles gave me an unexplained thrill, and I stopped to analyse my reason for believing these mounds glacial phenomena. The more I analysed, the less I believed, and against my newly opened mind there began to beat grotesque and horrible analogies based on superficial aspects and upon my experience beneath the earth. Before I knew it, I was uttering frenzied and disjointed words to myself. My God! Molehills! The damn place must be honeycombed! How many? That night at the mansion, they took Bennett and Toby first, on each side of us. Then I was digging frantically into the mound which had stretched nearest me, digging desperately, shiveringly, but almost jubilantly, digging and at last shrieking aloud with some unplaced emotion, as I came upon a tunnel or burrow, just like the one through which I had crawled on that other demoniac night. After that, I recall running, spade in hand, a hideous run across moon-litten, mound-marked meadows, and through diseased, precipitous abysses of haunted hillside forest, leaping, screaming, panting, bounding toward the terrible Martens mansion. I recall digging unreasoningly in all parts of the briar-choked cellar, digging to find the core and centre of that malignant universe of mounds. And then I recall how I laughed when I stumbled on the passageway, the hole at the base of the old chimney, where the thick weeds grew and cast queer shadows in the light of the lone candle I had happened to have with me. What still remained down in that hellhive, lurking and waiting for the thunder to arouse it, I did not know. Two had been killed, perhaps that had finished it, but still there remained that burning determination to reach the innermost secret of the fear, which I had once more come to deem definite, material and organic. My indecisive speculation whether to explore the passage alone and immediately with my pocket light, or to try to assemble a band of squatters for the quest, was interrupted after a time by a sudden rush of wind from outside which blew out the candle and left me in stark blackness. The moon no longer shone through the chinks and apertures above me, and with a sense of fateful alarm I heard the sinister and significant rumble of approaching thunder. A confusion of associated ideas possessed my brain, leading me to grope back toward the farthest corner of the cellar. My eyes, however, 
never turned away from the horrible opening at the base of the chimney, and I began to get glimpses of the crumbling bricks and unhealthy weeds as faint glows of lightning penetrated the woods outside and illumined the chinks in the upper wall. Every second I was consumed with a mixture of fear and curiosity. What would the storm call forth, or was there anything left for it to call? Guided by a lightning flash, I settled myself down behind a dense clump of vegetation through which I could see the opening without being seen. If heaven is merciful, it will some day efface from my consciousness the sight that I saw, and let me live my last years in peace. I cannot sleep at night now, and have to take opiates when it thunders. The thing came abruptly and unannounced, a demon, rat-like, scurrying from pits remote and unimaginable, a hellish panting and stifled grunting, and then from that opening beneath the chimney, a burst of multitudinous and leprous life, a loathsome night-spawned flood of organic corruption more devastatingly hideous than the blackest conjurations of mortal madness and morbidity, seething, stewing, surging, bubbling like serpent slime, it rolled up and out of that yawning hole, spreading like a septic contagion, and streaming from the cellar at every point of egress, streaming out to scatter through the accursed midnight forests, and strew fear, madness, and death. God knows how many there were. There must have been thousands. To see the stream of them in that faint, intermittent lightning was shocking. When they had thinned out enough to be glimpsed as separate organisms, I saw that they were dwarfed, deformed hairy devils or apes, monstrous and diabolic caricatures of the monkey tribe. They were so hideously silent, there was hardly a squeal when one of the last stragglers turned with the skill of long practice to make a meal in accustomed fashion on a weaker companion. Others snapped up what it left and ate with slavering relish. Then. In spite of my days of fright and disgust, my morbid curiosity triumphed, and as the last of the monstrosities oozed up alone from that netherworld of unknown nightmare, I drew my automatic pistol and shot it under cover of the thunder. Shrieking, slithering, torrential shadows of red viscous madness, chasing one another through endless and sanguine corridors of purple fulgurous sky, formless phantasms and kaleidoscopic mutations of a ghoulish, remembered scene. Forests of monstrous, overnourished oaks with serpent roots twisting and sucking unnameable juices from an earth verminous with millions of cannibal devils, mound-like tentacles groping from underground nuclei of polypus perversion, insane lightning over malignant ivied walls and demon arcades choked with fungus vegetation. Heaven be thanked for the instinct which led me unconscious to places where men dwell, to the peaceful village that slept under the calm stars of clearing skies. I had recovered enough in a week to send to Albany for a gang of men to blow up the Martens mansion and the entire top of Tempest Mountain with dynamite, stop up all the discoverable mound burrows, and destroy certain overnourished trees whose very existence seemed an insult to sanity. I could sleep a little after they had done this, but true rest will never come as long as I remember that nameless secret of the lurking fear. The thing will haunt me, for who can say the extermination is complete, and that analogous phenomena do not exist all over the world? Who can, with my knowledge, think of the earth's unknown caverns without a nightmare dread of future possibilities? I cannot see a well or a subway entrance without shuddering. Why cannot the doctors give me something to make me sleep, or truly calm my brain when it thunders? What I saw in the glow of my flashlight, after I shot the unspeakable straggling object, was so simple that almost a minute elapsed before I understood and went delirious. The object was nauseous, a filthy whitish gorilla thing with sharp yellow fangs and matted fur. It was the ultimate product of mammalian degeneration, the frightful outcome of isolated spawning, multiplication, and cannibal nutrition above and below the ground. 
the embodiment of all the snarling chaos and grinning fear that lurk behind life. It had looked at me as it died, and its eyes had the same odd quality that marked those other eyes which had stared at me underground and excited cloudy recollections. One eye was blue, the other brown. They were the dissimilar Martens eyes of the old legends, and I knew in one inundating cataclysm of voiceless horror what had become of that vanished family, the terrible and thunder-crazed house of Martens. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.